Chapter 701 The True Commander of Death He was not someone who lost his calm easily. And even at this moment, his mind had clarity as to what it needed to do at the moment. However, in the background it also kept thinking about the many unlikely scenarios that could happen should he arrive a moment too late. Rudra did not even notice the carnage he had left in his wake. As he had killed countless humans at this point for real. That were people that would never wake up once more in the church of life again and had died forever now. However, he did not care about it at all. As his only focus was on getting to floor 32 as soon as possible. Reaching the floor was supposed to be difficult with a sea of undead guarding it. However, when Rudra came near the undead, they immediately kneeled before him and made way to unblock his path. In a phenomenon that Rudra least expected, he was covered in the aura of death as black fumes rose around him. But it was an unconsciously activated passive skill and Rudra was not forcing himself to mention it. But little did he know that the aura of death around him made him a king-level entity, which meant that these low-level undead would most likely slaughter their master for him, much less not fight him. With his path clear, Rudra rushed straight to the 32th floor at blinding speed. As when he reached there, two men were guarding the entrance. Before those men could even react to Rudra's figure, however, Rudra grabbed them by their necks and slammed them against the wall, crushing their necks with his bare hands to end their lives in an instant. There was no sword. No fancy moves involved. Just his mad speed and raw power that killed the two men. Taking a deep breath, Rudra went inside the biolab, his heart beating rapidly, anxious about the fate of his family. One minute ago, Nero. Nero laughed at Rudra's antics. Everyone else might be afraid of the leader of the elites and may worship him as a deity, but he did not. He considered himself to be Rudra's equal because once upon a time, he was someone who shared the same platform as him as a teammate. He only considered Rudra to be more privileged than himself to have the backing of Ethan Gray to create such a large organization and live as a king, but felt that as a solo player the two were on the same level. Nero was barely level 280, had barely ascended to tier 4, and was nowhere near Rudra's strength, nor could he hold a candle to his accomplishments. The Rudra that he considered an equal was already vastly superior to himself, while the Rudra currently was incomparable. But his mind was not ready to accept that he was an inferior player. It was always about the excuses like he had to play solo. That he had no backing and that he had no opportunities. He felt like playing his class was more challenging than playing a knight and that the progress and accomplishments he had with his class were comparable to Rudra. This was the reason why he did not take Rudra as threat of you dare? To be serious. As he did not feel like he feared Rudra. Moreover he had posted his undead on all the entry points leading to the 32 ND floor and should Rudra wish to reach here he must defeat them all. But with him being connected to the undead should even one of them die at Rudra's hands, he would be notified immediately to know that he was coming. Enjoying his time, he looked at Mama Rajput and said, It's such a burden to have a husband in this new world. I freed you. Won't you thank me? Mama Rajput cursed Nero like she had never cursed before. Her heart broken and her mind blanked out, she had never hated someone as much as she hated Nero at this moment. Now that's not a very nice thing to say. Is it, Mama? You are quite pretty for your age. I might have taken you in as my concubine if you were not this vile-tongued, Nero said with a sadistic smile as he disgusted everyone in the room. Naomi, who could not take it anymore, stood up and said, You've made a big mistake, Nero. You don't know my husband. He will make you pay for this. You will beg for forgiveness at that moment. But there will be none. I will make sure there is none. Nero turned his attention towards Naomi as he tilted his head and chuckled. No forgiveness. You say? He walked towards Naomi with menacing steps as he prepared to use another darkness absorb. Naomi backed up in panic as Mama Rajput desperately tried to hold the monster back by grabbing his legs and biting on his feet. But Nero was just annoyed by this as he kicked Mama Rajput away and kept walking towards Naomi. As he said, Shikuni! 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 The great man Shikuni! The number one player Shikuni! The so-called hero of Japan! Let us see if our beloved hero San can save his wife today. Dot. Naomi hit the wall. There was nowhere to back off anymore. She looked at Nero wide-eyed, and in panic as fear and horror was evident inside them. Nero bent over to touch her. As she closed them, and accepted her fate. A tear escaping her eyes, as she softly mumbled Rudra. Dot. Bam. At this very instant before Nero could ever lay a finger on Naomi. Rudra arrived at the scene, and gave the guy a threatening German suplex, that broke not only his spine and neck, but also cracked his skull bone. Don't you dare lay a finger on my wife. Punk! Rudra screamed in anger as he pummeled Nero with a rally of punches as he got on top of him. Shock. Disbelief. 
horror were evident on Nero's face. He had no idea how Rudra managed to bypass his undead and reach this place without detection. His speed to traverse the 15-meter corridor from the door to this location was also so fast that he did not even notice someone sneaking up on him, while the strength on the German suplex was strong enough to crush his cultivator bones. As Nero summoned his undead, to counter Rudra pummeling him, Mama Rajput and Naomi breathed a sigh of relief to see that Rudra was here as they collectively screamed Rudra. It was a scream of relief. As tears escaped both their eyes upon seeing that he had finally arrived. However, when Nero summoned the undead, who popped out in the room like flies, the women and the doctor started to panic once more as Naomi shouted, Rudra, there are undead here. Naomi hated the fact that she was not a cultivator now because she could have used the Dispel the Dead spell if she was inside Omega right now. However, shockingly, no matter how much Nero tried to make the undead to attack Rudra, they would not budge from their locations at all as punch after punch. The shock on his face grew. Had Rudra wanted he could have killed Nero right then and there. But he did not, as he only broke his limbs in extremely painful fashion one after another. Ag! 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 Screams, each louder than the last could be heard in the room, as the doctors had to hide away from the brutality in front of their eyes. Nero looked at the undead, and wondered why they would not obey as he spoke in shock. Why? Why will you not obey? However, when Rudra raised his hand, and every one of them kneeled at once, Nero finally understood why. Rudra was the boss here, and he was just a puny necromancer. Although he was the summoner of the undead, he had no control over them. Rudra was the Pope of the Church of Death, and a mythic class the Death Knight by profession. Although in Omega, the advantage was not evident. In the real world it finally started to show. Rudra was far higher in the food chain than Nero could ever imagine. As although even Rudra did not understand the true depths of his powers at the moment. Should he wish, he was strong enough to even make Nero obey his commands, as a lesser necromancer should he wish to do so. However, at this moment none of that mattered. As one after another Nero felt his bones being snapped by Rudra's raw strength. His mind blacked out with the shock of realizing that he was not even strong enough to wield his own undead in Rudra's presence. Much less fight with a man on a level playing field. It was only when Rudra heard Mama Rajput say, Rudra! Mahendra! That he stopped the beating, looking up to see the shriveled body of his father. The first thing that Rudra noticed through his god's eyes was that his father was not actually dead. At least not yet. Forward slash forward slash forward slash ha 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 ha. Sorry guys none of you predicted this chapter correctly face with tongue. But the next one is going to be an even bigger shocker. Hopefully you like this chapter. Please comment down below if you did. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 702 Overlord of Death. His blood was going cold very fast and Rudra had a feeling in his heart that the longer he took the more unlikely it would be for him to revive his father. Rudra was not inside Omega and could not use Solar Restore at this moment to heal his father. And his arsenal was basically all attack moves except for that. He desperately wished at this moment that he should have chosen the Hades special skill which allowed to bring back people from the dead at this moment. As now it would have been the best moment to use it. But with the lack of any options, Rudra decided to use Darkness Absorb on Nero to try and steal his vitality to save his father. Rudra had no idea as to how to do it efficiently. However his brain went into hyperdrive and he trusted his instinct as a veteran in Omega at this moment to channel the absorption of vitality he stole from Nero towards his father. The result was that Mahindra visibly started to regain some color in his skin. As Nero lost all signs of life. Nero had very little HP to offer anyways after the brutal beating Ridra had given him. As he teetered near the edge of death anyways. Not enough. This much is not enough Ridra thought as he looked around in desperation. His eyes landing on the three doctors in the room. Ridra felt he was in a huge moral dilemma as his mind urged him to kill the doctors to save his father. While his conscience told him that it was wrong. Rudra felt like something was choking him. As all his beliefs came crashing down at him at once. His mind argued that the people close to him mattered the most and other lives did not matter at all. While his conscience told him that all lives mattered. And unless they were his enemy or harmed him. Only a monster would kill them. As Rudra's bone chilling gaze landed on the doctors, they shuddered in fear as they realized his intentions. However before Rudra could make a choice. A tight slap landed on his face as Mama Raj put slapped him. Slap. Rudra looked at Mama, who was bleeding from her forehead, and had her hair and face completely in mess, as she had been through a lot. But even in such a condition, she said, If Mahindra is dead, then be it. But you are not going to become a monster and kill others to save him. This is not how I raised you. Dot. A tear escaped Rudra's eyes at this statement, as he finally understood the error of his ways. 
Up till now, he was too self-centered. Only thinking about himself. His guild. His family. His future. While millions in his own country were fighting for their lives every single day. He was blessed to be in a position of power where if he wanted to he could single-handedly mint in peace on the streets by bringing all together. But he did not do it. Because it was too much hassle, and there were much more important issues for him to deal with. Although he was the strongest guild master. Somewhere in his pursuit of becoming the strongest, he had lost touch with the pure and simple person that he once was. In the past few months, he had actually started to feel like the overlord of death. As he behaved and acted like he owned everyone, and was too conceited and even evil. He did not care about how he manipulated the crowd into working in his favor, and did not care if his words would cause regret to uncountable players down the line. As the only goal he cared about was his own. As he saw his mother cry inconsolably, and the body of his father in his arms. He finally reconnected with his old self, who had been through this trauma once in life, and refound his true golden self that not only wanted to be the best, but be the best the right way. Wiping his tears off, he averted his gaze from the doctors, and threw them at the undead in the room. As he said, Come, Dot! With fiery eyes, Rudra compelled the undead to line up one after another, as he absorbed vitality from their bodies one after another consistently, and channeled it into his father's body. It was the worst one minute of his life, as even after chaneling the vitality from countless undead his father did not move a muscle. Until finally he started to cough violently, as he jolted back to life. Rudra, Naomi, Mama Rajput, and the doctors all let out a cry of joy and relief as the doctors rushed in to check on the health of Papa Rajput. Mama Rajput hugged the chest of her husband tightly, as she cried inconsolably there while Naomi hugged Rudra tight. Rudra too gave Naomi a tight hug. And at this moment, he could not help but feel guilty about the treatment he gave to this girl for the past few days. He hardly met her or gave her time, and constantly compared her with Ruby, although it was her who approached him. The moment he accepted her proposal, he became an equal party in the relationship yet he was putting in none of the efforts needed to mention it. The woman had done nothing but love him faithfully, and even put up with him having a second wife. She had been the pillar of the family in his absence, and had never complained about how he treated her, and did not give her time. She understood his every need his every desire, and supported him through every thick and thin. She deserved more than what he gave her, and he needed to start treating her like the queen that she was. Rudra kissed her lightly on the forehead, as he consoled her that everything was going to be okay now that he was here. Forward slash forward slash forward slash congratulations for hitting the GT target of 1600. Bonus right after this chapter. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 703 A New Resolve. The mental torture he went through in the few minutes of uncertainty about his family's fate transformed him completely, as for the first time, since his rebirth, he started to look at the bigger picture rather than his own selfish interests. Should he wish to, he could probably kill hundreds, if not thousands of rebels inside the upside at this moment. But he did not wish to shed a single drop of blood where it wasn't necessary anymore, as rather than thinking upon how to annihilate them, he started to think on how to settle this matter with the least casualties. Rudra was still the mastermind schemer like he always was. But listening to Nero's words and experiencing the consequences of his own ignorance, he finally felt like since he was in a position to do good and be a hero, he should grasp that chance and truly try to be a role model that others could follow rather than a man who had the world at his feet. The track where he was heading down towards had only one end for him, where he was going to stand at the pinnacle of the world with everyone else at his feet. But that was not the ambition he had in his past life. As his true goal was not only to be the strongest guild master, but rather to be an undeniable icon, who was a symbol of noble yet just power. In his past life, he was backstabbed by his colleague, and pushed down the stairs. And he found the detestable so much so that upon his rebirth, he did not even wish to see the face of that man again. However, now that he himself contemplated on killing innocent doctors just to save his father, he finally understood that he had became the same man he had so vehemently detested once, and had Mama Rajput not intervened, he would truly have became one coming back from the edge of falling into darkness. Rudra saw the light once more, as his mind gained clarity of every single fault he was making as a man. A beautiful family reunion made Rudra feel a myriad of emotions in his heart, as he understood that no matter how much gold he ever gained in Omega, this was the most precious thing to him in the world. And he needed to understand that just like him, there were countless families in the underprivileged areas, except the upside, as well which were currently struggling for even basic food day to day. Rudra had been one of those underprivileged once upon a time, and he could understand their pain in such a situation. However, his success and his own situation had made him blind to their peril after his rebirth. But that was the case no more. Rudra rolled out of the building but made sure not to go too far as his father was still very weak 
and needed to undergo medical treatment, although Rudra had saved his life. With his family inside, he needed to guard them at all times. But he also needed to stop the fighting before it got out of hand. Currently, SMG's black ops were slaughtering the rebels by the hundreds. As the untrained rebels, who had barely managed to master a few moves were no match for the highly trained cultivator assassins, who lived and breathed to kill. The trained security force of the upside. They did their jobs in securing the perimeter, as ever since they joined the fight the rebels stood no chance, and were unable to advance a single block while having to fall back five. SMG spotted Rudra outside the hospital, and instantly moved towards him. As Rudra relayed to him his order. Don't kill. Push them back. Round them up. But don't kill. These are humans too. And instigated humans at that who are just looking for food. W. We can't kill them for it. Dot. SMG was shocked to hear this order as he blinked twice while looking at Rudra. This was quite unlike Rudra's usual orders to kill everyone moving. As the only reason Rudra even created the Black Ops was for situations like these. Nonetheless, an order was an order and Rudra's orders were supreme amongst all elites. And SNG immediately transmitted them over the intercom, as the fighting style of the Black Ops changed significantly. It was an unusual order for them, as the Black Ops had never been trained around people up alive. But they did their best, by maiming and threatening the opponents back, rather than killing them. Sometimes one or two died, but it was inevitable as it was done out of self-defense. But in the end, all of the ten... 020 survivors were rounded up around the one small building of the hospital upon Rudra's orders. Rudra looked at the terror on their faces as they stared at the army of black ops surrounding them alongside armed upside police. As they finally understood how stupid their plan was to invade the home place of the elites. Closing his eyes, Rudra calmed his senses down as he prepared a sensitive speech to be spoken from the bottom of his heart. As he said, Rebels, I will not kill you here today. Not even restrain or jail you. You stormed this township to look for food and medicine, and I understand your motive. However, you killed the residents in the process, and we retaliated in kind and killed some of yours. Ensure this is not how either of us wanted to spend the day should everything be normal. But these are extraordinary times we live in, and the future of our race as a whole is uncertain. You all may know me. I am Rudra Rajput better known as Guild Master Shakuni of the Elites. I'm the one who runs the Black Ops that killed your men. And here at this moment... I would like to apologize for the deaths caused in battle today. Dot. Rudra made a 90 degrees bow towards the rebels, who were shocked by his speech. The victor of the battle and such a great man was bowing to the losers? Just what the hell was going on? Although nobody knew what Rudra was up to, his gesture definitely grabbed everyone's attention. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the GT target. Good job everyone. Hopefully you enjoy. I don't think we can hit any more targets with just two hours to go. So I guess this is it for the month of June. Thank you all for the support you have shown me in June. Hope to see you all back in July. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 704 Rudra takes on a bigger responsibility. The rebels were shocked to see this. And so were the elites. Why was the most powerful man in the light faction bowing to a bunch of defeated rebels like themselves? Rudra continued. I understand that the upside is a safe haven with an abundance of food and medicine. It is a place that can easily satiate at least 50. Zero, zero, zero people's hunger every day and still not overburden its ecosystem. However, please try to understand. The reason why we did not share food is because we were saving the surplus for emergency in the face of the uncertainty of the coming year. Ethan Gray and myself are not responsible for the welfare of the general public of Japan. I was not elected as the president and it is not my job. I am responsible for my own guild members who I flew from all over the world to live in this township and God is my witness that I have done my job faithfully. Rudra's words struck a chord amongst the rebels. Some of them did feel that Rudra and Ethan Gray were selfish to not share the resources to fellow humans. But Rudra's reasoning slammed the reality in their faces. It was not their job to help others. They were not the government, and they were not elected to do this job. The commoners had no reason to demand anything from them. And they had no reason to comply. They felt silly and stupid to be instigated into this raid, and the loss of life. They were in the wrong, and they could feel it now. However, Rudra's next words gave them a light of hope. Rudra said, I had informed the government many months ago as to how they could tackle these problems. But they have failed the people. I thought I did my best. But, be but. Rudra paused as he talked less like a manipulator at this very second and started to talk like a genuine human. As he said, but I was wrong. Rudra looked the rebels in the eyes. He did not shy away from admitting his mistake as he continued. This entire country is my people. This entire planet is my people. 
In these extraordinary times, there are no countries or distinctions anymore, as we are all just bundled as humans. And trust me on this, guys. I will try my best to reverse the trend. The rebels were moved by Ritter's words, as they could see the conviction in his eyes, and the truth behind his speech. The elites who were used to Ritter's attitude of the matters of the world are none of our guild's concern, were a bit surprised to see this sudden change in their leader. But somewhere deep down, they felt assured to have such a man with such high ideals leading them. Rudra said, From today, I will actively try to help this place as best as I can. Although I am not capable of changing the entire world right now, I will start from Japan and try my best to make this place a livable and happy haven once more. What is to come? Will come, but we cannot keep living like the apocalypse has already arrived. The rebels were now moved from Rudra's speech as many cried while some shot a video of Rudra's speech and sent it to the forums. Rudra said, I cannot do it alone, guys. You have no idea about the weight I support on my shoulders. I'm standing here strong, but I am overworked. I will work earnestly for you all. But I cannot make that change as an individual. Please help me make the change. Together we can take control of the streets once more. Rudra waited patiently for his words to sink in. He allowed himself to say his inner thoughts for the first time, and let the world see that yes the invincible Shakuni was also overwhelmed and overworked in this situation. It could be perceived as weakness or it could be perceived as him being candid. But thankfully for him, it was perceived as him being candid as the rebels started to shout. Me! I am with you! Me! I am with you too! Dot! We are with you Guildmaster! Yes! Let's take the streets back! Dot! There were loud cheers as the rebels and the elites gave an electric support to Ridra's statement as Ridra breathed a sigh of relief. The streets had already descended into anarchy, and taking back control was not going to be easy. However, Ridra knew that no matter how hard the hurdle was he needed to at least try to make things right again. Little did he know that his one small step in the right direction would not only alter the fate of planet Earth, but also his own fate inside Omega. The next one month. In the next one month a lot of chain reactions occurred to Ridra's statement. Ridra started an open food charity, where everyone who was in need of food was given food outside the walls of the Upside for the day's surplus. The residents of Upside actively cut down on their food needs after understanding the need of the nation. And the place fed 120. 000 outer residents daily. Ridra's speech moved many, and since he was already a very influential figure in Japan, many street lords actively ceded the management of their territory to Ridra's hands as they trusted him to provide them with security and justice. It was a chaotic time and Ridra had to try his best to balance everything out. But he cut down on his training time in Omega to just two hours a day, while he also trained two hours in real life, but that was it. He focused rest of his efforts into making his country livable again, as slowly starting from the upside, he was able to create a 10 kilometers radius in which the county functioned as normal. He was running a private government where he was the god, and the ruler of the people as his word became law in that place, and the needs of the people were provided by him. Ridra knew that making people self-sufficient, was the only way to combat this crisis, as he taught individuals two of the most basic and easiest way to make food. Ridra gave them eggs of a special type of edible frog whose single female could produce a million babies. The eggs would mature into frogs in 24 short days, and the cycle could be repeated. Although frog meat wasn't the most delicious or the preference of the people, it was easily farmed, and it served the needs of the crowd for sustenance. The leftover bones and body cutouts were used to make calcium and multivitamin tablets which were mass-produced in the upside to give the nutrition that was missing from the meat diet. The second way was that Ridra gave the commoners the necessary fishing tools and make do boats for every family to be able to fish food for their own meal at night. These two methods made it so that within one month, Ridra was able to feed one million strong population daily and provide them with safe streets. Ridra also did not forget to give Naomi and his family the time they deserved as he became a more devoted husband and family man. His father was immensely proud of his accomplishment and change in attitude, and the two would often share philosophical talks on his hospital bed. Despite Ridra having saved him, Mahendra Rajput's health condition was quite serious as even after one month of being in the ICU, he was not recovering as much as he needed to. The news that Naomi was pregnant gave Ridra the joy of his life as he felt his heart flutter like it never did at the thought of being a father. Happy days could be observed in the Rajput family as Max and Ridra both seemed to have matured a lot in the weeks after the raid. Ridra fell more and more in love with Naomi. The more time he spent with her, and also after realizing the fact that she was going to be the mother of his child. There was a marquee change in Ridra's behavior after that announcement, as he was visibly more calm and compassionate to everyone as if subconsciously trying to be patient as if he were with a kid. However, the happy days of the Rajput family did not last long. 
as one night Mahindra Rajput finally suffered from kidney failure, and his health started to deteriorate rapidly. In the next two days, the body started to fail all over and despite the doctors trying their best. The man died from multiple organ failure. The shock of her husband's death was so deep on Mama Rajput that she too never woke up from the bed that night. As the sleep, she went into his permanent. In a single day Rudra lost both his parents. However the common parents, who lived a common life, had the most extraordinary of funerals. As over one million people attended their last rites. Both of them died with a smile on their faces. However left the faces of their two young sons filled with tears. However as Rudra lit their funeral pyre on fire. He swore to live by the ideals that they had taught him and continued to work towards the goal of creating an ideal world for all to live in. Forward slash forward slash forward slash a bittersweet chapter. Do tell me if you like it in the comments below forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 705 A Changed Rudra One of the best things that happened to him was that he was able to break free from the illusion of the demon's diary as it was no longer able to manipulate him. He was sure that he did not want any personal gains from the diary and honestly surrendered the book's cover to Hades. With him gifting the complete book to Hades, it was now possible for the god of death to start taking back of the demon race once more and land a huge blow to Lucifer. Hades was incredibly impressed by Rudra, who managed to bring the complete demon's diary to him. As with this, he finally felt like he had the chance to Lucifer down in a fair fight. Using the demon's diary, Hades could create the demon kings who would be peak tier 5 existences, who could aid him massively in the war effort, with the future potential to reach even tier 6. Currently, Lucifer had a few tier 5 underlings under him. However, Hades had none. This was the biggest disadvantage that Hades would face in an all-out war against Lucifer. As even if he was able to neutralize Lucifer himself, without his army capable of handling the tier 5 powerhouses, it was impossible to win. Although Rudra was an impressive fighter, he was still only nearing peak tier 4 and could maybe take on one tier 5 fighter in a one-on-one -on -one fight. But not more. But with the demon's diary, Hades finally not only had the chance to summon the demon kings, but also to slowly take back control of the demon race as a whole. It was a device of incomprehensible value to the god of death. And having it once more at his hands gave him incredible boost of confidence. For the umpteenth time, this display of competence from Rudra moved his heart as his evaluation of the Pope increased every day. Technically he could place oversight on how Rudra ran his religion. But with him growing it explosively and exponentially. Hades allowed his results to trump the methods he used as he gave Rudra a blind eye for his antics. Rudra too however changed his corrupt ways and started to govern the religion as a righteous leader as he stopped exploiting the masses and started helping them. This caused a chain reaction such that Rudra never would have imagined. As with more and more people joining him real life, even more people willingly followed him in Omega. Every time Rudra made an honest change in governance, like giving money to the poor followers of the religion or genuinely sending forces from the church to help members in need. The image of the church improved amongst the masses. Even more people voluntarily donated money, and no matter how much Rudra spent, more just kept coming in alongside a massive influx of people. Things became so ridiculous that some days he gained 1.6 million followers a day, far exceeding his initial estimates, as the small phenomenon in the start had now grown into a tsunami. At this rate Rudra expected that he would hit the expected target a whole three months before the deadline he set for himself and may even get to nearly 140 million followers by the time it was to start the war. Although focusing on all these regions, Rudra neglected his personal training. He felt much happier and content as his mental stability improved. He finally felt stress-free about the future as every single day at work became rewarding and meaningful with him helping someone or the other every single day. Even his shorter training sessions became way more productive as he felt that what usually took him 8 hours could be achieved in the short 2 hours that he trained now. As every time he trained, he came with a fresh mind and a peaceful heart to learn. His good work did not go unnoticed at all. As everyone from his family to Ruby to the elites became more and more content with a new change in his temperament. While the commoner sang the songs of his praises, he finally became the golden industry standard for success, as while people respected him out of fear up till this moment. Now he started to gain genuine adoration and respect. In this tumultuous world, where everyone only selfishly worked for themselves. Rudra was the only one who was working for the whole of humanity. And there were people who appreciated such mentality immensely. Although he did not know or care about this at all. His evaluation by Gaia improved significantly because of this change too, as the only flaw Gaia found in Rudra up till this moment was that he was too focused on his own organization and did not care about the bigger picture too much. But with his new temperament, he truly became the most suitable candidate to lead Earth. Now only if he could help Hades topple Lucifer and gain his favor. Then, 
there was a good chance that after the first awakening Hades would personally recruit Ridra into his army as his commander and thereby extend a huge olive branch to his host planet the Earth. This was the hope of Gaia and the Cuber Corporation. However, according to the Universal Laws, they could not interfere in the natural storyline of the game at all, as should the Dark Faction come out on top. Then planet Earth would be integrated into Lucifer's faction, and the leader would be chosen amongst the Dark Faction candidates. Integrating into the Dark Faction would make the quality of life on Earth become trash. As the Dark Faction of the universe followed the law of the jungle, where the strong prayed in the weak, and everything from slavery to murder was legal by law. Should Earth become such a lawless place, open to invasion and looting by the other species in the Dark Faction, it would become a desolate planet in a matter of one to two years post the Awakening, with only the best humans being drafted into Mercenary Corps, while the others being left to dry out and die on the resourceless planet. Meanwhile, Dronacharya. Dronacharya completely devoted himself to Lucifer and cut himself off from the world, delving into ancient forbidden practices and useless demonic rituals that were a hoax. But every time he performed a wrong ritual, he became more and more sure about the correct path, as after performing a total of 237 failed rituals on the 238th attempt, he was finally able to gain a brief audience with Lucifer. Lucifer looked at the mortal who had managed to get in touch with him, and remembered him to be the same man who had contacted him a few years ago, as he immediately became interested. Although everything else about the man was ordinary, him able to find this ancient ritual was proof of his dedication, as Lucifer decided to amuse himself by lending him an ear. Lucifer said, Say, what do you want weak? Pathetic mortal? Why have you tried so hard to find me? Dot. Dronacharya fell on his knees as he cowed out before Lucifer and said, Oh great devil, this humble servant's bows before you. Please grant him one selfish request. Please destroy Shakuni of the elites. I detest that man to my core and have repeatedly failed in my attempts to kill him. I will do anything for you in return. Lucifer smiled ebbly upon hearing the name Shakuni of the elites. That mortal was a peculiar one and even an eyesore to Lucifer himself. Hence, he agreed to Dronacharya's demands as he said, The demon's dairy. Hades has it. With it, he has a fair chance of defeating my army. Find it, and destroy it using this special flame I bestow upon you. Do not try to foolishly grab that book, as it will consume a weak mortal like you instantly. But if you manage to destroy it, I will in return destroy Shakuni of the elites for you. A system notification came in front of Dronacharya. As he was provided with relevant quest details, and the support after being given a SSS rated mission. Succeed and the reward was the destruction of Ridra. Fail and most likely, he would suffer permanent death at the hands of Hades being banished from Omega. It was the riskiest choice that Dronacharya had ever made in his life. However, his hate for Ridra was profound enough for him to take even this insane step. This time around, everything was on the line for him. However, the reward on the other side was equally tempting. In the end, he ended up accepting the quest forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Tikbo and Joshua Ansel 3899 for the massage chairs and to Thomas Sanders for the dragon. I am delighted from the goodwill and apologize for seeing it so late. The book is struggling economically this past few days. Hence the gesture is appreciated a lot. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 706 hitting the target and turning the tables. The church of death had expanded into becoming a behemoth at this point as he managed to convert the Aquahoe's kingdom ruled by the triads now into adopting it as the state religion. This conversion brought a steady influx of new and new followers, as the hold of the religion in the Hazel Groove True Elites, Aquahoe's kingdom region became extremely strong. Reaching this point Rudra could finally shift one more gear towards the upcoming war, as this time around the rewards had to be chosen extremely carefully with a look towards the real world as well. Having nearly lost his father, Rudra knew that this time around he needed to understand the importance of healing and revival skills, as although in Omega, he would just lose a few levels and be reborn. In the real world death was permanent. In such a scenario, the importance of healing skills became much more profound, and so did the need for functional and detection skills. Rudra did not want another broken attack move in his arsenal, as he had already built a huge stack of those moves. Rudra took a look at the system notification popping at his screen as it read. System Notification Congratulations Player Shakuni for completing the level 3 of the quest Rise of a Lost Religion. Distributing Rewards Ultimate Level Quest Rise of a Lost Religion Time Limit Unknown Difficulty Immeasurable Rewards Description You have successfully started a religion. But can you really grow it from the ground up to its past glory? Stage 3 Obtain 100 000 000, 000, 000 Followers Progress 100 000, 000. 
108 slash 100. 000. 000. 000. Stage 3 rewards. Levels plus 100. All stats plus 5000. Plus Immortal Legacy. Rudra accepted the 100 levels reward with a lot of glee and joy. As this was a number that was impossible for the common player to ever gain at once. Even as a reincarnator. Rudra never expected that there would ever come a day where he would gain 100 levels at once. And to top it all off 5,000 points on all stats extra. Rudra called for his stat panel. Player name. Shakuni slash Augustus One Knight. Title. Viscount of Hazelbrook Kingdom. Honorable Death Knight. Savior of Thal Village. Revered Medicine Master. Honorary Archbishop of the Church of Life. World Renowned. Heir of Augustus One Knight. Achiever. Dragon Slayer. King of the True Elite's Kingdom. First Cultivator. Supreme Overlord. Legendary Demon Slayer. Superior Human. Pope of the Church of Death. History Maker. Class, Death Knight Mythic. Subclass, Explosion Artist. LVL, 507. Tier 4. Stats. AGI, 28. 000 bit, 26. 000. Int, 27. 000 STA, 25. 500. PHY, 26. 000 mana, 26. 500. HP, 18. 818. 000 slash 18. 818. 000. Unassigned stat points, 0. Hidden stats. Luck, 52 to 100. Charm, 99 slash 100. Infamy, 0 slash 100. Status, no abnormalities. Equipment, Lich's Ring. Concealer Mask. Sun God's Bracelet, Legendary. Doom Armor, Legendary. Death Knight's Black Shield. Pope's Token. White Lion's Kneecaps, Dark Gold. Supreme Witch Arm. King's Helmet. Weapons, Grim Reaper. Skills, Darkness Bind. Summon Knight Durahel. Wind Slash. Critical Absorb. Berserk. Darkness Blast. Death Slash. Eyes of God. Earthquake. Critical Block. Blink. Stormbringer. Swift Retreat. Illusiony Multi Sword. Suppression Art. Three Point Stab. Twin Blade Hurricane. Twin Blade Cross Slash. Claymore. Overheard Slash. Solar Restore. Solar Flare. Solar Blast. Solar Descent. Solar Beam. Shadow Doppelgangers. Knight's Courage. Holy Lance Divine. One Leg Leap, Rare. Cloud Feet. Circumvent. Dance of Death, Divine. Class Specific Skills. Death Knight Summoning. Death Knight's Aura. Black Ratio. Enhanced Full Counter. Death Legion. Knight of the Empire Complete. Time Dilation. Mount, Grey Wolf. Pet, Furball, Divine Nine Tails. It had completely transformed from the last time that he had seen it. And he felt a huge burst of strength flowing through his body all of a sudden. Rudra easily felt 40% stronger than he was just a minute ago, and the margin of his increase of strength was so huge that he felt like should he face Scar face in a fight at this moment. He would not take more than 15 moves to defeat him. Rudra had already transcended the level limit for tier 5 now. And should he wish to opt for it, he could go on for a tier promotion quest now, and officially become the 4th tier 5 powerhouse in the continent. This was the goal Rudra had set for himself before he began Omega. A feeble dream that even his heart was too bold to dare believe. However now that dream was only one step away. If he could ascend to tier 5 ranks, then the balance of power would tilt heavily into the favor of Hazel Groove Empire, as it would be the only force in the continent to have two tier 5 powerhouses. Had everything been normal, Rudra would most likely have an ambition for global domination upon reaching tier 5 by conquering the whole continent and claiming it as his own. But with the times being so tumultuous, he gave up on those needless dreams. However, the tier 5 promotion quest was a matter for the future as at this moment, what Rudra needed to do first was to understand what an immortal legacy was. This time around there was no skill upgrade card amongst the rewards. But since the game followed a trope of every reward in the chain quest becoming better and better, Rudra was sure that it was something game breaking for sure. Rudra looked at the description. Immortal legacy, a legacy that can only be imparted onto a player who has reached the status of a legend within the game. Choose from the selection of these five legacies. Legacy Pack 1. Legacy of Thor Odinson, pack includes 1. Mjolnir Hammer, Legendary 2. Three of his skills, rated Legendary or higher 3. Status as an Honorary Norseman in the Cosmos Legacy Pack 2. Legacy of Poseidon, this pack includes 1. See King's Trident, Legendary 2. 
three of his skills, rated legendary or higher. Three, ability to talk with all sea creatures. Legacy Pack 3. Legacy of Binyager, this pack includes. 1. Staff of Healing, Legendary. 2. Binyager's two best moves, Semi-Divine or higher. 3. Status as Binyager's Beloved. Legacy Pack 4. Legacy of Michael, this pack includes. 1. Raise change from human to half angel. 2. One move from Michael's arsenal, Semi-Divine or lower. 3. The Holy Sword Excalibur. Legacy Pack 5. Legacy of the Unnamed God, this pack includes. 1. Ability to manipulate gravity. 2. One random move of the unnamed god. 3. Blueprints to the galactic battleship. Please chose from the following options. Legacy Pack 1. Legacy Pack 2. Legacy Pack 3. Legacy Pack 4. Legacy Pack 5. Rudra was in a big dilemma now as to what choice should he make. This was nothing like he had expected the immortal legacy to be at all. As it contained everything from items to skill sets to special perks that are unthinkable. Even the smallest thing like choosing the right skill could immensely benefit Rudra in the coming times. However, choosing such a pack could mean that Rudra could dramatically alter his overall strength by making the right choice. It was no longer as simple as choosing the best skill to upgrade or choosing the right piece of equipment. Each legacy had its merits, and every single perk inside each legacy was extremely enticing. This was the most difficult choice Rudra had to make yet. And for once, he wished that he needed a council of the wisest men in the world and Gaia assembled at this spot to create a huge debate on what legacy to choose, and why to give him some clarity of mind on what he needed to chose. But wishful thinking was useless. Nobody was going to host a debate for him. And he was going to be the sole decision maker in this moment, with only his own brain to argue with on which skills to choose and why. Meanwhile real life. Max. The loss of both his parents at such a tender age made Max undergo a change in his personality. He was soon going to turn 16, and would be allowed to enter Omega as a player then. And he could not wait to unload all his pent-up frustration by slaughtering monsters in-game. Although Rudra attended to his little brother daily, and tried his best to provide him a warm environment. Without the love of the scolding Mama Raj put, Max was slowly turning cold and growing mature rapidly. Forward slash forward slash forward slash sorry guys. This time around I cannot ask you all on which legacy to choose, as the future plot is heavily hinged on this choice and I have already planned it out. Even though that is the case, feel free to comment on what you think should be chosen and why. As you never know if your argument changes my mind. Special shout out to Thomas Sanders for the 500 coin massage chair. I appreciate the support forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 707 Rudra's Choice By the Method of Elimination Rudra eliminated Thor's pack first, as he was not an axe user, and did not need the copy of the famous Hammer Mjolnir. Rudra then eliminated the Thunder God Zeus, simply because the pack paled in comparison to the value of other three and had no major real-world bonuses. Rudra then eliminated Michael's pack as he made an instinctive choices of his life. He had a gut feeling that him changing the race to Fallen Angel would somehow mess with his innate profession the Death Knight and the interference will not bring him any benefits. Trusting his gut he eliminated the Michael's pack even though he had a great interest in wielding Excalibur again and learning one more of Michael's overpowered moves. Rudra was in serious dilemma in choosing between Benyager's pack and the unnamed god's pack. On one side Benyager's pack was sure to offer him some sort of broken healing skill, while on the other the unnamed god offered a versatile gravity manipulation technique alongside one of the very important vehicles of the cosmos. The battleship. The problem was that he had too little information about both the possible paths to decisively make a decision. At this moment Rudra did not know that even if he was able to obtain the staff of healing inside Omega, would he be able to carry it forward to the real world? Currently he already had items like the sun god's bracelet, and the wooden pendant that were broken in their own rights. However, that did not mean Rudra could do wood manipulation or solar manipulation in real life. Without the items, he was stranded of those powers. Rudra also did not know about what random skill will he be able to obtain from the unnamed god, and what was the grade of the battleship he was about to obtain. Rudra did not know the universal standards at the moment, and this made taking a decision in the dark that much harder for him. However, after thinking long and hard about it, Rudra understood that his heart inclined towards obtaining the unnamed god's legacy more than Binyager's. As while he could always find more ways to learn some essential healing skills, learning gravity manipulation and obtaining a battleship was near impossible. Taking a deep breath, Rudra chose the Pack 5 as he accepted the immortal legacy of the unnamed god. Instantly Rudra felt like his mind was about to burst as secrets of the basics of gravity manipulation entered his brain. Rudra was taught the divine rated technique of how mana could be manipulated to bend gravity. His horizons were expanded as an infinite amount of applications entered his mind. 
Ridra could use the gravity manipulation to not only create powerful fields of gravity to suppress his opponents, but he could also use them to fly like Superman and increase the power of each and every one of his attacks, while potentially negating the impact of all of the enemy's moves. Ridra was very satisfied by this choice that he had made as just with the secrets of gravity manipulation alone, he felt like he could undoubtedly become the strongest player that planet Earth had ever seen as with this secret technique in his arsenal, he could actually even gain an edge against all the other tier 5 competitors he was about to have in the future. Rudra also studied the battleship blueprint to be shocked by the amount of materials that were needed to build this thing in-game. Although the construction instructions were detailed enough to create a real-life version of the thing should Rudra wish to make it, but the sheer size of the battleship gave Rudra goosebumps. It was the size of an entire city, and not a small city like Purple A's city, but about the size of Tokyo. The amount of steel and resources that was needed to make the battleship was easily exceeding his net value. As he doubted that even if he liquidated all of his trillions of dollars, he would not be able to get a hold of the materials necessary to make the ship. At the core was a fusion reactor that fused not hydrogen or helium molecules, but freaking oxygen molecules to create energy strong enough to wipe out an entire nation at once should something in the process go wrong. With a seating capacity of a whopping 130 million passengers. It was a battleship like the mythical battleship from Stat Wars. Lined with uncountable pulse cannons and a fighting crew of over 25 million soldiers. Rudra was blown away by the grandeur of the ship as he understood that this piece of blueprint could become one of the most prized possessions of humanity. As when they would enter the universal scale, the ability to produce battleships would be looked as a highly favorable skill to have. In this very moment Rudra made up his mind to anyhow produce one of these ships in real life before the first awakening occurred. Although he was creating it as a showcase of human strength and not as a battleship ready for fighting. Little did he know that him having such a battleship in his arsenal would change the course of history for this small planet. Finally Rudra got to the part where he would receive one skill from the unnamed god. Unlike other packs where he would have some sort of choice or control on what skill he received this one was going to be random. And Rudra prayed for it to be a good one. Forward slash forward slash forward slash guys today will be a two chapter day. With the second chapter being a bonus for hitting the GT target. We are moving absolutely slowly in the GT department RN. And I can't understand why. I promise to produce a bonus chapter for every 200 GT we get this month. So please 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 help the book move forward for a lot lot of chapters. We are currently at 400 GT dot. And you can keep account for yourselves here on out forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 708 moving forward. Object manipulation. A skill of the unnamed god. That allows him to use gravity manipulation in a special way that allows him to control objects. Become a special gravity attraction for a specific object to attract. Repel or freeze the mid-air. Recall your weapon after throwing it. Freeze a sky full of arrows on the spot and shoot out random rocks on the side of the road as a missile projectile. The applications are endless. Figure them out for yourself. Skill duration. Level 1 3 object manipulation. Infinite passive. Level 2 multiple object manipulation 3 minutes. Level 2 cooldown 3 hours. Mana consumption 1050. 000, 000 units per minute. Rudra took a deep breath after looking at the skill object manipulation. It was an extended version of the skill gravity manipulation however it was more application based. Alongside gravity manipulation, it was undoubtedly one of the most broken skills a player could hope to possess, and was undoubtedly a valuable asset to his move set. The versatility these two moves added to his battle style tingled Rudra's senses, as he felt like a new layer of fight moves and combos was now possible for him to execute. This was one of those moves. Just like Johnny English becoming formless, that had no counter at all under most circumstances. Even if the opponent was the strongest spear thrower in the history of the continent. If Ridra could manipulate his spear throw into an infinitely suspended spear state, then no matter how hard his opponent threw the spear or what technique he used, it would all be technically useless against Ridra. Although Ridra did not know the full extent of this skill, the possibilities made his mind go insane. Over the last one year the amount of power he had amassed could only be hoped for in dreams, by even the best professional players. Rudra was becoming a final boss inside Omega every single passing day. And it was virtuous cycle for him to the top. What he did not know, was that such legacy moves could not be inherited by just any run-of-the-mill player even if they had an opportunity to inherit it. He did not focus much on the system description at the start. But immortal legacies could actually only inherited by players who had reached the status of a legend within the game. Currently in Omega Rudra was the only player who had reached that status by repeatedly creating history. Hence this opportunity had not fallen at him due to luck. And not because he was the Church of Death's Pope. A player could only become a legend when the amount of titles he owned exceeded a system limit. After which he slash, she was considered to be a part of the history of the continent. 
Ribber was very happy with this power-up. As for him with this, he finally had a chance to make an impactful contribution during the war against Lucifer. Ribra looked at the next level of the revival of the church quest and was shocked to see the amount of followers needed to reach the last and final threshold. Ultimate level quest. Rise of a lost religion. Time limit. Unknown. Difficulty. Immeasurable. Rewards. Plus 200 levels. Plus 15. 000, 000 stat points. Plus the status of being Hades as fifth commander. Description. You have successfully started a religion. But can you really grow it from the ground up to its past glory? You have managed to grow the religion to a 100 million followers, and now, it could be said, that it will survive the decade without any problems. But only by growing it to a billion can it weather the century. Stage 4. Obtain 1 billion followers. Progress. 100. 0, 010. 0, 0, 008 slash 1. 000. 000. 000. 000. 000. 000. 000. 000. 000. Rudra laughed his bum off after seeing the 1 billion number, as he did not even focus on the rewards of the chain quest anymore. With nearly 14 months left till Omega ended, he needed nearly 2.5 million followers added every single day to reach the 1 billion mark before the deadline. Even at his current mad rate of getting nearly 750. 000 a day, there was no way for him to grow it to 2.5 million by any amount of schemes he used. The time frame he had was just not enough to accomplish this task. Hence, he immediately discarded the very thought of pushing hard for the next stage. Every stage kept getting harder and harder. But now the system had just made it ridiculous. If Rudra had a decade to do this quest then sure he would slowly amass the 1 billion followers in time. However with only 14 months at hand, it was not possible at all. Rudra's focus for the next few days was hand set in stone. He needed to practice the gravity manipulation more before attempting to ascend to tier 5 before the set deadline to start the war on Lucifer. Now was the time he needed to start putting the elites into work mode and the lifestyle guild into production mode as after 9 months of power leveling the lifestyle members, they had already all reached at least tier 2 and some senior members, like Fatty, had even reached tier 3. This meant that their futures were secured and they could now go back to working full time in the forges. However not only did Rudra need to work them in game, but also hire skilled engineers and scientists real life to work with the lifestyle guild members in creating the massive battleship real life. A lot of smooth details needed to be finessed out, and Ridra now needed a base of operations as big as Tokyo City to build a massive ship in the first place. Which probably meant deforestation of some massive region or capturing some inhabited island on Earth. If he did not think wrongly. Apparently Ethan Gray had a massive private island to his name in the Pacific Ocean, which could be suitable for making the ship. But Ridra needed to work out the finer details for sure. Keeping an eye towards the future. Ridra got back to work both in real life and in game as the time for the war and the first awakening both grew near forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the gt target enjoy everyone forward slash forward slash forward slash chapter 709 a meeting with hades surprisingly the easiest move to learn was how to fly and it was an absolute thrilling experience for ridra as a kid ridra was always a big fan of cartoon superheroes that flew through the skies like superman however never did he expect that someday he would be the one who would be zooming through the skies himself. For the first three days, while he could take really amazing leaps, he could not defy gravity enough to fly as he wished, while every single time the landing scared him to death as he was not able to deaccelerate properly. For the first few times he crashed into trees, buildings, windows, and what not before he got the hang of how to deaccelerate properly. After a while Ridra finally understood that flying was basically just a very complicated form of physics, where he needed to find the right tangent against Earth's gravity to propel him into space. His initial problem was that although he had a much stronger physique than the common man, his legs could not generate enough power to help him gain one kilometer or more in vertical altitude. Also, as he jumped higher the air got thinner, and he felt an unusual pressure along his ears. It was only slowly that he got accustomed to the higher altitude, and was able to think straight even after reaching those heights. He understood that to balance out the lack of air pressure as he went up, he needed to create an artificial pressure field using gravity that would keep the net pressure around him to be the same. Only and only then could he even dare to move further up in the atmosphere. By the one-week mark, Rudra combined the one-legged leap special move alongside a better grip on gravitational manipulation to reach the height of airplanes in the stratosphere during his jumps. It was a completely surreal feeling for him every time he broke through clouds as he could not stop smiling and laughing like a madman. However, despite his own pleasure, he did not forget to think about this problem from a technical standpoint and think about how to integrate various combat moves with his newfound ability to maximize combat potential. 
Little by little he understood how to create sudden gravity fields around objects to change their trajectory. As within Omega, he was able to use gravity manipulation to the effect of X-30 gravity, and completely suppress even peak tier 3 opponents to the extent that they could not even move a muscle. This was still very effective on tier 4 opponents, whose knees would buckle from the pressure, and they would struggle to remain conscious. While it was Ruder's estimation that it would make life of tier 5 existences challenging, as they would feel as if they were moving through thick liquid rather than thin air while under such a heavy gravity suppression. The progress in the field of gravity research was steady, but it was quite slow compared to what it could be as Ribra only gave it a few hours every day. There were too many applications to explore, and Ribra needed to get proper time to learn them all. But time was not in his favor at all, as he still needed to go for the tier 5 promotion quest before the set deadline to declare war. One month before the prepared date to declare war. Rudra was summoned to a separate system space to meet Hades, as he was summoned there to meet the new demon kings and have a chat about the coming war. In the presence of Hades, Rudra walked up proudly to Hades, who beamed at looking at his favorite pope. As with Rudra delivering 100 million followers in under one year to Hades, the god of death seemed to have his powers increased exponentially. Hades looked much bulkier than Rudra last saw him, and the place where he would usually be seated alone was now a bustling hall filled with various demons as the black smoke around Hades was now thicker than ever before. My Pope! Shikuni! Welcome! Hades said, as he spread his arms wide and smiled. Ridra walked up to the God of Death, and bowed before him to pay his respects as he said, My Lord! Hades chuckled at Ridra's antics and fake respect, as he pointed towards the man seated to his right and said, Second Commander, King Asmodeus. Third Commander, King Liviaden. Fourth Commander, King Mammon and finally 5th Commander King Belphegor. Ridra scanned all the demon kings seated who were eyeing him with curiosity and distrust, as he activated the god's eyes to forcefully look at their stats. Asmodeus was at the peak of tier 5, while the others were slightly weaker, with the weakest being Belphegor, at the start of tier 5. Ridra was impressed by the strength of the demon kings as having 4 tier 5 servants by his side. Hades was definitely going to have a great upper hand in the coming war. Pointing at Ridra however, Hades said, First Commander, King Shikuni one night. Pope of the Church of Death. Ridra raised his head higher in pride when he was labeled as the first commander. As he smiled a knowing smile at Hades. It was true that all of the demon kings were formidable. But none of them were as formidable as the greatest mastermind to ever live. Shikuni of the Elites. Asmodeus's face turned ugly at this announcement while the other demon kings felt uncomfortable too. Sensing the situation. Hades said. Before we move forward. I need to make the command structure clear. My orders are absolute, and the tag behind the general dictates their standing in my army. The orders of the first commander supersedes, that of second commander on field, and so on. If anyone has an issue with this arrangement, now is the time to speak up. At this moment, Asmodeus raised his hand, as he looked at Ridra with disgust. As he said, I have a problem. Forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Savanthi for the two 5,000 coin magic castles. I really really appreciate the patronage a lot. As with every super gift there will be a bonus chapter associated with it. Hence today will be a 3 chapter day. This being the first one. Please thank Savanthi in the comments for the bonuses guys. Let's go. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 710 Respect. Even Belphegor is stronger than this human my lord. And he has not even reached the realms of tier 5 yet. I'm sure the human is indispensable for you. Due to his good work in Middle Earth. But this is a war we are gearing for. And in war the soldiers only respect the strong generals. In such circumstances, the first commander cannot be the weakest one can he? Rudra grinned when he heard this criticism. He looked at Asmodeus, who was giving him ugly looks, and just sniggered in his heart. This was a recap for him when he was appointed as a lieutenant of the Hazelroof Kingdom by Cervantes. Back then the other lieutenants found his rise to be too fast and undeserving, and history was now repeating itself once more. Rudra looked at Hades, who gestured for him to silence Asmodeus himself as Rudra said. Very well. I accept your criticism, King Asmodeus. However, let me ask you a few simple questions if I may. Please try to answer me with the best of your abilities. How many soldiers do you bring to the table? King Asmodeus. What is your personal contribution to this campaign? Ridra asked in a satirical voice. Asmodeus's face darkened when he heard this as he said, I lead whatever force my lord assigns me to lead. Ridra nodded his head. As he said, Good. 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 Just for your information. I bring 103 million humans behind me. And my personal army of my kingdom. Yes, unlike you. I'm actually a king with a kingdom and people. The other demon kings laughed at the insult. As Asmodeus's aura turned murderous. 
He did not expect the human to shrink his ego down to size. Rudra continued, I'm sure you must have illustrious battle record then. Having won multiple wars from unfavorable positions? This was obviously a trick question. Asmodeus had been born only a few days ago, and he had not fought a single war up till this moment, which was a blatant flaw when one saw it. Rudra continued, I on the other hand have never lost a war, and very recently routed the over 30 million strong army of Lucifer's underlings the blood merchants with a significantly smaller force. They call me Shakuni the Invincible because I'm the mastermind strategist that has never been outsmarted, which is why King Hades allows me to be your superior, as he understands that my natural battle instinct are superior to yours. Rudra was face slapping as Modius left and right, and the face of the demon king now turned ugly as he was unable to contain the anger. His aura exploded as he tried to suppress Rudra through his demonic suppression. However, Rudra retaliated with gravity suppression as well as death aura, as dense black fumes just like Hades' S own started to emit from Rudra's body. Rudra activated the god's eyes as he stared down the soul of Asmodeus, who felt pressured when looking at the human and had to back off unwillingly. He felt the air heavy and laborious to breath as Rudra's X-30 suppression to be difficult. As he gasped and said, Gravity suppression. But how? Why does a weakling like you have the aura of death and the ability to manipulate gravity? It makes no sense. Rudra looked at Asmodeus and said, Nothing about me makes sense. So you better get used to this. If you are dissatisfied with my strength then I assure you, we can go a few rounds now, and I will give you the ass whooping of a lifetime. Or you can wait for an even worse one after I reach tier 5 in a few weeks time. Either way, I stay first commander. Rudra's declaration was extremely domineering. The other demon kings were impressed by his strength and accepted his position easily. Asmodeus was a noppy in his heart, but understood that Rudra was indeed much stronger than an average tier 4 individual and definitely special for his lord. Hence regretfully accepted his position as number 1. Hades chuckled at Rudra's display of power while he was mildly shocked to see gravity manipulation. But nonetheless things seemed to progress better than he had expected them to. With Rudra not only showing extraordinary personal strength, but also far exceeding his initial expectations of the church's revival. Finally Hades said, Since there are no other objections, let's officially start the war council. Currently the demon kingdom looks like this. Dot. Hades unflirted a huge map in the floor which showed the current position of the demon's kingdom. At the heart of the kingdom sat the city of the dead. The capital built by Hades, which was currently the nesting ground of Lucifer, and also the place where the throne of hell was situated. The shortest path towards that city was a march through the eastern province, where one needed to capture 11 minor towns, and three major ones to reach the capital. But the problem was that the army also needed to cross the very risky Thames River, whose bridges were closely guarded. The north had a rocky terrain that made mobilization of army through it difficult, while the south had dense forests which posed the same problem. The best way to go in was through the west side, which was also the longest path, as one needed to capture at least 17 minor towns and five major ones to reach the capital from the west. This was the first major agenda on the table right now as the large-scale war needed to be planned from the scratch, and this was the most critical moment in it, as depending on what path they chose a lot of preparations needed to be made. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Savanthi. Please thank him in the comments for this one. Guys, I need much more GT than this. We are only at 480 at the moment, and the bonus is at 600. Come and you all I know we can pick it up. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 7 11 Battle Plans But before he could draw a battle plan, he needed to understand the current troop strength of his side versus the enemy side. So he asked, My lord, how many troops do we have? Hades' eyes brightened at this question as he said, With the help of the demon's diary, I have been able to revive the four demon kings at tier 5, and 108 demon generals at tier 4, and a demon army of 25 million strong all above tier 2, and mostly in tier 3. In the next three months if my power keeps growing, I will be able to create 30 million more. Rudra nodded at this information in approval. This was indeed a massive number of soldiers to be amassed in such a short time. Hades was a frightening enemy to make. Given enough time, he could recreate the demon race as a whole. Assuming that Hades brought 55 million soldiers to the table alongside a few high-level ones, and Rudra was able to bring at least 50% of his religious following, the army would be a 100 million strong at the minimum and could be as large as 120 140 million. This was almost the total population of the true elite's kingdom as a whole. So essentially it was like marching with an entire kingdom full of soldiers. Just the total scale of the war was something unimaginable to a common player. As Rudra was sure that a war of this caliber would need not only the four demon kings in himself, 
but many, many more capable generals to execute the plan on a microscale. This was no longer as easy as Rudra saving the day for the elites. As this time, it needed to be a very long and arduous team effort for the win. As Hades and the other generals discussed war plans, Rudra remained silent as he formed a strategy and calculated the probability of winning from each angle. Rudra understood warfare on a deeper level and understood that the real fight was in the city of the dead the capital of hell while the other towns outside were to just slow them down. The longer the chosen route, higher the deaths, and lesser the chances of victory. Major cities were especially difficult to topple with one slash multiple tier 5 generals guarding it alongside millions of troops. Rudra was sure that if even with an army of 30 million strong the blood merchants could not topple Purple A's city, then they should not dare think that they could win any major cities without losing at least 10-15 million troops on each raid and 2-5 million in every minor town. This meant that should they go from the north they would only have 40 million left by the time they reached the capital. 25 from west, 35 from south, and 55 from east. Either way, the amount of troops in the end were just not enough to logically win the capital city, as even with 55 million strong army Rudra was not confident of victory. This meant that no matter what they needed to work on improving the eastern front strategy, and come up with a way to reach the capital safely with at least 80 million soldiers at hand. With this conclusion drawn in his mind, Rudra started to reverse calculate about the problems on the eastern front and started to scout the Thames River to look for possible crossing points. Apart from the obvious bridges and the boat method, there were two points where the river was its narrowest with it being only 10 meters in width, which was a range that could be even bridged with man-made ladders that could be used to create shore-to-shore -shore bridges and cross fast. Rudra thought and then thought some more about it, before finally speaking his first words in the meeting for over two hours. He had completely zoned out for the last two hours, and apparently missed the part where Asmodeus convinced everyone that the west side was the best choice as he simply nullified two hours worth of discussions by declaring, East, we must go east. The attention in the room suddenly transferred to the quiet first commander as everyone looked at him with a funny face now, because his antics were just too interesting. Before Asmodeus could put up a protest, Hades raised his hand up to signal silence as Rudra laid out his plan. The initial funny faces of the demon kings instantly turned serious as they understood that what Rudra was spitting was pure gold. To them completely drenched in sweat ten minutes later, as Rudra was halfway done with his explanation. Rudra's ability as a commander was second to none, and it was visible as he explained every decision he took logically and explained all the possible angles it covered and why it was the best choice given the circumstances. He left no room for doubt or argument as his doubts were covered by a plan B then a plan C. D. E. He was also backed by irrefutable information, as his god's eyes gave him the ability to scout like no scout could ever do. With him able to do in minutes, what a scout would take weeks to accomplish. By the time Rudra was done explaining, Asmodeus was left mouth agape, while the rest of the demon kings had newfound respect for their first commander. Everyone in the room, Hades included understood at that moment, that this one Shakuni of the elites was something else. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter 2 halves for the super gift by Savanthi. Thank him in the comments for this one. Special shout out to Thomas Sanders for the 5000 coin magic castle. This streak of castles has me really pumped to work. Hence thank you so much for the patronage. Slightly smiling face. Bonus chapter for you our super gift will be right up after this. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 712 Dronacharya pulls it off. There were many runes that detected demonic presence in the area. But none for humans as while well, it was possible to enter Hades' private space through hell. It was not possible to do so from Middle Earth unless Hades himself invited you explicitly like Rydra was. Since humans were not allowed in hell at all, the security system was not tuned to detecting human presence. Dronacharya hence managed to luck out when it came to the first layer of protection from entering the room, which was runic inscriptions that detected demon intrusion. But from there on out, it was purely a show of skills to go forward. The vault leading to the room had too many guards guarding the damn thing. And the only way in was through them. Dronacharya had prepared a special high-speed clutch tool that would shoot a metal wire and attach itself to the vault door before quickly pulling him past the corridor before the guards noticed. However, even if he could zoom past the guards, it was impossible for him to not be seen by them. Which is why he added a simple touch to his plan to make it perfect. He threw smoke grenades in the corridor, which instantly made the guards alert about any incoming invaders as they sounded the alarms. However, just as the smoke completely covered their visions, Dronacharya used his clutch tool to move past the corridor in a blinding speed without the guards ever realizing that the opponent had crossed the corridor in the confusion. It was a race against time now for Dronacharya, who had one ear to the safe as he tried to open the door combination before the smoke ran out. 
he essentially had 20 seconds to get a four-digit combination correct, and it was a near-impossible feat to pull off. It seemed that Lady Luck was smiling at him. As with a bit of skill and a lot of luck, he managed to open the vault door by second 15. As the sound of the vault opening alerted the guards. From then on it was just Dronacharyo's show as he quickly located the demon's diary and just microseconds before the guard could take him down. Through the vial of the special acid given to him by Lucifer as he melted the book down. Unquestionably he was taken down. But not before having the satisfaction to see a system notification pop up on his screen that said that his SSS rated quest was a success. For the first time in a long time. Everything worked out exactly how he had planned it to go, and now, as a reward, he was guaranteed to receive compensation from Lucifer in the form of the downfall of Shakuni. Dronacharya did this quest with an extremely narrow mindset of revenge on Shakuni. However, with the destruction of the demon's diary, he practically destroyed the capability of Hades to produce any more demons for his army, which meant that the forces of death would remain stuck with 25 million soldiers, 108 generals, and four demon kings for the coming war. Dronacharya laughed like a madman as he was brought in front of a furious Hades, who could not believe that his diary was destroyed, and the icing on the cake was that his arch-enemy Rudra was also present at the scene, staring at him with his eyes wide open. It was a priceless scene for Dronacharya to see Rudra stunned for once, as he managed to undo a decade's worth of work of the man trying to collect one page of the demon's diary at a time. As he faced his judgment, he did not have any fear or remorse on his face at all. As he kept laughing like a madman as he looked at Shakuni and said, See you in the real world next. For your real defeat. The craziness in his eyes giving Ridra the first chill he had felt in his spine by a player since reincarnating. Hades erased Dronacharya from the face of the planet as he gave him a permanent death which essentially reset his character to zero. Should he wish to start again. However it mattered no more. As the quest was already completed and the rewards distributed. Meanwhile Lucifer. When Lucifer got a system notification saying that the quest he gave out was completed he too laughed like a madman as he was in complete disbelief. He had no faith in the mortal to be able to pull it off, but now that it was he was over the moon. The demon's diary was the only tool that could potentially give Hades the edge to take his kingdom back, and its destruction meant that Hades would no longer have the ability to produce demons infinitely. Lucifer intended to hold his end of the bargain as he summoned one of his best commanders Maras and gave him the orders to take down one Shakuni of the elites as per his obligation to the system. Mara's a mid-tier 5 commander was one of Lucifer's top soldiers, and a pillar of his army's strength. He was a man who was only deployed for the most special missions, and this time around. Him alongside a handful of his top men were sent to take Ridra down in Middle Earth. At mid-tier 5, he was someone who could take down entire cities down alone, and hence posed an imminent threat to the security of Purple Haze City. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Thomas Sanders please thank him in the comments for this one. Also guys we are at 596 golden tickets as of this chapter. Let's get 4 more for the bonus. Let's keep this pace up guys. And we can easily enjoy 2-3 chapters every single day. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 7 13 Trouble. 15 winged demons descended from a black vortex in the sky followed by a particularly strong one that seemed to have strength beyond tier 5. Rudra instantly activated God's eyes and looked towards the side of trouble as the one and only thought that he had in his mind at this moment was shit. Not only was the demon level 670 meaning it was in the middle sector of the tier 5 realm, but the 15 winged demons around him were all high tier for themselves. The city simply did not have enough defenses in place to stop an invasion of this scale. Especially not when it came out of nowhere with Rudra being unprepared. The only tier 4s in the city right now were himself. Neatwit. Karna and Mediv, and the four of them were not strong enough to take on the sixteen of them. Especially with the tier five powerhouse being with them. The bigger question was who could be strong enough to open a portal on top of a city? But he did not need to think long about that who. As he knew seeing the enemies to be demons, that it must be Lucifer. He had not provoked the devil recently. And did not expect such a calamity to appear out of nowhere however now, was not the time to wonder how, or why. As now was the time to respond to the threat at once. Little did Rudra know that even for Lucifer, opening such a portal for even a few seconds to let the sixteen of them pass was a Herculean task. The laws of space could not be manipulated over such large distances so easily, even for a god like himself. It was only because of the merit that Dronacharya had built up that Lucifer was compelled to bestow an appropriate reward. Otherwise, even for a personal grudge, he would not send out one of his top commanders to take down a mere mortal. Civilians POV Life was as usual on the streets of Purple Haze City. When out of nowhere, the sky started to darken, 
and a huge wormhole opened up in the sky from where a bunch of demons descended. Initially everyone was curious as to what was going on, as they stopped their work and started to look towards the sky. However, when the demons started unleashing their strong tier 4 attacks on the surface, chaos ensued. All sorts of attacks were being used by the winged demons to wreak havoc on the city. As many buildings were lost with every strike and countless civilians were killed or injured. For the first 30 seconds, it was pure horror as the elites were still gathering their wits as to what was going on. But after that the city sirens started to blare and everyone was made aware that the city was under attack and that everyone must seek shelter at once. The elite police started to shoot at the demons in the skies with the handheld pulse cannons. And shockingly while at first the demons tried to swat the things off. After realizing the power behind the weapons attacks, they were forced to start dodging. This applied for everyone except Mara's off course around whom the attack seemed to bend out of shape and miss him altogether as their trajectory was casually altered. He did not even need to sweat it off personally as he descended towards the city like a proud boss. As he descended he exclaimed loudly, Shikuni! My lord Lucifer sends his regards. Come out and take your punishment like a man. And duel me. Let me finish you off quick and then your city before I return to hell. His domineering words resounded throughout the city as he tried to repeatedly scan the city for Rudra, however failed. After achieving the god's eyes even Lucifer could not forcefully see all of his stats much less someone like Mara's for whom detecting Rudra was an issue. However Mara's knew that as long as he destroyed the city, Rudra was bound to show up to protect his assets sooner or later. Hence with a cheeky smile on his face, he summoned three giant tornadoes spinning out of his palms as he planned to unleash them onto the city to cause significant destruction. As the tornadoes grew larger in his palm, the air above the city became more and more turbulent as strong winds were felt even at the surface. Those who did not manage to get to cover yet and were under tier 2 now struggled to move, while the police was no longer to properly aim their shots at all. It seemed like everything was going south for the city, as even the most daring of videographers that were covering the event live now felt like they needed to take cover and shoot from a safe place as they feared for their lives under the circumstances. Within seconds, demon attack at Purple Haze became the hot topic on the forums as more and more people from other cities hopped onto the forums to see the event live. However, before Maras could unleash his three tornadoes onto the city, the tallest structure in the city, the mage tower shot a thick inferno beam straight towards him, as he was forced to cancel his skill and block for protection. Maras was a little surprised by this phenomenon, as he did not know that such potent technologies existed in a backward place like Middle Earth. However, he was not much bothered by it at all. But for the elites on the streets, it was a matter of great rejoicement as they cheered for the arrival of their guild's top mage to the scene. Mediv was finally ready to retaliate in his mage tower. Forward slash forward slash forward slash excellent job guys in hitting the GT target. We have officially crossed 600 tickets and I will definitely hold the bargain to my end and release another chapter today itself. Let's keep crunching it y'all. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 714 A Trained Unit Mediv was engrossed in his studies in his mage tower when he felt a tremor inside his room. The ground was violently shaking as if in an earthquake. However, coupled with a violent explosion sound in the background, Mediv instantly understood that the city was under some sort of an attack. He looked out of a window in the tower and saw a few damn demons flying in the air as he cursed his damn luck. He was reading a very interesting book on the origin of mana inside the mage tower and these damn demons had interrupted his leisure. He was feeling extremely annoyed and instantly went towards the control room of the mage tower in a hurry connecting himself to the runes and the mana pathway inside. Mediv became omnipotent as he looked at the city and the sky above it like an all-knowing omnipotent god. Noticing the three tornadoes in the hands of the biggest demon, Mediv said to himself, Oh no you don't. As he unleashed an inferno beam aimed directly at the demon's chest, forcing him to cancel the spell he was casting at once. Ever since he had progressed to tier 4, Mediv had unlocked the true potential of the mage tower that Rudra had built him ages ago. He was basically driving a Ferrari with a learner's license up till this point in time when he was a tier 2. While he could only be said to be an amateur driver at tier 3 who could at maximum take the car to 100 miles per hour. Only after reaching tier 4 did he feel like a professional race car driver who could push his car to the limits. As the structure that Rudra had built him could help him express attacks that could even show pseudo tier 5 strength. Although Mediv had no idea about the strength of the enemy, he was sure of the task that he needed to perform which was stalling until the guild master was ready to engage. And while being inside his mage tower, he was not afraid of the demons in the sky at all. His mindset had solidified significantly after spending years as an elite and finally killing his first opponent in real life after the recent raid at the upside. 
as he went from a shy stumbling man to a bold mage with the demeanor of a killer, who was proactive in hunting down his opponents. However, his raging hot blood cooled down instantly when he saw his enemy stopping his singular inferno beam that could even drive back dragons, being blocked without landing a single scratch. T tier 5! He exclaimed as that was the only level that would make sense to block such an attack. As he started to feel butterflies fly up in his stomach, he was out of his league here. A weaker man may have had a breakdown in such a situation. However, Mediv remained calm. He understood that if Inferno, one of the top three moves of the Mage Tower, was incapable of landing a scratch on the opponent, that all he could do was be a deterrent and play defense. He needed to give Rudra as much time as he could to come up with a counter strategy. Meanwhile, Neatwit and Karna. Karna responded quickly to the sound of the blaring alarms in the city as he rushed out of the Elite Guild headquarters and looked at the threat in the city. He noticed the Tier 4 winged demons and their Tier 5 commander and had the same thought as Ridra about the situation which was wholly sh asterisk asterisk. However, equipping his three swords, he quickly headed out towards the Church of Death as he knew that Ridra was probably still present there. However, he made sure to drop a message in the guild chat before he left where he asked the guild members to get their hands on all the handheld pulse cannons that they could get and prepare to respond to the external threat. This was the best quality of Karna. As while he left the heavy thinking to Rudra and his first instinct was to find him and ask for orders. He also did not forget to comfort and react according to his own position as a vice skill master and prepare a primary response to the best of his abilities. This was the main difference between himself and the other elders, who were undoubtedly strong players but very poor leaders under true duress. Needwig just like Karna responded to the threat by equipping himself quickly and rolling out towards the city. But unlike Karna, he did not go looking for Rudra and try to neutralize all incoming attacks on the city instead. He had a simple objective in his mind, as of this moment, which was to minimize damage and protect civilians at all costs. As he did his best to stop the demon's attacks from landing in the vicinity where he was. It was a very noble cause in general. However not very appropriate for the bigger picture as Neatwit's best usage was not in damage control, but to deal with the situation as a whole first. Nonetheless, when he saw Ruder's message to get to the inner city fast, he abandoned his position and rushed to meet up at the Church of Death. Meanwhile the elites, upon receiving orders by Karna to take the handheld cannons from the armory and retaliate against the demons, the elites did not dally at all as within minutes they were out on the streets trying to shoot them down. However when they realized that due to the turbulent winds it was impossible to make a shot, they felt greatly disheartened. However upon seeing Mediva's inferno force off the tornadoes, the elites got the opening, they needed to shoot the damn winged demons down. As hundreds of thousands of pulse beams lit up the sky. As the winged demons who expected an easy crushing of the city were horrified to see such a well-organized response. Many winged demons could not avoid all blasts, and were hit by a few here and there losing HP. As Maris finally understood that the backward Middle Earth city was actually a well-oiled machine. He needed to be more assertive to crush them it seemed forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the GT target. Good job everyone. Hopefully tomorrow, we hit another target, and have another bonus day. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 715 This is my city. Nonetheless Maras was also present with them, and he turned the tables on the situation real quick. Maras was a wind elemental specialist mage. He was a unique type of mage warrior, who had only focused on perfecting spells of one single element and as a result his proficiency in wind magic was second to none. Using the wind magic he could easily deflect the incoming pulse cannon shots to weave around him without having to lift a finger. And after noticing his army facing trouble, he only extended that safety area by a few kilometers to cover the entire region of his troops. A pocket of air was created in which the pulse cannon attacks could just not enter as while they looked like they were on a straight path. Upon touching the air pocket, they would all be sucked into a jet stream and deflected from their initial path. Initially the intensity of the move was only enough to deflect the pulse cannon attacks. However after a while Maras intensified it to nullify the attacks from the mage tower, as well, as he created an invincible shield for his army. Mediv could no longer pierce the air pocket, and that annoyed him greatly. The shield that the enemy had made out of wind magic was at minimum top tier 4, or early tier 5 level, and was proving to be invincible against attacks of the same level. However what Mediv did not know, was that maintaining such a shield came at a cost for Maras, as well as he had to use a lot of his concentration and mana to mint in such a pocket of air. While the other 15 demons were free to attack the city from under the pocket, Maras himself could no longer launch new attacks, being occupied completely in defense. Slowly, Maras kept descending with his gang as the other 15 tier 4 demons kept preparing their best spells to wreak havoc on the city. 
When they were at a significant height, the attacks were spread throughout the city. However, as they descended, their attacks were more focused on the area in the inner city only. Parts of Rudra's palace was destroyed. Parts of the elites' guild headquarters was destroyed, and a lot of elites died under the attacks of the demons as well. When they were only 50 meters from the ground, Maras noticed the Church of Death and the Church of Light standing side by side, and was instantly repulsed by those two structures. Mara said, Men, destroy those two ugly buildings. I can't stand mortals worshipping anyone but our Lord. Wipe it from the face of the Middle Earth. The church has carried a great amount of sentimental value for the players. And it was not something that the players were ready to be seen destroyed. As upon hearing Mara's S order the elites prepared their best spells all together to neutralize all incoming attacks the best they could. But not let any harm befall on the two churches. A total of 15 peak tier 4 spells were unleashed on the vicinity of the two buildings and most players were unable to even register the speed of the attack, much less launch their prepared counters. Only peak tier 3 players could send a weak defense, but their attacks did nothing much in front of peak tier 4 moves. All hope seemed lost. However, just before the moves reached the buildings, they seemed to have collided with an invisible barrier and detonated. A loud explosion that rattled the inner city could be heard as the shockwave knocked many players off their feet. However, even under such extreme circumstances, the shocking part was that the two churches were completely unharmed, as some sort of invisible barrier protected it perfectly. Everyone had the same question in their minds right now. Which was who? The demons and the elites wondered that who could stop such a move alike. As while some elites suspected it might have been Mediv. The older ones already knew that there was only one man who had the strength to stand up to 15 demons at once. Guildmaster! Elite shouted at the top of his lungs, and as if on a cue. Rudra walked out of the Church of Death, like a true overlord with black fumes rising against his body, like a raging tornado. Instantly cheers went out from the elite camp, as if they had already won the fight. As that was the psychological impact Rudra's presence had on everyone which signaled that once he was here, there was no way that the elites were going to lose. Mars opened his eyes in shock to see a puny mortal casually walk out after creating a barrier that could stop the peak attacks of 15 of his best warriors. As while others were oblivious as to the nature of the barrier, he could clearly see the disruptions in gravity. Gravity manipulation. Mara sucked a breath of cold air as he chuckled. It was a supreme technique that not even gods could perform casually, and now he saw a measly tier 4 human perform it. And it gave him goosebumps. Rudra levitated in the air, slowly rising up to the height of 50 meters as he looked at the demons one by one in the eye, leading Mara's for the last as he said, I was wondering what do I offer my lord Hades as a sacrificial blood today? I did not want my lord to feel bored of the same old human goat. Sheep, pig blood all the time. However, I must thank you all to put me out of my dilemma. I think winged demon blood would be a great addition to the menu. Dot. The winged demons bared their fangs at Rudra as some of them rushed to take them on. But Mediv extended his hand and prevented his troops from rushing out of the air pocket. While his stupid men failed to pick up on the two tier four warriors that Rudra was hiding in the two churches. He had already picked up on them. The moment his men took the bait and stepped out of the pocket. Not only would they be pummeled by the weird energy blast from the guns, but also fall prey to hidden attacks. The enemy had mounted a clever ambush. But till he was there, such petty tricks were not going to work. Smiling, Mara said, Too bad. My lord Lucifer has other plans for the churches today. I'm afraid sacrifical services won't be available. But don't worry. I will personally offer your head to my lord for sure. Looking at the sadistic smile on Mara's S face, as well as his restraint to not fall for Rudra's taunt. Rudra understood that this demon was not going to be easy to trick. His opponent was cunning, smart and most of all extremely powerful and dangerous. This was going to be a fight of a lifetime for Rudra. There was no question about it. And he needed to be at his sharpest. While the world looked at the casually flying Rudra with their malice agape, trying to figure out how the hell did a player learn a flight skill. The elites looked at the back of their leader with extreme respect and hope as they believed that with him up there the sky would not fall. Meanwhile Johnny, Johnny had accidentally followed Rudra's advice, and chosen the lightning tribulation, as his chosen means, to ascend to tier 4. While at first it seemed like a bad idea, later on he passed the test with a breeze after becoming formless against the lightning. He passed the exam with a SSS rating, and laughed at what was Rudra rambling about with the test being difficult. He thought that the boy was just a big wimp, who was making a mountain out of a mole hill not understanding that he was the only man in the world who could pass the ascension test like this. Just as he was about to celebrate the ascension, however, he saw in the guild messages that some sort of trouble was there and that Rudra had asked for all elders to assemble as soon as possible. Johnny sighed. 
thinking that the elites worked his old bones way too much as he hopped on his dinosaur and zoomed away to the nearest teleportation center. He casually typed the message, Coming kids! Don't die! And pressed sit on the group chat. When the other guild members read it, they felt a bit awkward upon seeing it. As Sir Johnny was the only one who could reply to Rudra as a kid dot. Forward slash forward slash forward slash only one chapter today. Because none of the targets have been met unfortunately. Hoping to hit 800 GT tomorrow for a bonus chapter. We can easily get it guys. I know we can. Special shout out to Anton Kartunen for the 500 coin massage chair forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 716 Mara's strength. He could easily take on a dumb tier 5 existence and give the man a run for its money if he could invite him into falling for his tricks one after another. However the intelligent kind did not fall for such stuff. Mara's was the intelligent type of opponent that was calm and surveyed his surroundings and his enemy intentions well before making a decision. Such an attitude made it hard for Rudra to make a battle strategy that could skew the innate disadvantage of having a lower level into an advantage. Rudra did a bit of mental calculation and understood that in terms of stats, he should be at par or only slightly inferior to Mara's at the moment as upon reaching tier 5 from 4-1 would get all stats doubled. Unless Mara's was a freak of nature and had naturally boosted stats. He should be about par with Rudra. This meant that Rudra would not be outpaced or outwrestled by his opponent. But the problem lied in the execution of the inherent tier 5 moves. Rudra only had one tier 5 move under his belt whose execution left his body strained. However Mara's was sure to have many more. This was going to be the edge he needed to suppress Rudra as it was undoubtedly an uphill battle for the king of elites. Mara's too made some mental calculations about Rudra's strength as the only thing he was wary about was his gravity manipulation skill. However after thinking about it much he realized that the best way to win this fight was to suppress Rudra in a battle of strength as he drew his sword. Rudra responded in kind and drew out Grim Reaper in the right hand and Siege Breaker in the left as the two men stared into each other's eyes to threaten the other off. Boom! Mara's deactivated the wind barrier and zoomed in a sonic boom towards Rudra, who was ready for the attack and held his ground as the two men clashed swords. Shying! Sparks flew across the sky as Mara's S great sword collided against Rudra's dual wielding, the bulky demon towering over his small human counterpart. However to Mara's shock even at his full strength, he was unable to push Rudra back who could more than hold his ground. As he felt like something was off about the strength of his opponent. Rudra gave Mara's absolutely no time to figure out what was off however, as a surreal aerial battle broke off between the two as they battled at unreal speeds mid-air. Mara's and Rudra were both using some special techniques to fly as unlike his legion. Mara's himself was not a winged demon, but rather a pure-blooded high demon who specialized in wind manipulation to fly. Hence both him and Rudra were also subconsciously handling their flight path while facing off against each other in high-speed duels. Only someone like Rudra could pull off a battle at such a high level without his brain crashing as every single second there were a thousand tasks to perform just to stay alive and in position for the next strike. An average player would long be minced meat in such a scenario. While the two monsters battled it out in the skies, the other 15 winged demons descended upon the city to unleash their carnage. Neatwick and Karna understood that the initial plan was a no-go now and that they needed to respond immediately. It was basically up to him. Mediv and Neatwick now to defend the city from the winged demons as each of them were required to take on five winged demons. Karna spun into action with his three sword style. After reaching tier 4 and practicing a lot in real life his battle style had matured a lot as he understood the essence of when to attack and when to retreat in a fight. He used the move sky split to create a sky splitting slash and hurt two winged demons at once to draw their attention. The winged demons who looked at their gushing wound were annoyed by Karna's antics as they instantly charged at the man. The original Karna would have tried to attract even more demons to fight at this moment. However the more mature Karna would not. Even if the demons wreaked havoc on the city and it pained his heart to see it. Karna understood that he could tackle two at most at the moment and if he needed to slay five of them he needed to take them on one after another to have a chance of victory. If he was at the peak of tier 4, maybe he could try to take all of them at once. However, he was not yet strong enough to take on more. At the tier 4 level, it was very difficult to do PV type fights. If at tier 1 Karna could easily take on 15 men of the same level, it was because of his superior talent and the mistakes in his opponent's fight style. However, such dominance was not possible against tier 4 opponents. Those who could reach tier 4 were already extremely talented individuals and the cream of the crop. They could not be dominated so easily by talent alone unless one was a true freak of nature like Rudra. Hence Karna absolutely dominated the two opponents he took on and tried to finish them off as soon as possible without thinking about useless things 
like how much destruction were the other three causing to the city. Mediv on the other hand could successfully engage with five demons at once using his mage tower and even fight them evenly. As his tier 4 strength amplified by his mage tower was enough for him to stand his ground. His spells that were weak in front of Mara's were more than potent enough in front of the winged demons, who had a hard time in breaching the tower's defenses. The best part for Medib being that he was surrounded by elite warriors, who were shooting the demons with pulse cannons continuously, making their life hell. Finally, Nitwit was the one who had a really hard time fighting against five winged demons at once. Just like Karna his limit was two, while he could barely take on three and hold off four. However fighting all five at once, he was losing a lot of HP and fast. Fighting more than he could chew after coming into the emotion that he could not see his city being suffered. Nitwit was paying the price of playing the hero. Inherently, Nitwit was a talent superior to Karna himself. As his fighting acumen was second to only Rudra in the guild as his thirst for leveling and constant solo fighting made him a very proficient fighter on his own. However he lacked the maturity and stable mindset that was needed to make him the top guy in the guild. As his childishness and rash decision making was visible in his fighting style. SH asterisk asterisk SH asterisk asterisk thought Neatwit as he saw his HP drop further and further. At this rate, he was going to die pretty soon. The elites tried to interfere in the fight. But it was too fast paced for them to intervene without impeding Neatwit. Hence although they gave support wherever they could. Slowing down his death. The winged demons with only some casual attacks wiped out entire divisions of elites trying to support Neatwit as soon the man found himself supportless all over again. One of the winged demons sniggered. You shall die now, weak human. None of your attacks are strong enough to take us down. Death seemed like a guarantee for Neatwit at this moment, when in a desperate effort he said, Oh yeah. How about you try my strongest attack then? The winged demons backed off just a little, as they braced themselves for a catastrophic attack. However, what attacked them instead shocked them to their core, as they did not understand whether to laugh or to cry at that joke. Quack. 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 Eldritch ducks of all shapes, and sizes started to peck with their pointless beaks on the winged demon's heads. Mwahahaha! Behold my mighty ducks! Neatwit said, as he stood on the head of the tall, and huge mama duck, and looked down on the demons, who were confused. The confusion soon turned into rage however as they felt like the opponent was thoroughly mocking them, as the winged demons grabbed the ducks by the throat, and snapped their necks. You think this is a joke? One winged demon flew into a fit of rage, as he attacked Neatwit with his strongest blast. However, Neatwit only smugged and tried his best to defend. He knew a calamity had been triggered. Forward slash forward slash forward slash guys. We only managed to get to 740 tickets. Hence no bonus chapter today either. I do not understand why we are unable to match the targets as required. But I will try to entice you all more to get it I guess. For the next 24 hours only. For all gifts received on 10th of July. One magic castle equals two bonus chapters. One spacecraft equals four bonus chapters. 1 gash upon equals 6 bonus chapters. The bonuses will be delivered by July 13th. Whatever the number of chapters be. Golden ticket bonuses will be given extra as per 1 for every 200 GT reached. I'm ready to work to the bone guys. Now it's up to you all. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 717 Ducks and Johnny. Although the winged demons did not understand the gravity of the situation. Neatwick perfectly understood it well. Within a few seconds either the earth was going to open up or the sky was going to rip apart. Either way a calamity was about to eat the winged demons alive and he wanted to put maximum distance between himself and the demons before that happened. You can't escape. A winged demon chased Neatwit. Thinking he was trying to run away but just at that moment. Three ducks came flying in and rested they bums on the demon's face who in frustration had to kill them. It seemed like he was going to catch up to Neatwit however out of seemingly nowhere. A absolutely devastating bolt of lightning fried him from the sky. Kaboom. A peak tier 4 lightning bolt hit the demon out of nowhere as he was rattled and sizzling. Taking incredible amounts of damage. He looked up in shock to see there were no thunder clouds in the sky. Perplexed. He turned to only see his fellow demons facing calamities of their own. One was currently sucked up in a tornado vortex, while another seemed to be hips deep in lava. Everything seemed extremely bizarre at the moment however before he could recover from the stun damage caused to him, by the lightning bolt. He felt an icy blade on his neck as his head rolled to the floor. Sayonara bitch, was the last words he heard as B died at Neatwit's feet. Shocked to see him gulp down a max HP potion and recover his health. Feeling like he had a shot at this again. Neatwit rushed back towards the fight with his army of ducks quacking by his side and Mama Duck following from behind as he started troubling the calamity caught demons once more. Neatwit analyzed that the one who was hips deep in lava was somehow unable to break free 
and was sinking in as if it was quicksand, and he knew that the guy was an easy target, rushing towards him while weaving through the attacks of the other demons. Neatwick used the tier 4 move in his arsenal to Black Flash, as he became a stream of sword chi, and sliced the trapped demon in half. The other winged demons looked in shock and horror, as they realized that two of their friends had been slaughtered by this weak-looking human. As they saw him taunt them with a mocking tone as he said, Quack! Quack! Quack bitches! Neatwit was on a roll, as the calamities this time were beyond his expectations. While three demons managed to scrap by with minimal damage, two triggered really bad calamities, and Neatwit was able to capitalize on it to level the playing field. Although he was incredibly lucky this time around, the demons who did not understand the true origin of his power felt that the man was a true mystery and became wary of him. They did not know that killing ducks could trigger calamities, and hence believed that it was Neatwit who pulled off those five moves at once. Such proficiency was near the peak of tier 4, and hence they understood that they had been underestimating the opponent. He was much better than they had expected. With the odds down to only three demons now, Neatwit was more than able to hold his ground as his ducks provided constant distraction. Whenever a duck was killed, Neatwit would immediately pull back and run as if something bad was about to happen and a calamity was triggered shortly after. Sadly none of the calamities killed any demons or provided an opening anymore and it did not take long for the demons to realize that the ducks were the ones who were making all the ruckus. Even though they felt extremely annoyed to let them sit and peck on their heads, they understood that the delicate ducks could not be harmed. Hence, a bunch of prideful winged demons were forced to put up with a bunch of ducks as they fought Neatwit in a three-on-one battle. It was one of the most humiliating moments as a warrior for the demons as the ducks would poop on their heads and wave their bellies in front of their eyes blocking the view making it extremely difficult for them to fight as their mind was occupied in the annoying feeling. However, there was nothing they could do about it but tolerate the suffering in silence. Meanwhile, in other part of the city, the two demons that Karna had let go were wreaking havoc in the city, and while the other elites did their best to contain them, they still caused significant damage every single minute, destroying major buildings and entire sections of the city. It seemed like there was nothing they could do about the demons with them flying high in the sky and out of reach of archers and pulse cannons when a thunderous dinosaur roar took everyone's attention. Storming out of the teleportation gate on his dinosaur, Johnny bursted onto the city in grand fashion as he looked at the winged demons with disgust. The elites collectively let out loud cheers upon seeing Johnny English, and the demons understood that he was someone special. Surveying the damage across the city, Johnny sighed as he said, Don't worry kids, Papa Johnny is here now. Newly ascended to tier 4 with the SSS rating. Johnny could not wait to try out his newest skill that he had acquired forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Thomas Sanders and Savanthi for the 5,000 coin magic castles. We have also hit the GT target and hit 800 tickets. That brings the total to 5 bonus chapters, which will be covered in the next 48 hours for sure. Enjoy! forward slash forward slash forward slash chapter 718 shock demons. He was thief class by profession and hence his class specific skill came out to be incredibly interesting upon reaching tier 4. Johnny chose the skill Sealing the Fate to be learnt as his class-specific skill. It was an absolutely ridiculous skill that only worked on the male gender however its effects were brutal. It was literally a technique meant to seal the fate of the future generation of the man by brutally crushing their balls and stealing the walnuts inside. One of the most sinister skills of the thief class. It was an unethical move that was painful for any man to watch. It was Johnny's first time using this skill and not even he was sure about the skill's potency as he leaped towards the winged demons from the top of the dinosaur head. The winged demons snorted to see Johnny coming at them so blatantly arrogantly, as they could not believe their eyes, that a puny human, who could not even maneuver in the air would dare, to take them on head-on in such a fashion. However their shock turned to horror, when their attacks passed through Johnny's body, as if he was formless, and onto the ground below. Johnny gave the winged demon, he was flying towards a nice, little wink, as he performed the move sealing the fate on him. Crunch! Johnny felt a soft sack in his palms as he brutally crushed it and used a perfect motion of his worst to get the two nuts inside out from the outlet into his other palm for harvesting. He did not understand the true brutality of the move he had used until the two nuts were in his hands and he felt a searing pain down his own man parts to see the devastation on the demon. He hung on from the demon's empty man part as a shrill roar of pain caused a tremor to run down the spines of all demons inside the city. H-E-R-H-H-H-H my balls! The winged demon cursed in mad pain as his eyes turned red, and it started to fly in a haphazard manner. The pain it was feeling at this second was absolutely unbelievable, as what Johnny just did to him was worse than the worst tortures he had ever heard about. Not only was the future of his family lineage ruined, 
He was also going to become a eunuch who shot blanks for the rest of his life because of Johnny. The fate of himself, his future generations, and his family lineage had all been sealed shut by this one move by Johnny English. To make matters worse, Johnny saw a ultra critical hit. 240. 000, 000 marker that dropped the demon's HP by February 5th. His total HP. When the other demon saw the fate of his fellow teammate, he did not even think of avenging him, as looking at his destroyed man part, he felt a serious chill run down his spine. To hit someone in their privates was a violation of basic conduct of all male species. However, the demon assumed that the despicable human in front of him did not care about that conduct at all. As a man, he could sympathize with his fellow teammate. However, it wasn't until his fellow teammate let out cried of insane help that the other demon shook off his reservation and finally attacked Johnny. However, it was just a matter of them being unable to attack Johnny, as his formlessness made him invincible. Unless one knew how to break the Ghost King's technique, they could not harm a hair on Johnny's body. The second demon hence faced the same horrifying fate of the first demon upon coming too close to Johnny. As Johnny used the move sealing the fate once more to seal the fate of the second demon too, with one palm holding onto the first demon, and the second one holding on to the second one. Johnny harvested four nuts that day and made two demons cry like little girls in the skies of Purple Haze City as they both flew haphazardly. A typical armor covered the head and neck, then the chest and torso area followed by the shoulders, the abdomen, the thighs, the shins, and the boots. However, for movement purposes, the inner region was not really covered by most warriors. Of course, there were protection available. However, it was still useless against Johnny's class specific move as it ignored presence of all armor. So in a sense, the move was unstoppable. While the elites could not figure out what was going on up there from the distance below. But they could hear the genuine pain-filled screams of the demons and believe that Johnny was doing his magic. After about two minutes, Johnny commenced a second round of double sealing of fate using both his hands as he brought another wave of pain to the already in pain demons as this time around he clutched the pipe. The details of the attack were too gory to put to description. However, in the end Johnny brought two demons to their knees on the surface as they begged him to free them of their pitiful lives. Johnny being the merciful lord that he was plunged three daggers in their abdomen, heart and throat to finally give the two troubled winged demons freedom from eternal pain. To add insult to injury, Johnny closed their eyelids upon death and placed their wallets right over their dead eyes as he silently prayed for them to have functioning organs in the afterlife. The elites cheered madly for Johnny as the old man looked towards the two that Karna was fighting with and decided to help the lad out. Karna had already killed off one of the demons and was completely dominant on the other two. And Johnny's addition just made the process 10x faster, with the two killing the remaining two demons off in a matter of 10 short minutes. From then the two went on to help Needwit as the trio managed to finally wipe all the demons out without Johnny having to crush their balls. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the GT target. Good job everyone forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 719 Rudra's Calmness Rudra displayed uncanny strength in front of a vastly superior opponent as he held his ground against all odds and was not pushed back at all. Maris felt that maybe it was because the duo was in error that his anti-gravity skills gave him the edge needed to compete with his superior power. Hence, he decided to take the fight to the ground. However, to his shock, Rudra proved to be even more agile on the surface as his battle prowess increased significantly. Maris could not understand how a human still at tier 4 could compete on equal terms with him. As such a phenomena, was just bizarre in his opinion. After a while, Mars believed that maybe Ridra had put all his stat points in agility and strength which was the reason behind his ridiculous strength. Hence decided to use long-range attacks based on mana. He used the tier 4 move, Chaos Slash, to send a space-bending sword slash that was laced with the chaotic power of darkness towards Ridra. It was a peak tier 4 move and was supposed to cause significant damage to Ridra. However, Ridra was not afraid at all. Countering using the solar beam, Rudra met the attack with a peak tier 4 attack of his own to neutralize the incoming sword slash, creating a huge explosion. Boom! A citywide explosion that broke various windows occurred as the two tier 4 moves collided. However, both Rudra and Maras were unable to gain an upper hand from this exchange. Looking around, Rudra realized that fighting Maras inside the city would mean that he would need to fight extremely restricted to cause minimum damage, and that the best course of action was to lead the man out of the city. However, it was easier said than done as pushing Mara's back and out of the city was not something that Rudra could achieve alone at his strength. Although it appeared that he was evenly matched against Mara's, it was only because he was going all out while the opponent was still conserving his true strength. Rudra understood this better than anyone. However, looking around seeing the winged demons fall one after another, he had hope in his heart that reinforcements would arrive soon. Mara's was the biggest threat to the city. 
If the 15 demons combined could be rated as 10% threat, then Mara's was the remaining 90%. As a tier 5 existence, wiping out entire cities was not a difficult job for him if he used his big moves. And although the elites could use their numbers gained to suppress the winged demons, no matter how many elites banded together suppressing Mara's was impossible. He was a problem that could only be dealt by Rudra alone, while the only people qualified enough to support him were the tier 4 elders. As if on a cue, Right as Rudra had this thought Medivh blasted a beam of light from the mage tower, as he seemed to be freed from the winged demons, he was fighting, and was now ready to support the guild master. Under Medivh's support, Rudra decided to increase the intensity of his attacks, as he coupled cloud feet alongside gravity manipulation to make himself weightless, and super agile to land a series of high-speed moves on his opponent. Maras fought with a large great sword which was bulky, and not very good for defending against nimble moves. Exploiting this advantage Rudra paced around the enemy, like a crazed monkey at speeds that went beyond the perception of normal humans. To a watching elite, Rudra looked like a blurry figure that their eyes could not even catch. As all they were able to observe were the occasional sparks on the demon Mara's sword and the occasional cuts on his skin that spurted blood. Feints, blocks, dual cuts, speed maneuvers. Rudra used them all to deal superficial cuts on Mara's body and inflict as much damage as he could. But after three minutes of pushing himself to his maximum speed, he realized that he could only deal 5% damage to the opponent's net HP. The drain on his stamina was much larger than the damage margin he was able to achieve, as he understood that this plan was not sustainable long term. Although Medivh did occasionally try helping with one or two attacks from the mage tower, the moves were blocked by Mara's under no real threat. Medivh realized quickly that the bulky tower was useless in such a quick-paced nimble fight, as he made the decision to abandon it and support the guild master on foot. Only standing shoulder to shoulder with Ridra could he find a suitable opening to land small attacks on Mara's. While he was busy fighting Ridra, hence abandoning his post in the tower, he went down to support Ridra at ground zero. Only to find that Sir Johnny was already present at the location alongside Neatwit and Vice Guildmaster Karna. The four looked at each other and gave each other an acknowledgement nod as Karna said, Guildmaster we are here. The four tier four elites had assembled to support Ridra. However none of them dared to interfere in his fight without his permission and apparently it was a wise decision for them to not engage. Rudra glanced at them and told Signal them to stay on hold for now. However, while the other three understood the instruction, Sir Johnny felt that Rudra was being too careful where there was no need to do so. Deciding to take matters into his own hand, Johnny decided to sneak on the enemy and crush his balls. However, never could he have expected as to what was about to happen. Forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Savanthi for the 5000 coin magic castle. I'm extremely grateful for the patronage. This brings me to give out a total of 6 bonus chapters for 3 castles. This is January 6th enjoy. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 720 Contemplation. The only person to ever catch Johnny in his ghost form was the tier 5 General Mazakine of Lucifer's army. She was ranked the 9th strongest commander. Way lower than Mara's however she could still deal with Johnny's petty tricks. Johnny felt like Ridra was being overly cautious with his attack approach on Mara's and decided to take matters into his own hands. Becoming formless, he rushed towards Mara's with a happy smile, as he eyed the two hanging fruits of his manhood as his prey. However, when he finally sneaked up on Mara's, who was busy fighting Ridra, he was caught by the neck in his void form, and tossed aside, as a rag doll as Mara's said, Don't mess with me, aunt. Tricks of such level don't work on me. The other elites were shocked to see this sight, while Ridra just furrowed his brows in annoyance, as he formed a conjecture in his mind. The reason why Mara's could easily deal with Johnny's ghost form was because all Tier 5 Existence 1 had control over the lesser laws of the universe. The promotion test from Tier 4 to Tier 5 was not as simple, as it seemed as one no longer had to give a physical test of speed and skills to ascend from the Tier 4 to Tier 5 level, but actually a test of comprehension. Rudra had suspected this long ago, as if Tier 5 promotion test was a physical test then Emperor Cervantes would not have been able to become a Tier 5 Existence while imprisoned by his son Prince Amon. If the tier 5 test was at a physical place, then Cervantes leaving the room was impossible. Which meant that it must have been a mental one. Rudra's guess was spot on as upon reaching tier 5 which was labeled as the demigod level 1 understood a lot of the laws of the universe and could manipulate the very basics of elements to enhance their attack strength. Upon reaching tier 5, one could see the trick behind the ghost king's formlessness and could easily evade such basic tricks. Johnny's tricks were hence useless against tier 5 and higher existences as his cheat was nullified at that level. Although this was a huge setback for Johnny. For Rudra, this was an eye-opener, as he gained a basic understanding of what he was lacking to be promoted to Tier 5. 
which was an understanding of how the universe worked. Thinking about it this way Ridra finally realized that none of his tier 4 attacks or lower needed to borrow mana from the surroundings into his body. However, when he activated the Holy Lance move the first thing that happened was a bright divine light falling on him as he became swimming within powerful mana currents that were used to produce the attack. Rudra had not yet understood on how to manipulate the mana in the air. As while he could suck it into himself at a slow pace while cultivating, he could not actually imbue the mana from his surroundings into his attacks. Thinking back to all the times he had seen a tier 5 attack in question, Rudra realized that every single time, there was a drawing in of mana from the air involved. Whether it was Mazakin or Emperor Cervantes, the prerequisite to any tier 5 move seemed to start with that one step. Feeling enlightened mid-battle, Rudra understood that this fight was his best chance to understand some of the deeper concepts to becoming tier 5, and that he must do his best to force Maras to his absolute limits to understand them. However, the first priority was still to bring the demon out of the city into an open field of battle to minimize the damage to the city. Mara's POV Mara's was both shocked and angry at how the fight was developing. The information his lord had about the enemy's strength seemed to be severely lacking, as not only were all 15 of his lackeys dead, but Shakuni was also not the sole capable defender of the city. Although he was not afraid of a bunch of weaklings ganging up on him, he was sure that the mission to destroy the city and kill the king was not going to be as easy as he initially expected it to be. The strength of King Shakuni was not to be taken lightly either, as the man showed strength equal to a third division commander while being at only tier 4. Maras finally understood why Lucifer stressed on the elimination of this one man, as his potential was too formidable to be allowed to let grow. Should that man actually be tier 5 Maras had no doubt in his mind that he would be forced to retreat in this fight, and should the two be equally leveled then, he would be the one at a severe disadvantage. The key to winning the battle now was to kill Shakuni as fast as possible with all means necessary and kill the four guardians of the city supporting him as well. Only and only then could he eliminate the town without any resistance using his massive tornadoes. Assured of his plan, Maras finally started to go all out against Rudra as he prepared to unleash one of his stronger wind manipulation spells that had the power of an early tier 5 spell. The winds around Purple Haze City hence turned turbulent, with winds rich in mana flowing from all four corners of the place violently towards Maras inside the inner city. As expected, Rudra retaliated quickly to stop him from completing his preparation for the move. However, the king of elites seemed to have forgotten that he was not a kid born yesterday fighting his first fight. If he activated the move mid-fight, then naturally he had the confidence to complete it regardless. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter 2 out of 6 for the super gift bonuses. Enjoy! Forward slash forward slash forward slash Chapter 721 The True Might of a Tier 5 Rudra was observant about how Maras was sucking in mana inside his body, and hence in a way preparing for a tier 5 attack. He had no doubt in his mind that he needed to attack Maras at this second to prevent him from unleashing that move. He knew that Maras was not a dumb opponent who would activate the tier 5 move if there was a chance of it failing midway. And hence, he was sure that there was some scheme that the demon had planned for him. However, he was not sure as to what. Even though he had no idea as to what Maras was planning, he had no option but to charge knowing full well that he might be walking into a trap. This was because if he did not do something fast then Maras would get enough time to launch his tier 5 attack and that would be a disastrous situation. To throw his opponent off. Midway through his sprint, he used Blink to instantly teleport behind him and take him by surprise. Rudra thought that by seeing him run towards his direction, Maras would make a rough estimate as to how long Rudra would take to arrive and prepare accordingly. Hence, by suddenly teleporting he could catch him off guard. However, this was just wishful thinking on Rudra's part as while he did catch Mara's off guard, as he used his grim reaper to slash his neck. The sword passed through Mara's body, as if it was air without making any contact. What? Rudra exclaimed, as he felt a strong pressure of mana above his head. The body that Rudra attacked faded into the wind revealing that it was a fake. It was Mara's secret technique of wind substitution, as his real body was 500 feet in the air. Mara shouted, Peak move, wind palm suppression. As Rudra looked up, he was horrified by the scene to see a wind palm as big as the entire inner city pressing down with incredible force. Although the palm was descending slowly, Rudra could feel the air pressure around him changing as the palm was not only descending with strength, but was also compressing the air between itself and the ground. At this rate, it was only a matter of seconds before the air combusted into flames. If such a scenario happened and Rudra was unable to stop the palm from descending, then the inner city, including the palace, the two churches, the elite's headquarters could be considered as good as gone alongside hundreds of thousands of elite and NPC lives. The house that Rudra had built through careful crafting. 
the impregnable inner city inside whom no previous enemy was able to raise their heads high, was now under a threat of extermination. What was Shikuni going to do? Meanwhile Max, Max felt lonely sitting at the dinner table alone while watching the news. It was the eve of his birthday, the day after which when he could finally enter Omega and become a player. It was the single day that he had dreamt of time and time again, as he aspired to join the true elites and become a professional player just like his elder brother. However everything changed since the universal expansion was announced. Omega was no longer Max's goal as it was only a tutorial. He still respected and loved his brother, but every day that he woke up, he realized that his brother had years upon years of head start to him in the game, and that no matter how fast he ran now, he was never going to catch up to him within the time frame that he had to the first awakening. He understood that there was a crisis ongoing inside Purple Haze City, which was keeping his brother occupied, while his sister-in-law was already in bed to take care of her health. But he could not help but feel a little sad at this situation and think about his dead parents. Usually they would be sitting with him here, talking about how just yesterday he was a baby. As Mama Rajput did dishes and Papa Rajput freaked out about the new threat to Rudra's empire. At the time, he did not cherish these moments enough as he could not wait to be at the other end of the TV and be the one inside about whom Papa Rajput was freaking out about. But now, as he realized that he was never going to see his father break a sweat about anything, he finally understood that the goal he was actually chasing for was the love and admiration of his friends and family. And not the glory of killing demons itself. What he wanted was the little things. Things like the praise of his brother the worry of his mother, and the love of his father. However, none of that seemed possible anymore, and it left a huge void in the heart of little Max. He had already grown cold to his friends, as training became his only objective, and childish things were no longer his concern. While he was slowly turning cold to his family as well, smashing a plate onto the wall, Max stood up from the dinner table as a tear escaped his eye. It was going to be his birthday soon, and as things looked to be his brother was not going to make it once more. The worst thing, was that he understood that his brother could not make it due to genuine reasons, and hence, he had nowhere to vent his anger on. Hence in his anger he did what any teenage boy would do, which was to start flirting with the girl he was ignoring for months now. To try fill the void left in his heart by his dead family. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus, chapter 3 out of 6. Enjoy. We have also hit the GT target at 1000. So it seems like I have to add one more to the tally forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 722 Breaking Past Limits A common elite looked towards the sky to see the giant palm descending and felt like he was in a dream. Removing his helmet from his head, he rubbed his eyes twice to make sure he was not hallucinating as the giant palm seemed to get larger and larger every passing second. When he finally realized that it was not a hallucination, he felt the strength sapped out of his legs as he pointed towards the sky and screamed in terror. If one was able to pee inside Omega, he would have wet his pants at this moment as he completely lost his mind seeing the giant palm descend. In his mind it was already the apocalypse, as there was no being saved from this mess. Elites all around him were trying to rush off to safety, as fast as they could as everyone seemed to be scrambling for their lives. The once proud elites, scrambling, afraid of taking a single palm from a demon? Looking around the man thought is this the reality of the guild? Are we just frogs in a well thinking that we are strong when the actual powerhouses can wipe entire cities in a single palm strike? Is this it? As he struggled to his feet, he felt like his ears were bleeding from the change in air pressure, as he felt like he heard a constant ringing sound in his ears. Looking up towards the palm he said in a solemn voice, The sky has fallen! Rudra's POV. Rudra looked at the majestic wind palm descending from the sky and questioned himself see can I stop this? His mind already drew up the consequences of him retreating here, as he understood that retreating here would mean losing everything he held dear, and everything that stood as the pride of Purple Haze City. Just the thought of anyone destroying the guild headquarters sent shivers down his spine, as he became resolute that even if it kills him, he would not let anyone destroy the guild HQ. Guildmaster? Guildmaster run! Oh my god! We are gonna die! Dot. Rudra time to go! Rudra heard many shouts in the distance. However he did not pay them any heed as he closed his eyes and took in a deep breath. He knew his skills better than anyone, and if there was any skill in his arsenal that could take stand to the palm attack of that size. It was only one. Ridra opened his eyes and activated the Knight of the Empire. Golden warrior body covering him as he grew to a height of 250 feet tall. Even with that height, compared to the palm descending onto the city, he was still tiny. However, he knew that this avatar coupled with his gravity manipulation was the only chance he had to save his precious city. Although he could make the avatar a bit bigger, he chose not to as he knew better than anyone that the larger the avatar was the more energy it consumed to Minton 
and he knew for sure that stopping the palm was not going to be an instant thing and would need a lot of stamina from his end. Propelling himself into the air Rudra towered well above the city as he used gravity manipulation to minton his footing this high into the sky. The higher he jumped the more the force of the palm became. As the move had a lot of air compressed underneath it which exerted pressure on Rudra even before the actual palm hit him. About 30 meters and a second before the palm would hit him. Rudra stopped ascending and planted his feet as he readied his shoulders to take the weight of the attack head on. That one second felt like an hour for Rudra as he kept anticipating the immense weight on his shoulder to arrive any second now. However it took its sweet time in arriving. When the contact was finally made, Rudra's avatar was instantly stripped of its armor as Rudra himself was almost knocked unconscious due to the pain. A G H H H H. A scream escaped Rudra's mouth as he could feel countless wind blades tearing the skin on his shoulder as he also felt the weight of a mountain on himself. He was trying to withstand it with all he had in himself. However his legs were shaking and his gravity manipulation felt like it was pushed to beyond its limits to produce the upforce necessary to support Rudra's shaky legs. One second. Two second. Three seconds. Rudra understood that he barely had any strength left in his body at this point, and that it was impossible for him to stop this move at his current strength. Rudra thought about giving up and let his knees buckle. However he knew that buckling here would mean waving goodbye to everything he had built over the years. What was he to do? Meanwhile Karna and the others. Karna looked at Rudra holding the move up in the sky alone, and once more realized how useless he was when it came to the actual big Akashans. Was there anyone in the guild who could remotely do what Rudra was currently attempting? As although Rudra's success and failure to stop this move was a matter that was yet to be seen. But it was irrefutable that he was the only one who could even come close to giving it a shot. Although everyone here was a top-tier player who started playing Omega on day one. The strength gap between themselves and Rudra was as big as heaven and earth while they all enjoyed the privilege of being in the same guild and going through the same experiences. Clutching his knuckles he swore that this was the last time he was going to let himself feel this feeling. As from now on it was time for him to start showing his worth as the second in command. How long was the guild to depend on one man? For how long was he to carry everyone on his back? Looking up Karna just prayed that the back was strong enough to weather through today's storm. As he promised to be there beside him from the next one. Forward slash forward slash forward slash number four out of six. Let's go! Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 723 Breaking Through. He was brute forcing his way against the weight and not actually lifting it. He was as good as a dead log on whom the whole weight was balanced on as every single muscle in his body from the tips of his toes to the neck muscles under his jaw were tensed to the extreme to stop the palm from descending onto the city. Rudra used to joke around with this exact metaphor as one of his favorite sayings was with me standing here the sky would not fall. When he tried to reassure the elites that he could handle any threat present. However, today ironically he was literally trying to stop the sky from falling onto his city and it was taking every ounce of his willpower to not budge from underneath. He was in excruciating pain. As while the palm looked simply on the surface, it was actually a series of very sharp wind blades at the tip which constantly decimated Rudra's flesh as everything from his shoulders to his palms to his upper scalp was bleeding profusely. His mind was working at full capacity with him trying to minton the gravity manipulation as well as the avatar to withstand this pressure. Yet the pain and the air pressure was making his head go numb as bit by bit he was slipping altitude. Rudra questioned himself come on. Since when have you not had the will to see something through? Be a man. Power through. He tried to motivate himself with a pep talk. But no matter how much will he mustered he knew that stopping this move was going to be a Herculean task. Rudra understood well that millions of people were depending on him to stop this. As if he failed then, the elites would stop having the place that they would call a home. The church that he had started to run so honestly would no longer be a place to worship God Hades, as it would become a pile of rubble. The lavish palace that he had worked so hard to achieve would become a worthless relic. Rudra kneeled to one knee at this moment. As he barely had 100 meters left between himself and the ground. At this moment, he could hear Dronacharya laughing in his ears, as he said is this it? Strongest kill master? At last I make you kneel. Something inside Rudra snapped at that moment as he felt like he had came too far to kneel before anyone. He had worked too hard in this life to see it all gone. He had to find a way. Letting out a mad war cry. Rudra tapped into a power reserve even he never knew he had. He pushed his body to the limit as he maxed out everything. From the avatar size to the power of his gravity manipulation to the power in his muscles. He resisted the crashing so violently that he risked tearing his own muscles with the power he was exerting. Screaming continuously, Rudra did the unthinkable as millions of citizens citywide looked at him as their god. As Rudra planted his buckled right foot back on the gravity surface and stood back up against the attack. 
Mars watched on wide-eyed as he panted heavily from using a move of that caliber. He believed Rudra and the city to be a goner for sure. Never did he expect such a turn of events. Bleeding profusely from head to toenail, Rudra still stood strong as he felt the tier 5 move starting to lose steam with his feet gaining more and more strength. Trembling violently Rudra waited for his chance as once he felt confident he took out the Grim Reaper from his waist and slashed the attack apart. Ark, come on! Rudra screamed like a madman as he eyed Mara's as a beast who had just broken from his bounds. Shivers ran down Mara's spine as he looked at the enemy drenched in blood. As he involuntarily put more distance between himself and Rudra in the sky. Cheers went up citywide as the elites could not believe their eyes at how the Guildmaster had saved them all once again. As the sound of sobbing tears, weeping and chants of Shakuni could be heard citywide. Even the elite elders felt their blood pumping to see Rudra roar like a god of war. As they cheered him on in his coming battle, every single orifice of Rudra's body was aching. He was trembling violently from overexerting his muscles. However, his will was tempered and fired up more than ever. Rudra felt a rush of adrenaline hit his head as his body ached for a fight. He dropped all pretenses and calculations at this moment as he just shot up towards Mara's for a fight. Not caring about what was to come next. The man had tried to destroy his city and was going to do the same if he died in this fight. Rudra could not let him live any longer or give him a chance to mobilize one of those moves again. Activating the special skill move time dilation. Rudra dilated the speed of time significantly and as he started the most beautiful dance of death ever witnessed in a sword fight. Grim Reaper in one hand and Siege Breaker in another. Rudra gave up to his instincts as he stopped using his brain to fight as he let the pure sword moves flow from within. At ten times the dilated time, he could actually see the flow of wind around Mara's as well as weave through his pathetic attempts at a counter easily. As far as Rudra was concerned, he knew that the next three minutes during the time dilation were his best chance to end this fight for once and for all. Forward slash forward slash forward slash number five out of six. Enjoy. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 7 24 Demon Slayer Every single sword cut that he left on Mara's body, as even a slight one, left a deep gash on his body as the force behind every cut was enhanced ten times. Rudra, who was already on par in terms of stats with Mara's was basically untouchable at ten times the speed, as the great sword that Mara's wielded was nowhere fast enough to pose any real threat to Rudra. The dance of death was completely in sync with the time dilation too as Rudra began to dual wield his swords and flow like he was made of pure liquid. His every move was fluid and his every cut was deadly. But the true beauty of his dance was that every single move linked up with every next move to make it all look seamless and effortless. A blazing red aura covered the Siege Breaker, while a grim black aura of death covered Grim Reaper that dealt additional damage to Mara's. If Rudra cut Mara's wrist slightly then the dance of death made it so that the next attack would hit the sword and leave a den on it before moving on to the back heel slash that would couple up with a knee slash. Everything happened so fast that Mara's could barely register pain from one of his body part before a second one started to ache too. However this was Rudra just warming up. As he hit one minute of his skill period, he had already drained 40% of Mara's net HP, but his swordsmanship had nowhere reached its peak as it kept getting faster and faster every second. If Rudra was initially targeting the peripherals, then he was going towards the center now. The shoulders were slit. The hips and the back of the neck. Mara's sword was half cut through as it had a huge chip near a singular point, that Mara's was not yet even aware about. The man was mumbling cursed at this point. But Rudra could only hear syllables of his speech about whom he could not care less, as he was laser focused on his dance. In the next 30 seconds Rudra chipped off 40% more from Mara's net HP, as the demon's HP became glistening red in color. Mara's panicked and tried to activate some of his wind skills to stop Rudra. However he was too slow to stop Rudra's movements anymore, as the man had truly entered god mode. Rudra was already a blurry figure in his eyes since long. But he could not longer even follow his shadow once he started to enter the peak of the dance as Rudra finally slashed through his legendary rated sword clean through the middle with one strike, while slicing his arms off with another. It was Mara's turn to bleed. However before the man could even let out a full scream Rudra had already chopped off his legs from the ankles. Mara's buckled over with his legs cut as Rudra could see the blood spurt out of his legs in slow motion. However, Mara's did not have the luxury to fall down to the surface and die of dignity and fall damage. As before he could even fall 20 feet his defenseless and limbless body was chopped into seven different pieces by Rudra's swordsmanship. It all happened in a time span of only three seconds. As one moment, he was a full demon trying to ward off Rudra, and in another, he was a bag of mincemeat falling through the sky. Just like that, Mara's the third commander in Lucifer's army had fallen prey to Rudra's swordsmanship, and he never even saw it coming. 
As Ribro looked down the falling pieces of meat he himself wondered the true limits of the upgraded moves he had received as the damage it could produce was way beyond his initial estimates. This was his first time using it in a proper fight. And he realized that the moves were not even used at their peak. There was much more gas left in the Dance of Death, whose speed was not nearly at maximum, while the time dilation still had over a minute left. Relishing the feeling of victory, Ridra took a moment to look over his city and drink the view in. Today he had underwent a hard-fought battle to protect its safety, shouting in the air while clutching his fists. Ridra said, Shikuni of the Elites is coming for you next Lucifer, as his disgust for the King of Demons was renewed once more. Since the start, he had a feeling that the world was too small for two schemers, like himself and Lucifer to coexist, and with today's conflict things had undoubtedly reached a boiling point. He had killed one of Lucifer's main commanders, while Lucifer had showed his hand by opening a portal to let demons through to destroy his city. The matters had escalated from both ends, and there was only one response to it. War. When the others saw the falling pieces of meat, they could not believe their eyes. As everyone understood the true might of a tier 5 existence. Once again, it was the turn of the elites to look up to their leader in awe and horror as they realized that the strength of Shikuni had already surpassed the tier 5 realm and was enough to brutally chop up a tier 5 demon. Some of the tier 3 elites could not understand whether to praise Rudra or cower in fear of him, as such power was unheard of within the entire Omega player base. Nobody had the confidence to face against a tier 5 existence much less slay them in a one versus one fight. In the whole wide world of Omega, there was only Shikuni who could do it. If there was ever a doubt regarding who was the strongest player in the world, it was no longer a debate after the show of power. Shikuni was number one. Forward slash forward slash forward slash number six out of six as promised. I know some of you feel that I have not delivered the bonuses on time. So I will give a detailed breakdown in the next chapter alongside a timestamp to prove my point. The next chapter is the normal one for the day forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 725 not worthy enough. When Lucifer felt the connection to Mara's fade out, he was shocked as he jumped up from his throne and activated his heavenly vision to inquire. As he saw a bloody Shikuni stand in the air alongside two shining swords in his arms, he could see the remains of his third commander fall from the sky. Shock. Disgust. Disbelief. Anger. Were apparent on Lucifer's face as he tried to pry into Rudra's level but was not able to. Angry Lucifer smashed his throne room to pieces as his rage seemed to make his mind go numb. He vividly remembered that not more than a few months back the level of Shikuni did not exceed the early tier 4, which meant that even with the fastest rate of improvement, he could not be more than mid-tier 4 at the moment. Even someone from the god race could not have a faster development than that. To think that he could beat a mid-tier 5 commander? It was unbelievable in Lucifer's eyes. Lucifer had only mobilized Mara's, and the winged demons out of his system obligation as he felt that without Cervantes guarding the city, it would be an easy job of not more than 30 minutes. If he knew that there were even the most remote chances of his forces being routed then, he would never would have sent them in the first place, and accept whatever penalty was levied on himself to break the contract. Losing a commander. That to a tier 5 one was a big loss for Lucifer, as he cried in anger and cursed Shikuni from the depths of his heart. Lucifer said, Someday human, I will make you suffer for this. Meanwhile Dronacharya. Dronacharya wanted to see Rudra suffer. He was ready with a bucket of popcorn to see his sworn enemy fail. When the winged demons were slain, he felt an odd feeling in his stomach like this plan was going to fail too in the end just like every other plan of his. However he watched on because Maras was still alive. Then Maras started to push the elites back and even toss Johnny aside like a fly which gave Dronacharya's uneasy mind some peace as he believed that the demon would finish the job. When Rudra's knees finally buckled, Dronacharya stood up from his seat and shouted. Ha ha that's it. Kneel bitch. As he finally had the lifelong dream of his to make Ridra kneel before him be fulfilled. Dronacharya let out all of his inner sadist feelings as he desperately wanted to see Ridra struggle and suffer more. However just as he bared his heart. He suffered a disappointment once more as after letting out a war cry. Ridra stood up once more. Dronacharya could not believe his eyes as he felt like this was some sort of a joke. Why was Ridra okay his feet again? What was going on? However everything went downhill from there on, as not only did Rudra dispel the move, but he also started a counter like nobody's business that ended with him chopping Mara's body into tiny pieces. Dronacharya felt like the world was spinning under his feet as he felt like everything was a big joke at this moment. He had given up everything to defeat Rudra. And in the end even at the cost of getting his account reset to level 0, he could still not take down the king of the elites. Why? Why? Why won't you die? Dronacharya lost his mind as he rattled the TV and tried to bit the screen with his pointy teeth, but it was to no avail. 
He had suffered yet another setback, and this time his mind had finally snapped completely as he fell into depravity. For years, he had hatched scheme after scheme after scheme to destroy Rudra, but no matter what he did he was never successful. Why? Why did I have to be reincarnated at the same time as that guy? The parallax inside Dronacharya spoke, as the mental torture forced him to hang himself from the ceiling. Unfortunately even this plan of his failed, as the fan broke and fell on his head knocking him unconscious. It seemed that even fate wanted him to suffer under the shadow of Rudra forever. Meanwhile the elites? Celebrations broke out throughout the city, as the elites prostrated themselves before their leader slash king slash god to save them once more. The admiration that the elites had for Rudra had breached past the deity level now, as for them Rudra was no longer god like but an invincible god of war himself. The man had never tasted defeat in his life, and with him around the elites were safe. As his chants resounded citywide, Rudra raised his palm for silence. He was currently while being carried on neat wit and Karna as shoulders, as the others danced around him. But seeing his hand everyone went into deathly silence in an instant. For thirty seconds Rudra said nothing as the blood from his forehead dripped drop by drop on Karna's head. After a while, without raising his head Rudra said in a hoarse voice, Why are you all celebrating like you can't believe your eyes guys? I've long told you. With me around the sky won't fall. The elites felt a chill run down their spine when they heard this as the sound of the cheer this time broke all records of noise. That's right. It's their fault for not believing fully in Rudra and panicking. He had long said that with him around the sky was not going to fall. Of course, the demon was no match for his insane strength. At the spur of the moment, Karna shouted a chant that resounded with all the elites out there. Karna said, What deal we think of Shakuni? The elites shouted back, God. Karna. What deal we think of God? Elites. Shakuni. Karna. Thank you. Elites. That's all right. We love Shakuni. We love Shakuni. We love Shakuni. We love Shakuni I. Reference, the Tottenham chant. It was a chat that reverberated with the crowd's core. They were extremely happy to do it. Forward slash forward slash forward slash here is a timestamp of all chapters released on last today's note all time are in Chinese standard time. 1. Shock Demons November 7th, 12.02 a.m. 2. Rudra's Calmness November 7th, 10.06 p.m. 3. Contemplation 11 sevenths, 10.56 p.m. 4. The True Might of Tear 5 December 7th, 6.51 p.m. 5. Breaking Past Limits December 7th, 7.42 p.m. 6. Breaking Through December 7th, 11.05 p.m. 7. Demon Slayer December 7th, 11.28 p.m. 8. Not Worthy Enough, 11.57 p.m. Note. I only promised 6 chapters bonus in a span of 48 hours, and I did indeed deliver. I did mention it was a 48-hour thing, and I did mention it's from the Chinese clock. Not cause I'm Chinese, but just cause how WN works. Hope this helps clarify stuff forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 726 A Guilty Max He had promised the little one that he would spend at least the first half of the day together however the unexpected demon invasion caused him to only return late in the afternoon. Due to the incident of Max entering his VR pod, Rudra no longer casually played the game at the house, but only at his secure office at the Elite Tower. This meant that he could no longer stroll down his house after a long gaming session and needed to drive for a bit to reach there. Naturally before he could drive out he needed to bathe and freshen up. But after quickly performing those necessities Rudra rushed back home to meet his brother. While driving he asked his AI assistant Alexa to read him his message log in the car. But he would could never have expected the content of the messages. Alexa read. At 1.05 AM. You have a message from beautiful wife Naomi Beep. Honey, I was fast asleep when I heard some moaning noises coming from downstairs. At first, I believed that it was Max watching porn or something. But then I heard voices that said, Oh Max, don't stop, and had to check out for myself. It seems like your little brother has brought home a girl. Rudra instantly slammed the brakes on his car as he shouted. What? Max had just turned 16, and although he could understand that his reproductive organs were functional now. But that did not mean that bang girls while being underage. Rudra felt a myriad of emotions but the top of them was Indy. At 16, he was covered in pimple marks and looked like a homeless hobo from a poor family. He needed to think twice to talk to a girl, let alone bang them. He thought carefully about how to tackle this situation. When Alexa read the second message, You have a message from beautiful wife Naomi at 4.06 a.m. Beep. Honey, they are still at it. I have not been able to sleep a wink. So I finally went down and caught them doing the deed on the couch. I wanted to scold Max. But the poor guy was already so flushed to see me and apologetic that I ended up not scolding him and just furiously grabbing the keys and driving off. 
On my way to brothers now. Won't wake up till the evening maybe. Side note, he has your stamina for sure. Seems like the good genes rot in the family. Rudra was speechless as his face turned dark. He seemed to have made up his mind on what to tell Max. Upon reaching home, Rudra gazed at the couch angrily, as if he wanted to burn it. However, he was more shocked to see that even after Naomi's intervention, the woman was still there sleeping on the couch while Max was nowhere to be seen. Max? Rudra shouted as his aura inevitably exploded a little due to his anger, which caused the sleeping girl to involuntarily shudder and wake up. As Max popped his head up from the floor, he was laying on. Brother? He said in a groggy voice as Rudra could instantly smell the alcohol in his breath. Rudra felt his anger burst through the surface at this point. But as he carefully studied the surroundings, he realized that there were no traces of any alcohol bottles lying around, but there was a faint smell of whiskey in the air. Seems like Max disposed of the bottles before passing out. Rudra calmed down a little. It seemed as if Max was still scared of his big brother. Otherwise, he would not have bothered covering up. However, what perplexed Rudra was what made the good kid rebel like this today. The two brothers made eye contact and Max was naturally sheepish. He felt immensely guilty about his behavior last night and was worried about Rudra's anger now. The girl, on the other hand, was absolutely delighted to see Rudra as she said, Mr. Shakuni, I mean, sir. I mean, Rudra. I mean, brother in law. I mean, Ugh. Rudra looked at her sternly and sized her up. He said, Sir. Sir. The girl said as she shuddered from Rudra's gaze. It seemed to be incredibly cold and powerful. Rudra said, dress up, as he turned around, giving the couple time to cover their bodies properly. He had a myriad of emotions floating in his heart. But he decided to bottle them all up at the moment to critically analyze the situation first. He could see the shame visible in Max's eyes. The kid seemed to already regret it. If he were to scold a kid here it would mean that he might push him down the wrong path. However if he made him realize his mistake here, then it would be a permanent remedy. Getting a grip over himself. Rudra let out a huge exhale. He could feel Mama and Papa Rajput smiling over him, as he understood that in their absence, he was the one who needed to ensure that Max grew up to be a proper man. The three shared breakfast in silence as Rudra sized the girl up. He tried to have an open mind, but he got 100% ho vibes from the woman, who displayed ample cleavage at breakfast and consistently complimented Rudra about his materialistic gains. Rudra was not an amateur, and he could understand that the accidental touches of the girl were an attempt to seduce him. However, what shocked him the most was that the girl's age, which was 22. Had she been a minor then, this would not be a crime, but her being a grown-up meant that this was a big problem in Rudra's eyes. Nonetheless, he was not going to pass any judgments if this was Max's choice. Dropping the girl off to her home in the upside. Rudra took Max out for a birthday drive as he planned to give him the talk that Papa Rajput had given him before his marriage to Naomi. He cared too much for Max to see him go astray. Chapter 727 Correcting Max Rudra let Max contemplate his fate for a long time until Max attempted to break the ice when he said, Sorry. Rudra threw a side glance to his brother. He was extremely sheepish and awkward. Seeing this Rudra felt better about his initial decision of not scolding Max too much as the kid had clearly done this out of impulse. He said, So, Glenfiddich eh? Max's eyes widened in shock when he heard this. He thought he had disposed off the whiskey bottle completely and even eaten three packs of mints after that. There was no way his brother should know about it right. His panic increased as he hung his head even lower in shame. He expected Rudra to absolutely eviscerate him now and take away his privileges. However, he never expected to hear what Rudra said next. Rudra said, What a coincidence, eh, Max? My first one was whiskey too. Of course, we were not rich enough to buy a Glenfiddich then. So I had to settle with a Jack Daniels, but boy did I love it. I was a weak drinker, had no one to teach me too. I did it in our bathroom. Drunk two pegs, then became too scared of the lingering smell, and emptied the rest of the bottle in the toilet. Haha, ha, your brother was a wuss. Max blinked several times as he looked at Rudra. He offered nothing as a reply. Rudra continued. I always wanted your first time to be with me. I had planned it for your 18th birthday. Actually, no. Not just me. Me and Dad both. When I turned 18 UK, Dad called me to his room and opened a bottle of Jameson whiskey as he poured me a peg and said, from today we are friends. In his hoarse voice, of course. Ha ha. But it was a beautiful memory for me. We talked about how we both would do the same on your 18th one. But here you are at 16. Drinking alcohol with girls. Max felt like he was choking on his own saliva as tears rolled down his cheeks. He knew that Rudra cared for him a lot. He knew that since he was a one-year-old baby who could not even discern emotions, his big brother was always there to protect him. Rudra said, 
Since dad and mom are no longer here, don't you think us brothers should watch each other's backs? I mean, who else is left to be called family of Max? Max nodded his head as his sobbing intensified. He knew Ridra was saying the truth. Ridra continued, I met your sister-in-law when I was 24. Married her at 26. Nearly nine months after I bedded her. I'm not saying having girlfriend at 16 is wrong. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not judging you for having sex either. But listen to me, Maxie. Say you get her pregnant at 16. Let's just assume that you do. What happens when you have a son at age 16? You will be at the prime of your life at 2027. Do you want to handle with a kid undergoing puberty during that time? Changing diapers. Worrying about education? Or do you want to be a negligent parent who doesn't care if his son lives or dies or does drugs? There is a time and a way of doing everything. Just like you cannot work in a construction site without a helmet. Just like you cannot drive a car without a seatbelt. You cannot have sex without a condom. I know you did it raw yesterday and it if you pulled out or not. But either way it's just dumb you know. Max felt horrified at the thought of having a son at 16 years of age. It would mean that at 20, he would need to be providing for a 4-year-old when it would be the real time for him to start grinding and making his place in the world. He was not Rudra. He did not have a stable income. Nor did he have a legacy to lean on. This was indeed immature of him. Rudra noticed Max's expressions carefully as he was satisfied with the shame on his face. Smiling, Rudra said, The girl is pretty. What's her name? In a meek voice, Max replied, D. Dana. Rudra nodded as he said, Dana seems older than you, Max. Are you into older women? Max hesitated for a second before coming clean. She, she was the only one ready to do the lewd stuff with me. Rudra understood Max's situation very well. The other woman was after Max's money. Technically his own money and had no interest in Max. However, Rudra did not want to show this cruel side of the world to Max this early. Rudra asked, So how popular are you, Max? Rudra asked this as a joke. He wanted to make fun of his little brother. But Max's reply shocked him a lot. Max said, I am the youngest and fastest pass out of the Elite's Academy. Have a following of 63 million on the forums. I'm hailed as the next big thing by the news channels and have signed a $25 million deal with Duty Pie to film my first day in Omega with him. I'm a self-made millionaire at 16. My combat teacher in martial arts is Sir Johnny English and my physique is rated 9 out of 10 by the men's fashion magazine. Added to the fact that my brother is the biggest thing in Omega. I'd say I'm very popular. Dot. Rivera accidentally slammed the brakes when he heard this. All this was a little too ridiculous for him. Since when was Max Sue up? Compared to himself at 16. There was no comparison at all. Self-made millionaire at 16? He had to use his reincarnation cheat to make his millions for mom's treatment. And here Max is being offered millions just to stream his day one? Where was the fairness in the world? How was he to scold such a successful kid? Since when was Johnny his teacher? How much more of Max's life did he not know about? Rudra swallowed a mouthful of saliva and understood that he was better off spending the day getting to know his brother better. He said, What do you want to eat? Max replied, Ice cream. Rudra bursted laughing as he drove towards the ice cream truck in the upside. That day the duo talked a lot about life and Omega and the future of mankind as Rudra was able to bond with Max like an adult for the first time in his life. It was a refreshing feeling for both men as Max was driven into a positive direction. However, one of Max's statements bothered Rudra a lot, which was when Max said, But I can never catch up to your legacy big brother. The empire you have built is so tall. I have not even started to play Omega yet, but I feel pressured from the world to live up to the Rajput name. It's too much pressure. Rudra worried about this statement, as it made him feel like Max was disappointed to be born a Rajput. In his heart Rudra wanted nothing more, but for Max to outshadow everything he had built. The empire that he had made was for the whole of Rajput family to enjoy. And in his mind it was naturally going to be Max's once he retired. But since it was a matter for the far future, Rudra let it slide for the moment. Chapter 728 Back in Game Secrets to Reaching Tier 5 Ruby was trying her best to offer relief packages to citizens however her hands were tied for the amount of help that could be provided. Since the royal treasury could not service the debt instantly, this situation was created because Rudra had pulled a lot of money out of the game recently to support the shelters in Japan and the project to build the unbelievable battleship in both real life and inside Omega. These ambitious projects had left Rudra's holdings within Omega in a precarious position as they only had about $300 billion in emergency reserves to deal with unexpected crisis. If Rudra wanted to, he could easily borrow the remainder of the money from Hazel Groove Empire however his pride did not allow him to ask for help as far as possible. In his mind, he thought about devising another exploration or a similar mission to the raid on the Dark Elven Kingdom to fill up the deficit. 
However, just as he was worrying about such matters, it turned out that Karna poured a heap of $500 billion worth of gold into the treasury. Naturally, Rudra was shocked as to where the money came from hence, even though he was overjoyed. He asked cautiously, What happened here? The elders, and especially Karna, gave Rudra a massive smile as Karna said, I, 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 you underestimate us too much, guild master. Not everything in the guild is your problem alone. We are a part of this organization too. Although we can't kill tier 5 demons, money problems are something we can manage to solve. Rudra was pleasantly surprised at this as the corners of his lips turned upwards. This feeling of having capable people around him filled his heart with joy and comfort as he realized that finally the nurturing he had done of the guild members had started to pay off. It turned out that Karna had spearheaded a raid to the hostile kingdom of Heathrow in the far north and razed one of their port cities to the ground. For tier 4 elders and 100. 000 tier 3 senior players took part in the ambush and looted the place completely. They especially struck gold when they seized a huge government ship shipping the year's taxes from the port city to the capital. The ship contained nearly $300 billion worth of gold inside. The best part of the raid was that it was completed within 12 short hours and was traceless. From start to finish Karna had planned it like Rudra himself as learning from the master himself he had became extremely cautious as well. The raid party disabled the teleportation center in the city which meant that by the time news traveled to the capital about the attack and a response team was sent the time needed for reinforcements to arrive was 16 hours. But with the elites coming in and out in 14 hours. They had long gone before the reinforcements even saw the heels of their feet and even after three days. Nobody on the continent had a clue as to which party orchestrated the attack. All signs seemed to be pointing towards a prominent bandit group in the northern parts. Whose attire and leader names Karna copied as a diversion. Rudra was more than impressed by the plan and the results as his respect for Karna increased a lot. Making him the vice guild master was one of the best decisions Rudra had made in his entire gaming career. With a funding problem sorted, Rudra could finally focus on the most important agenda on his plate right now, which was to reach tier 5 before the deadline. Only 28 days remained to the deadline he had set for himself to declare war upon the demons. And he needed to reach tier 5 before that point anyhow. However, being sure that tier 5 was a state achieved by comprehension and not by any other external tests. Rudra knew that he needed to enter a period of isolated cultivation if he wanted to reach that level. Wrapping up his duties as the Pope, the King and the Guild Master as well as his family time with both Ruby and Naomi. Rudra chose to make a special oxygen chamber at the bottom of the special seaweed pond inside the palace, where he would enter secluded cultivation. He had a strong gut feeling that the weed that he had brought back from the ancient ruins, which was so delicately maintained in his palace and the Guild Headquarters pond, was something more than just a regular weed with properties that could undoubtedly help with cultivation. Needing every small advantage that he could, Rudra started to sit in a state of deep cultivation inside the pond. After 24 hours of sitting still without moving a muscle, and countless cycles of rotating mana in his body alongside a specific mana path according to his cultivation manual, Rudra finally got the system notification that he was waiting for. System notification, detected that player Shikuni has entered a deep comprehensive state and has reached the threshold to become a tier 5 existence. Starting the comprehension test. Current progress 0 out of 6 laws mastered. It was finally time for Rudra to ascend to tier 5 and take his rightful place at the top of the food chain in the middle realm. To do that he needed to master at least 3 of the 6 basic laws of nature. The law of wind. The law of earth. The law of fire. The law of water. The law of space and the law of time. Forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Nathan Club for the 3 500 coin massage chairs. Thank you so much for the patronage. This is a bonus chapter for hitting the GT target. We are also incredibly close to hitting the next target of 1200. Hopefully, we can hit it soon for another bonus chapter. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 729 The Advantage of the Human Race The herb Ridro was cultivating near was a big reason why he could enter a state of comprehension this fast as usually it would take anywhere between 1-3 weeks for peak tier 4 individuals to enter the state. However, the real test started now. Rudra was supposed to figure out the mysteries of six laws of nature. To get a perfect rating on the promotion test, he needed to comprehend all six of the laws, while to pass, he needed to comprehend three. He was given an option by the system on which law he wanted to comprehend first and Rudra decided to go with the law of fire. A series of images started to play out in his head, as first, he was shown flames of various colors such as a blue color flame, a golden flame, a orange flame, a blood red flame, and a multiple colored flame. Then he was shown as to how a flame grew from a small spark to a force that could destroy planets. The visual was very detailed and it gave Ridra goosebumps. 
It showed him that if wielded correctly, fire had the potential to wipe out entire planets. Towards the end of the visual, Rudra felt his own body burning from an intense fire as he started to sweat profusely. He saw his own body being engulfed in a sea of flames as he felt drowning in a bottomless abyss of heat. Just before his body was burnt to the core however he heard a faint rhyme to create one must destroy. For only through destruction can there be cleansing of evil. Rudra opened his eyes and saw that his body was sizzling with heat. The visuals that the system showed him at the moment were more than just visuals as he seemed to have actually been imbued by the law of fire when he was plunged into that abyss. Rudra quickly tried to circulate the fire energy in his body as he tried to understand the true nature of the flames. As a human, he was taught about fire since childhood. Defined as the process of combustion he knew that after reaching a certain amount of heat some substances reacted with oxygen to combust into flames. Depending on the nature of the element the color of the flame was decided such as a bright white flame for magnesium, red for strontium, and so on. As Rudra thought about the origin of the fire according to the knowledge, he had he felt that the fire energy he was blasted with was quickly being dissolved in his body, as he seemed to grow closer and closer to understanding the mysteries of the element. Although humans were a primitive race compared to the wide universe, it had a distinct advantage compared to other races due to the absence of mana on the planet. Humans had spent countless years trying to figure out mysteries of the universe and tabulated the knowledge year over year, generation over generation for all humans to study. This was something that the other races did not do. Knowledge was a commodity in the universe, and it was reserved to individual families, and never shared as a greater good. The fundamental understanding that the humans hence had about atoms and particles, and the chemistry of elements was something that the other races did not have. Rudra was blessed to be a part of the generation that had completed the normal earthly schooling. As even Max only studied till class 10, before dropping out of school and enrolling into the elite's academy. The generation after Max was never going to learn the same education that the predecessors had gone through as the world was going to value mana and combat training more to regular knowledge from now on. This left the earth with only one prime generation that truly grasped the knowledge of the education system established after hundreds of years of mankind's research. However understanding the nature of flames was not enough as Rudra had to also understand the benefits of the flame. The flame purified everything by obliterating it. The ash after a forest fire was rich in nutrients and enriched the soil for the future generation to grow. The fire that burnt the dead bodies was useful in preventing diseases and decay. Fire was the universe's cleanser, and it did not discriminate between good or evil. The fire at its core was just and fair, and Rudra accepted the fire as a part of his being. Rudra absorbed all the knowledge that he could from the video clip shown, as he drew a lot of inferences from his existing pool of knowledge. Although it was incomplete, although it was broken, Rudra understood one of the most core concepts of the fire element, which allowed him to pass the test. Rudra understood that basically fire was not a state of combustion, but the vibration in each and every atom in every single molecule. Without the vibration everything would be frozen solid in the universe, and it was fire that spread the warmth in this long and cold universe. When Rudra finally stumbled upon this truth, he heard the system notification. Comprehended 51% of the fire element. This element has been understood fairly by the player. Current progress won sixth elements. He had successfully cleared round one. However, although Rudra tried to understand more and more of the fire element, he could never get past the 53% mark. Fire was one of the elements he understood the best, which showed his limitation in this test. It seemed as if the coming laws were not going to be as easy as he anticipated them to be. Forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Savanthi for the 5000 coin magic castle. Thank you so so much for the patronage. With this gift, we have hit the GT target as well which means that today will be a 3 chapter day. Enjoy! Forward slash forward slash forward slash Chapter 730 A Victory and a Failure When he started to comprehend water, he was shown a myriad of system images that did not resemble the water on earth at all. He was shown frozen planets, tidal planets and muddy swamps that were nothing like the solid earth with clear oceans. However a distinct feel of wet liquid touching his body soon embraced Rudra as he felt comfortable inside the swimming pool like water that he was in. He was then shown various life forms that thrived on water. The water that absorbed the holy energy and became healing water, as well as the water that absorbed minerals and became mineral water. The swimming pool that Rudra was in then started to bubble up as the water turned into steam and formed rain clouds over his head that pelted down as snow and hail and froze the pool in solid. In the end Rudra heard a small phrase that said be shapeless, be formless, be everything yet nothing. Rudra was then brought back to reality as he felt moisture on his skin and the intense fire element burning inside him calmed down as he felt a cool energy flowing through his mana circuit. 
being enlightened by the images Rudra started to think about the nature of water. The water that humans knew of was made of hydrogen and oxygen however that wasn't always the case in the wide universe. It seemed that there were a myriad of different elements that humans had no idea about that could make up different kinds of water. However regardless of the type of water, its base properties remained the same. Water was formless. It took the shape of any contained it was filled in as well as formless. Water was continuously changing from solid to liquid to gas, and while sometimes the rate of conversion was so slow that it appeared to be stable in one state, it was actually never the case. Water was also something that could be imbued with the nature of anything. It could be destructive, it could be poison, it could be holy, or it could be salty. It all depended on what sort of materials and process you subjected water to but basically water in and of itself was accepting of everything. However, water in and of itself was nothing. This paradox helped Rudra understand something deeper about the nature of man as he realized that in this wide world every man had been born with a purpose to serve. If they defied that purpose and revolted against the will of the heaven then, they were met with punishment. The only way to break the cycle was to become everything and nothing at the same time. As Rudra understood this, he got a system notification. Player has comprehended 51% of the secrets of the water element. Current progress February 6th. Rudra smiled to see the system notification. He felt lucky to be enlightened and having to break through as this time around the concept was more philosophical than logical and the understanding that one needed to figure out water was more about self-reflection than the chemistry of the element. Feeling confident, he started to contemplate the wind element. As usual a series of pictures were shown to him and shockingly there was also the recap of the fight he had with Maras not long ago as he saw the massive palm descending on his city filled with the laws of the wind. However after all the images displayed to Rudra which widened his horizons. He actually felt completely lost in trying to contemplate the origin of the wind. At first, he believed that the rotation of a planet created wind. However, he had seen planets in his vision that were not rotating, and yet had the most violent winds on their surface. Rudra tried to approach the problem from various angles, however, he could never stumble upon something useful that would give him useful insights into the element. Six hours passed by and Rudra was not able to move past the 3% understanding mark after which the system regarded this session as a failure. The system notification said, Player has been unable to derive any insights from the element in the past three hours. This test has failed. Current progress February 6th. Rudra was shocked. He had failed a test. This meant that getting a SSS rating was no longer possible in this test. For a moment Rudra felt melancholic. Ever since joining Omega, he had continuously gotten SSS rating in every tier promotion test that he had attempted and although the desired effect of getting a legendary class was achieved at tier 4, he did not want to lose his streak coming into tier 5. However, the reality of the situation was harsh, as he had indeed failed the test for wind. This was a test in which one needed to rely on their natural comprehensive abilities, and no cheats could help them. Even if Rudra was giving this test for a second time, his fundamental understanding of the concept was not something that could be changed. The only thing he could do now was to put his head down and try his luck at the other elements and hope that he could pass this test first try. Taking a deep breath, Rudra activated the test for the earth element. It was the element that Rudra had a little less confidence in understanding however that notion changed completely after he saw the video for it. The concept of earth that he had in his mind was like the battle moves of mud wall and earth spears and the like. However the images he was shown were of life forms as big as entire planets who use giant stars like the sun as a source of nourishment and energy. Looking at those massive balls of space, Rudra felt a chill go down his spine. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Savanthi. Please thank him in the comments section for this one. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 731 The Laws of Space Everything that one considered as a solid state of matter obeyed the laws of earth. Every single mineral was earth. Every single human was earth and every single plant was earth. Earth is where everything began and earth is where everything ended as well. To dust thou art and to dust thou returnest. Was the line that was whispered to him and he understood the truth behind that phrasing. In a way all life was created from the earth and into the earth did all life go upon death. The earth element was the giver of life. It was the progenitor of everything that one deemed as living. The earth equally loved all the living children that it had, and absolutely hated the abominations that were the undead. The reason why the ghosts were formless upon death was because they could not sublimate with the earth, and while their physical body was destroyed their souls could not find peace. Rudra also understood at this moment the reason behind earth magic being super effective on undead type monsters as it fundamentally challenged the constitution of the dead. The earth element was the strongest element of them all. It could destroy. It could defend and it could give life. It was the most balanced element in creation. Rudra stopped looking down on the earth element 
this moment forward, as he found a genuine respect for the attacks of the earth element. In his admiration, he felt like the comprehension of earth increase, as after three hours, he heard a system notification that said, Detected player has comprehended 51% of the earth element. Current progress March 6th. You have now passed the tier 5 test. Do you wish to continue? Yes. No. Rudra barely reached the 51% threshold for the law of earth, as he sighed in relief to know that he had at least passed the test now. From here on out everything was about getting better grades. Rudra pressed yes and continued with the test as he was shown the clip for the law of space. The clip about the law of space was completely different from the other laws as Rudra was thrown naked into the vast universe. As he came to terms with his own insignificance as he stared at the galaxy of stars surrounding him. The universe was massive and he was just a tiny man. Floating in the space, he felt his psyche attacked as he felt. Did anything really matter if he was just an insignificant ant in the bigger picture? Rudra was shown one of his favorite moves to use the blink as he noticed the spatial tear created by that move in that one split second for the first time ever. He saw a looping wormhole created from above his head to the destination he pleased and saw his own body teleport through that wormhole in a split second atom by atom. The process was so fast he basically existed at two places at once. However this was the first time for him to notice it. The fact that the human mind was capable of performing such a complex space manipulation was something that came as a shock to Rudra. Blink was one of the moves that was so easily done in Omega. Yet he could not recreate it in real life. The reason was the presence of mana. Mana was the reason why wormholes could be created as basically it was just a dense mana cutting through the fabric of gravity for a split second. Rudra was enlightened at this moment. The knowledge he had about the laws of gravity was helping him quickly bridge the gap in knowledge that he had as he started to understand the law of space. In the end of the video, he heard a cosmic whisper that made his soul shudder as the sound he heard was of immortal laughter. However, the laughter sounded to him like the Big Bang explosion. Rudra's whole body started to violently tremor after he heard that voice. Should he be in public view at the moment? Everyone would panic thinking he was having a seizure as the law of space entered his body, which Rudra started comprehending. He was able to make extremely fast progresses even though his body and soul were shuddering as using the gravity manipulation knowledge, he was able to figure out the element of space unlike any other. Rudra reached a whopping 70% efficiency in understanding the law of space, as he cleared the bar set for passing, and added another law to his list of understood elements. System Notification You have successfully understood the law of space by a fair margin. Current Progress April 6th Starting the Law of Time Trial next. Good luck. The last and final law was upon him to comprehend, as he was shown by the system the law of time. However the very first scene of the law of time threatened to send Rudra's mind to the verge of insanity. His worldview was shattered. It was his own body. In his previous life. The shraggy beard that did not connect. The ketchup stained clothes and the noticeable neck slump. It was the night where he was going to be killed by his friend by him being pushed down the stairs. However this was the first time that he saw that the two of them were not alone in the stairway. As Rudra saw him for the first time ever. Standing in the edge of the stairway laughing as he waited for Rudra to tumble to his death. A despicable creature of death forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Thomas Sanders for the 1000 coin luxury car. Thank you for the patronage. This is a bonus chapter for hitting the GT target. Good job everyone. Enjoy. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 732 A Trip Down Memory Lane. The creature had a hideous mouth that opened four ways and wheeled it aside. It drooled as it waited for Rudra to die. Probably waiting for his soul to escape so that he could devour it. However, when Rudra seemed to not die after bleeding profusely on the stairway, the soul devourer got impatient and tried to forcefully pull Rudra's soul out of his body. Rudra's vitality dropped significantly as his skin became pale and his heart stopped beating. It was only a matter of seconds now before he was clinically dead due to lack of pulse. But something incredible happened at this moment as his dying body was shrouded in immense suction force, which was supposedly the reincarnation system that helped souls reincarnate after they died. However, due to the soul devourer's interruption, Rudra's soul did not enter the suction field while the soul devourer himself was forced to run away after he felt an intimidating presence over his head. What Rudra saw next, he would never forget in his life as he visibly saw the law of time being reversed in front of his eyes as his soul was allowed to go back into his body and the earth started to spin backwards. Rudra saw countless years of his past life flash before his eyes before he saw himself waking up at that fateful day on January 1st of 2100 sweating on his bed as he reincarnated. Rudra did not understand what this meant. Or how was he supposed to understand this? But he felt a strong resonance between his soul and the law of time. 
it was familiar in his body, as if it was always a part of him. In the end, the only thing he heard was you have done well. The voice was ancient, just like the roar of the Big Bang that made Rudra's soul shudder. Rudra felt his mind numbing as the two timelines mixed and clashed in his brain causing a massive headache that felt like his head was about to explode. However, there were no secrets to be extracted from the law of time for Rudra. As within the splitting headache, he heard the system notification that he had reached the threshold for passing the law of time. His head hurt so much that he was not even able to see or hear the proficiency he had in the law of time as it hurt him so much that he felt like putting a gun to his head and emptying a barrel to stop the pain for once. However, after six hours of excruciating pain, the headache finally stopped as Ridra felt his entire body to be refined and in harmony from a massive increase in strength. He heard the system notification that he had successfully been promoted to Tier 5. However, he passed out before he could inquire further. He had reached the limit for mental exhaustion as he entered a deep cultivation state and entered a semi-coma. Meanwhile, at the Cuber Corp, the Cuber officials saw the scene of Ridra successfully reaching Tier 5 and the sentiments at the office were beyond high. When the project was launched, they never expected this day to come, as humans were deemed as a species that were not supposed to reach the threshold for Tier 5. They were assumed to be of a weak comprehension, unaware about the secrets of the universe, raised in a shell of a planet disconnected from true knowledge for hundreds of years. Yet Rudra managed to reach Tier 5, and that meant that the status of Earth as a whole was going to be elevated when they became integrated into the universe. Rudra was the third human in the history of Omega across thousands of years, to reach the tier 5 threshold within the tutorial. His potential and feats were legendary and seemingly unparalleled. The second highest level player in Omega was currently Angel at level 423 still a far cry away from the peak of tier 4 and a long long way from actually understanding the secrets of cultivation and attempting the promotion test. Even if he did, the passing in the tier 5 test depended on comprehension and comprehension alone. No matter how big of a talent one was when it came to skills execution, it mattered nothing in this test. Only the truly gifted could ever dream to pass it, and even amongst the truly gifted only a handful could actually do it. It was hard for even the most superior species in the universe, let alone a newbie race like humanity. Yet one of the humans from Earth achieved such a legendary stage. It filled all of the officials at Cuber Corp with immense pride and respect, wiping their tears of joy. The entire office clapped and celebrated this monumental achievement from the bottom of their hearts. However, their joy was soon turned into worry, as Rudra did not seem to be waking up from his slumber. One official asked Gaia, Why is Shakuni still cultivating after the test is over? To which Gaia replied, Player Shakuni has entered a state of deep cultivation and is in a near coma state. Estimated time of awakening, indefinite. The faces of everyone at the Cuber Corp turned ashen upon hearing this. If Rudra could not wake up from this ever, then what good was the tier promotion? As the thought of a Rudra less planet Earth scared the Cuber officials. The entire team of scientists at the HQ started to pray to whatever gods they believed in for the safety of humanity's greatest asset. Forward slash forward slash forward slash guys. For the first time since COVID, I will be on vacation for the next seven days. I will still update the book daily and give bonuses as far as possible. But I can't guarantee anything more than the regular one chapter for the coming week forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 733 A Month Without Rudra. Of course. Concerned after day two, she checked on Rudra a lot of times, but found him to be in a state where although he was alive physically, he was not responding to any external noise. Naomi naturally panicked a lot under these circumstances as Rudra had not showed up to check on her, as per his routine for several days now. Naturally on day four, the information about him being in a coma was found out by Naomi, Karna and the other senior officials of the guild. However, at the moment, it was decided to be kept a close guarded secret. The presence of Rudra Rajput itself was the biggest deterrent to all the enemies of the elites. As there was not one faction leader in the game who did not fear a conflict with the king of the true elites kingdom. Rudra was fundamental to a lot of movements both in and out of game and his consistent absence finally started to raise some flags after day 30. The first to notice were the senior guild members who asked the elders about the whereabouts of the guild master for several days in a row now. However the excuse of gone on a special mission was starting to wear thin now. The Church of Death had not issued a new quest from the highest level for 30 days now, and the bishops and the believers were starting to worry about it. Although Karna was trying his best to shoulder the mountain of a weight that Rudra carried on his back for years now, he quickly realized that it was a much harder task than it seemed. Even without the church duties, Karna found himself deeply involved in a lot of important meetings and decision-making processes which consumed all of his time. He was not able to train. He was not able to level up. It was simply an office job for him 24-7, 
as he could not understand how Ribra balanced it all. When an infrastructure proposal came to him for approval, he needed to understand the cost, the benefits of the projects as well as the impact it would cause on the environment and local factions. All of these took time and proper thinking as many of these constructions were of strategic importance for border safety. Before his coma, Rudra had kept his insistence strong on keeping the elite territory developed and up to the best standards of defense. He did not wish to run a country with a mindset that it was all pointless and going to end in a year anyways. He understood that since Omega was a tutorial, then to get the best evaluation at the end of the tutorial one needed to do the best job beforehand. The idiots who had slumped and became lawless after the news of the world's end were all going to be on the wrong end of the evaluation. Rudra had advocated this principle strongly amongst his Church of Death followers, as well, and hence Karna worked in line with that thought. While Rudra could pass the projects only after glancing through papers for 10-20 minutes. It took Karna anywhere between 2-4 days to stamp them or reject them. No matter how hard things got for him though, Karna never lost his smile as he kept the atmosphere in the guild upbeat. Although he was the one who felt Rudra's absence more than anyone, he loved being second in command so much that now, he felt like his life was missing a guiding star if Rudra became missing from action. It was either because Rudra was such a dynamic leader to follow, or because his own base nature was one that liked following more than leading. Nonetheless, he was an excellent second in command. But Karna's limitation hit when finally a video surfaced online that became viral labeled the death of Rudra Rajput, aka Shikuni of the Elites. It was a viral video with 2.4 billion views in three days as it discussed the recent events of how the Church of Death received no new quests and how Rudra had not been spotted in Purple A's city for days now. As for the exact reason of death, it was not mentioned. But it was speculated to be anything from assassination to heart attack. However, the headlines remained that Rudra was somehow dead. When the guild members saw the video, the pressure on the upper management increased tenfold to give a reply. And Karna had to call an emergency meeting when things were about to boil over. The management was supposed to give a reply in the next 12 hours or so. Or risk complete psyche meltdown within the guild. Just the thought of Rudra being dead created a disastrous environment in the guild although it was just a rumor. Rudra was a godly figure amongst the guild members, and one of the most polarizing figure in the history of the game. He had a loyal following of hundreds millions, if not billions of players. And his death was not something they were ready to accept. This was the most profound amongst the young guild members, who derived their spine to face the scary world knowing that if the sky was somehow to fall down then the guild master would hold it up for them. They were the ones impacted the most by this news, as they desperately prayed in their hearts for the news to be fake. As Karna looked at his fellow elders within the conference room, he suggested using CGI to fake Ridra's appearance to calm the panic down. However, when he saw Neatwit having a meltdown in front of his own eyes, Karna understood that if an elder like Neatwit could not handle the absence of Ridra for more than 30 days, then the average guild member would probably freak out as well. A CGI was not going to cut it. They needed something more concrete and something more absolute to calm the matter down and buy more time for Ridra to hopefully wake up. As Karna had no doubt in his mind, that when the guild became rattled by the news of Rudra's coma, the vultures would undoubtedly swoop in to pick the frenzied guild apart. Meanwhile, Cuber Corp. Rudra's body was undergoing rapid strengthening due to an unknown reason that the Cuber Corp was not clear to understand. They tried asking Gaia time and time again as to what exactly was Rudra's body undergoing to release mana pulses so strong that the special equipment that they provided Rudra with, which was meant to withstand the strength of a much higher level cultivator, was showing warning signs of high-level mana detection. Gaia knew exactly what Rudra's body was undergoing however the queen had not cleared her to share this information with humans. The phenomenon Rudra was undergoing currently was something that only an enhanced human aka a cultivator could undergo. And that to a select few talented ones across the universe. Naturally with great rewards came great risks. As if Rudra did not break out of the state of enlightenment, he was in before his physical body ran out of energy. Then, he would enter a coma state forever, or possibly die. Currently the probability of his survival was already down to 73% at month 1. Which was to go down to a whopping low of 12% should he get to month 2. Every day now was critical to his life, and nobody, but he himself could break through to come out the other side an enlightened warrior. However he was against the clock now. Damn it! Gaia, we are still the operators of Earth. This is one of our chief prospects, you have to tell us more about his situation. What has happened to Rudra Rajput? The Cuber Corp chief banged his feeble fists against the table, as he threw a fit of rage towards the AI. However Gaia refused to budge as she kept repeating the same words over and over again. Access level insufficient. Information denied. Information denied. Information denied. No matter how the chief phrases the question Gaia would not reply to him at all. 
In the end the chief made a plea of information to the queen. However five minutes later the response from the universal queen disappointed the Cuber chief. The response said, Human Rudra Raj put aka Shikuni. From human planet hashtag H 2047 has been added to the classified universal database. Access clearance level 6 required to see information. Current access level is 4. Information denied. The chief felt like he was going to have a heart attack after seeing the response. The security clearance required to see the entire information of planet Earth, including the natural resources and technology was level 4. Yet Rudra was classified into level 6 security. Just what was he undergoing? Chapter 734 Ambition Reignited Having made the most of every single day after he reincarnated, Rudra never realized that his biggest heart demon was his old and lazy past self. Reminded of his wasted life as he was forced to relive it in the time trial, Rudra was thrown into a coma as his past and present cluttered his mind. To truly become a tier 5 powerhouse Rudra now needed to defeat his own heart demon so that it did not hamper his future growth. Although his consciousness was in a trance-like state without the awareness that it had been in this floating abyss for over a month now, it realized that it needed to wake up as soon as possible as there was a lot for Rudra to do in real life. Nonetheless scenes from Rudra's past life kept bothering him as he was forced to live through each and every one of his disgraceful moments once more. Rudra saw his old self being spat on by Nin and Anvani in a guild party as he tried to strike up a conversation with the upper brass. He saw the mocking expressions of the people around him and came face to face with his worst fears. He had become accustomed to the reverent gaze of the elites and being treated like a big shot hence seeing his past self suffer such humiliation Rudra felt his blood boil. However he also realized that without hard work and ambition this was the life he was destined to live. The only reason why he was able to achieve those reverent gazes in this life was because of his success and his accomplishments. Rudra saw his girlfriend act all chummy with him as he realized that the bitch was nowhere near 1 slash 20 th as pretty as Naomi as he could see through her fake smile and overused makeup from a mile away now. He could not believe his old self who stole glances at this woman and acted coy. She was fat. She was thick and nothing like the type of woman that he fancied. However he himself looked like a 5 out of 10 at best which made his self-confidence so low that he liked such a common bitch. At this moment Rudra realized how blessed he was to have Ruby and Naomi in his life as the two of them were truly the cream of the crop. However although he knew for sure that they had not fallen in love with him for his power and influence. Had he been the same as his past life, those women would never would have spared him a second glance. Rudra then saw his old self suggesting tactics to the party leader to show a better way of raiding the dungeon. However the party leader mocked Rudra saying, So dogs will now teach their masters on how to take a piss eh? What an interesting world we live in. Dot. The mastermind strategist that he prided himself in being was never given an opportunity to shine as the damn guild he was in did not value his talents. Rudra saw how he got barely some silver coins at the end of that raid and compared to the times he had died and the equipment that had been damaged he took a huge loss. In this life, Rudra spent hundreds of thousands of platinum as if it was water and nobody was there to question his decision or challenge his authority. He could claim not only any loot that he fancied but he could claim entire kingdoms as his own if he wanted to. It was again all thanks to the power and influence that he wielded. Rudra saw how he repeatedly failed his parents and had to beg them for money to scrap by as his mother passed away from her illness and father was forced to live in the slums because of the debt collectors auctioning off their private home. He saw how the entire weight of the family fell on Max, who became an academic genius and had the opportunity to be enrolled into Harvard at the age of only 13. However could not because of the lack of financial capability of the Rajput family. Compared to that, in this life Rudra helped his family live like kings as they lived in the safest and the most posh locality of earth inside the upside. Not only were they untouchable inside the area, but they wielded great influence too. They had luxury cars to drive and virtually unlimited money to spend. All because Ethan Gray was forced to value Rudra as his brother after Rudra showed him his worth. Finally Rudra saw his old self being promoted to the post of a party leader and going on dungeon raids with his party. Leading them to an amazing fastest clear with his unique strategy and earning a piece of epic rated equipment. It was the happiest day in his life as he could sell the equipment for at least a few thousand dollars and send money home for the first time. However in the guild party, afterwards, he was pushed down the stairs by his so-called friend as tumbled to his death. This time around however thousands bowed wherever he walked as he was not only the king of a kingdom, pope of a religion and the strongest guild master of the number one guild in the game, but also one of the candidate to lead humanity into the universal expansion. He was potentially going to become the leader of a planet in the future, and again, it was all thanks to his accomplishments and power. 
although Ribra knew that all this was true, and that he had achieved it fairly. Deep down in the bottom of his heart there was always the old Rudra hidden, who was a wastrel. The old one seemed to mock the current Rudra as he said, Ha! Ah, you think you are better than me? But we are the same. It was a statement that Rudra dreaded the most. He hated to think that the old him ever existed as it disgusted him to see a weak and ambitionless man trying to scale the corporate ladder. He did not want to believe that all the accomplishments he had made were only before he had lucked out and reincarnated. The arrogant boss Rudra could never accept such a reality, as he had already transformed himself into the king of the elite kingdom. Had Rudra not lost Mama and Papa Raj put in the second life, maybe he would have taken the words of his past self seriously, and would not have been able to break past the illusion however with Mama Rajput's death everything changed for him once more. He came to terms with his own mortality, as well as the mortality of his family. As his goal shifted from being super controlling of every single aspect of his life, and just trying his best every single day to not waste the second chance that he had. Smiling the current Rudra reaffirmed the old Rudra, as he said, Yes, we are indeed the same. Without you going through all this, I would have never as strong as I am today. Your suffering has made me strong. Your pain has reminded me to push past my limits, and your humiliation has taught me the value of my self-esteem. I understand the need for power, and I also understand the need for kindness. Rest assured, Rudra, your death was not in vain. The new Rudra will not stop until he leaves his mark on the universe. You have my word. So rest in peace now, my friend. As Rudra said this to his old self, he saw his past self crying tears of joy as he waved the current him goodbye the illusion fading away every passing second. Rudra too finally felt a peace in his heart that he was seeking since a long time as his reliving his past life. His ambition had been reignited once more. He had started to slow down on his hungry goal chasing in the past few months and became complacent however a trip down memory lane helped him come to terms with his true goal in life. The heights he had achieved up till this moment were good but they were nowhere near enough. He needed to climb higher. He needed to make his old self proud so that nobody could ever trample on his pride and the pride of those he protected ever again. Waking up from his stupor, Rudra finally woke up to Omega after 31 days of isolated cultivation. A system notification beeping in front of him, asking him to choose the rewards for reaching Tier 5. However little did Rudra know that his rewards had already been reaped, as there were astounding changes made to his body. He had now ascended above the ranks of the minor cultivators on the planet. Chapter 735 Tier 5 Distributing Completion Reward All Stat Points X2 Physique buff plus 2,000 points. Mana buff plus 4,000 points. Plus immunity from mind control skills below tier 5. Plus immunity from poison skills below tier 5. Plus attacks below tier 3 lose 99% effectiveness. Plus golden invitation, locked, for later use in Sigma only. Plus title, powerhouse. Plus unlocked tier 5 special skill, aura suppression, detected user already has a special aura skill. Upgrading. Merging. New skill unlocked. Death Emperor's Aura Suppression. Test Evaluation. Water Pass. Air Fail. Fire Pass. Earth Pass. Space Pass. Time Distinction. Final Evaluation A+. Distributing Rewards. Please choose amongst any two of these five skill moves. Space Buster. Space. Tier 5. A combat support move that enables the player to create a spatial rip that can open an unusual pathway for dealing attacks. Open Wormholes. Spatial Tiers. Unusual attack paths to absolutely obliterate the enemy from angles that they have no estimation of. Can also bypass barriers and protective formations. Mana consumption 15,500 units per use. Cooldown time 5 seconds. Dark fire blast. Fire, tier 5. Master one of the top 5 flames in the universe that can even melt legendary grade items. Blast enemies with this flame to leave not even their ashes behind. Note nobody under tier 5 can resist this blast if equipped with semi-legendary equipment or lower. Warning if the attack is launched too close to the user. Then the user will also feel the heat of the blast. Mana consumption 4,500 units per blast. Cooldown time 1 hour. Terrain manipulation, Earth, tier 5. Perfectly detect and manipulate any terrain you walk on. Completely rip apart the very surface of the battlefield you are fighting on and manipulate the terrain to your advantage. Can flatten hills. Mountains. Create water bodies and lava mounds at will. Area of effect 2 square kilometers. Mana consumption 1. 0, 0, 0, 10. 0, 0, 0 units. Cooldown time none. Ocean's reckoning water. Unleash a powerful tsunami with maximum wave height of 4 kilometers. Swipe away any battlefield you walk on and raise cities to the ground. Special effects if ocean is nearby. Mana consumption drops by 70%. Cooldown time by 99%. 
Mana consumption 8,000 units per attack. Cooldown time 1 day. Future Sight, Time, Tier 5. Look at the sequence of events that are to happen for 5 seconds in the future. Mana consumption 4. 0, 0, 0 units per use. Cooldown time none. Plus distributing one random class specific skill. Skill received, Undead Ruler. Undead Ruler, Death Knight only, Semi-Divine. Summon a self-sustaining army of the dead consisting of 1 million tier 1 bone crawler undead. 250. 000, 000 tier 2 horse riding undead. 50. 000, 000 tier 3 Durahel. 20. 000, 000 tier 3 undead sorcerers. 20. 000, 000 tier 3 undead archers. 10. 000, 000 tier 3 wyvern riders. 5 tier 4 elder liches. 1 tier 4 undead shaman king. 1 tier 4 undead commander. Note the 5 Elder Liches are the summoners of the army, and can replace all Tier 1 and 2 units. Tier 3 units and above are irreplaceable. Rudra was happy to see the mandatory rewards. The stat points he had accumulated after reaching the peak of Tier 4 were extremely high. Doubling them was a huge advantage for him, as he had essentially doubled his already immense strength at once. Throughout his journey till this point in Omega, Rudra had used the Golden Ratio, the Black Ratio, and countless treasures to buff his stat points well beyond the realm of a common man. Lately with him completing the Church of Death targets. He also received plus 2,000 stat points for all stats, and now every one of those rewards from the start was doubled. The gap created by this one promotion between Ridra and the rest of the player base was unbelievable. If Ridra could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a normal Tier 5 existence at peak of Tier 4, he was strong enough to contend with peak level Tier 5 existences now, and the cherry on top was that his constitution improved hence he was gifted with plus 2,000 physique points and plus 4,000 mana points. Then, there were the immunities. Rudra was glad to see that mind control and poison skills of even tier 4 would no longer work on him. It was like he had evolved to some higher being and petty tricks would not work on him anymore. It was an amazing feeling. The golden invitation was written in gold letters and in bold. However, it was a Sigma only thing which piqued Rudra's interest. He has received an invitation to the Universal Game Sigma. It was golden and came as a reward so was most likely to be some unbelievable opportunity. As for why he got a Sigma reward in Omega, Rudra had no idea. However, he was not going to focus on it for long since it did not concern him at the moment. Rudra also unlocked a new title, Powerhouse. Powerhouse, Legendary, you have reached the pinnacle of power on Middle Earth and ascended to the highest realm possible. You are now a continental power that is to be taken seriously wherever you go. All nations fear you and all citizens admire you. Rudra read the title and was disappointed that it had no special effects. It was just a showpiece, and Rudra had no use for vain titles without purpose. Rudra's Death Knight's aura had somehow been upgraded to Death Emperor's aura suppression. Death Emperor's aura suppression, semi-divine? Plus all mounts will submit to you. Plus all humans under tier 2 can be instantly killed by the dense aura. Plus all tier 2 humans can be incapacitated in fear. Plus 50% stat debuff to all tier 3 players. Plus 12% strength stat debuff all tier 4 players. Plus? Plus? Domain range depends on user proficiency. Current range 200 meters. Note user needs to master the skill first to see more information. Rudra was pleasantly surprised to see this skill. It was a very important skill that nullified mob tactics against him. He was free from wasting his precious moves on killing cannon fodders if they would die instantly when coming into his aura's domain. Tier 1 and 0 would die instantly. Tier 2 would be frozen on the spot unable to move due to fear. This meant that the wave tactics would never work in defeating him. This was a huge benefit, while fighting big wars, as everyone under tier 4 was essentially wiped out of competition for him, as his passes would basically neutralize them into becoming threatless. Rudra was a little disappointed in the A-plus evaluation however he quickly realized that to get a SSS rating one needed to have a distinction in all 6 tests. He was far away from that mark, and was lucky to pass the comprehension test for water and fire. He would have barely passed the test otherwise. Hence, he was happy to take what he could get from the rewards. This time around he got no choice as to what class specific skill he could chose. However he was extremely happy with the undead ruler skill as well. It was extremely similar to the skill that Hades uses however it is a slightly inferior version of that skill considering tier 3 units were able to respawn in that particular skill move. The good news however was that with him ascending to tier 5. The skill death legion also received an upgrade. Death legion, choice between summoning 100, 000, 000 tier 3 undead mages, or 10 tier 4 undead mana dragons. It was the peak of the skill move, and it was undoubtedly a much stronger skill than before. Although Rudra had no idea what undead mana dragons were, he was sure that 100, 
000 tier 3 undead mages could absolutely wreak havoc on any battlefield they were summoned on. He needed to summon the dragons once to understand what their exact strength was. However, considering that every tier 4 force was a huge asset to a war effort, Rivera knew that it must be a good deal. Now the only question that remained was what to choose from the 5 skill moves he was presented with. Rivera noticed that he got a choice from one skill move from every test that he passed. He received no wind-related skills, but a choice from the other 5 elements. Every skill had its merits and demerits, and with him gunning for a war, it could well be the trump card that he got under his sleeve to decide the outcome of some important battle. Hence, he needed to choose very carefully now. Forward slash forward slash forward slash guys you know the drill by now. You have 24 hours to reply as to what skill he should pick and why. So time to go to the comments section and bash the comments down there. I would appreciate maximum participation for this as this is going to probably the last skill choosing for a long time as our hero is nowhere near a next tier promotion anytime soon. Hopefully you all enjoyed this chapter although it's a very technical one. Do let me know if you have any doubts regarding this too in the comments forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 736 Chaos Brews Karna had thought long and hard about how to proceed with faking Ridra's presence, and finally, he decided to recreate his friend's playful nature as in the video Ridra was seen saying, Yes, Cryoforbs, I'm dead! The video was posted by the True Elite's official guild forum page, and the video caused a lot of controversy on the internet. The guild members who did not think that the management would play such games with them lined up outside Ridra's office trying to get a glimpse of the guild master. Whereas the Cryoforbs website became even more incensed by the reply and took it to the internet to expose the lie. Things became out of control when even after 24 hours of the video posted. None of the guild members saw Rudra. Karna had somehow stalled the guild for one day by buying fake time. However, in the process of doing, so he had caused the hysteria to even deepen. Although it was not his intention to do so. Things came to a boiling point in Purple Haze City with the video. The elites refused to listen to the trolls and lashed out violently at anyone claiming their leader was dead. Whereas the conspiracy theorists got bolder and bolder every passing hour since Rudra did not show himself in public. The biggest blow however came when the Cryoforbs website posted a video with proof of how Ridra's body was CGI'd in that video. They had apparently scanned it pixel by pixel and showed irrefutable evidence to the world that the video posted by the elites was a fake. This piece of news shook up the entire world as for the first time since the start of Omega. The guild members fought with management. Angry guild members half begged half demanded Karna to tell them the truth. As morale within the guild hit a rock bottom. The faith that the true elites had in each other, and the management was the foundation of the guild. The members believed that the management would never deceive them, and hence Karna's move was extremely counterproductive. Sitting in Rudra's office, Karna buried his face in his palms as he contemplated the best course of action. However, before he could go out and face the guild, an even worse piece of news were delivered to him as Amelia entered the office to say, Vice Guildmaster, Emperor Cervantes is here to see the king, and there has been a ruckus on the streets. Karna looked at Amelia in shock. The timing could not be any worse. Meanwhile, Rudra's POV. Rudra had five elements to choose from, and he understood the merits and demerits of every single one of them. The problem was with the versatility of the moves and his own requirements. Choosing future sight was a no-brainer for him, as he was the most proficient in the time element, and having that skill could give him unprecedented advantages in a peak-level battle where hundreds of moves were exchanged in a span of a second. Knowing even one of them in advance, and using it to dodge the attack would mean that Ridra could potentially counter it perfectly and win a fight. The problem was in making the second choice. Currently for Ridra, he did not have a single destructive move in his arsenal that could destroy entire battlefields. Facing Maras, he could now understand the true value of having such a move in his arsenal, as for the coming war against Lucifer, he would need to personally launch attacks on many cities, and in such fights, if he had the ability to raise them with a single attack then it would become extremely advantageous. For this requirement, the tsunami was a perfect fit. However, it had a massive mana unit consumption, as well as a long cooldown in normal situations. Having studied the map of hell carefully, Rudra understood that there was only one critical battle for a bridge that was going to be fought over a river. However, other than that going in from the eastern end, the army would not be having any oceans around, especially in the final battle for the capital city, where using such a move once would mean that Rudra would lose one of his two tier 5 skills. Angel's Wrath was also a one-time move which was suited for PvP battles. However, having two one-time moves in his arsenal would make him extremely vulnerable against strong tier 5 opponents. Space manipulation solved this problem as Ridra could see its practical use. If he could open wormholes and deliver attacks from unusual angles at an enemy, he could master PvP like nobody's business. However, the move had no area of effect potential, 
and was useless in the important requirement of him having the capability of neutralizing a battlefield alone. Dark Fire had the same issue as the space manipulation as it was a PEP move. With a cooldown of one hour it was the least preferable choice as although it was an extremely strong combat move for 1v1 battle with the highest attack power of the five. He already had Holy Lance in his arsenal for that purpose. Terrain manipulation was an extremely useful move that if used correctly could become an ultimate support move. However it was just not the right fit for Rudra's fighting style as with him already having to manipulate gravity and at the same time fight while dual wielding. He would not be able to also micromanage terrain manipulation. This meant that the final choice came down between Space Buster and Ocean's Reckoning. Rudra thought long and hard about these two moves and realized that with him already having a massive undead army at his disposal, he already had some PV ability. Although not as effective as the Tsunami, it was still passable if push came to shove. However, he needed a continuous use move more than a one-time use move at the moment. As the outcome of the battle finally would only be decided by the lives and death of those at Tier 4 and above. Understanding this well. Rivera chose to go for Future Sight and Space Buster as his skill moves as he finally completed his Tier 5 promotion. Rivera called his stat panel to have a look. Player name, Shakuni slash Augustus One Knight. Title, Viscount of Hazelgrove Kingdom. Honorable Death Knight. Savior of Thal Village. Revered Medicine Master. Honorary Archbishop of the Church of Life. World Renowned. Heir of Augustus One Knight. Achiever. Dragon Slayer. King of the True Elite's Kingdom. First Cultivator, Supreme Overlord, Legendary Demon Slayer, Superior Human, Pope of the Church of Death, History Maker, Powerhouse, Class, Death Knight Mythic, Subclass, Explosion Artist, LVL, 507, Tier, 5, Stats, AGI, 56, 000 Vit, 52, 000, Int, 54, 000 STA, 51, 000. PHY, 54. 000 mana, 57. 000. HP, 38. 818. 000 slash 38. 818. 000. Unassigned stat points, 0. Hidden stats. Luck, 52 to 100. Charm, 99 slash 100. Infamy, 0 slash 100. Status, no abnormalities. Equipment, Lich's Ring, Concealer Mask, Sun God's Bracelet, Legendary, Doom Armor, Legendary, Death Knight's Black Shield, Pope's Token, White Lion's Kneecaps, Dark Gold, Supreme Witch Arm, King's Helmet, Weapons, Grim Reaper, Siege Breaker, Skills, Darkness Bind, Summon Knight Durahel, Wind Slash, Critical Absorb, Berserk, Darkness Blast, Death Slash, Eyes of God, Earthquake, Critical Block, Blink, Stormbringer, Swift Retreat, Illusiony Multi Sword, Suppression Art, Three Point Stab, Twin Blade Hurricane, Twin Blade Cross Slash, Claymore, Overheard Slash, Solar Restore, Solar Flare, Solar Blast, Solar Descent, Solar Beam, Shadow Doppelgangers, Knight's Courage, Holy Lance Divine, One Leg Leap, Rare, Cloud Feet, Circumvent, Dance of Death, Divine. Object Manipulation? Gravity Manipulation, Divine. Space Buster, Tier 5. Future Sight? Class Specific Skills. Death Knight Summoning. Death Emperor's S Aura Suppression. Black Ratio. Enhanced Full Counter. Death Legion. Knight of the Empire Complete. Time Dilation. Undead Ruler. Mount, Grey Wolf. Pet, Furball, Divine Nine Tails. Rudra let out a loud and deep sigh after seeing his stat panel. He understood how big of a monster he had now become. Although still not nearly as strong as the gods that Lucifer and Hades were having stats of over 100. 000 for each individual stat. He was still impressive by human standards. Finally, he was one step closer to being prepared for the war that was to come. Meanwhile Cervantes. Cervantes felt it in his bones when Rudra ascended to tier 5. The cosmic energy that boomed from Purple Haze City might be undetectable to the mortals. But as a tier 5 existence, who had mastered the laws himself. Cervantes felt it through and through. He knew at that moment that there was only one man in Purple Haze City that could have ascended. However, the time span really shocked him. It was only a few years back that he tried to make the kid his lieutenant, and now he was his equal. Taking the teleportation instantly, Cervantes arrived inside Purple Haze City with haste. Forward slash forward slash forward slash hope you guys enjoyed the chapter. 
Thank you everyone who took it to the comments in the last one. I've read every single one of them carefully, and took the best bits from every one of your reasoning to provide you all with this chapter. Thanks for the support you all. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 737 Questions Asked The procession naturally garnered a lot of attention as Emperor Cervantes was a legendary character in Omega. Players would pay insane amounts just to be in his presence hence seeing him in the streets was akin to once in a lifetime golden opportunity. The NPC citizens of Purple Haze City, who remembered the good king all bowed in respect as they were all smiles to see the Emperor of Hazelroof Empire come to their humble city. However the players caused a ruckus as the streets became inadvertently blocked to see the Emperor. Naturally because of the intimidating tier 4 guards around Cervantes nobody could come close to the procession. However it was still a slow march to the inner city. After about 15 minutes, the elite police showed up and started to take crowd control. The emperor was one of the most esteemed guests of the kingdom, and the elites were not going to let him suffer the slightest of inconvenience. Battens were used to dispel the crowds, as well as barricaded shields to push them back. Those who refused to comply were arrested, and the path in front of Cervantes was royally guarded by an army of policemen now. After a while the police were successful in opening a clear path with people lined up on the left and right corners of the street, but nobody blocking the middle lane. The horses hence galloped freely towards the inner city. However, Cervantes had came at a peculiar time as the conspiracy theorists had just banded together to create a ruckus inside Purple Haze City. And since the emperor was here it gave them an unprecedented opportunity. The conspiracy theorists were convinced that Rudra was dead and that the elites were hiding the whole scandal. However they had no means to peacefully expose the elites. The elites had too strong of a hold on Purple Haze City and there was no physical threat that could force Rudra to personally show up with Neatwit. Mediv, and other tier 4 elders around. In such a situation the presence of Emperor Cervantes gave great hope to the conspirators, as they now had leverage over the supreme lawmaker of the kingdom. By approaching the supreme lawmaker of the empire, one of the chief conspirators, named Bob waited for his turn to stop the caravan as only when the first policeman came 10 meters in front of him did he jump in front of the procession and shouted, Mercy my lord! Mercy! The policemen reacted immediately, as they forced Bob down on the ground and constrained him. However now thousands of citizens as well as Cervantes himself had their gaze fixed on Bob. He had one chance to make it count. Bob shouted, My emperor, these people are scamming us commoners. Only you can give us justice now. The policeman who restrained Bob frowned as the captain of the police instantly said, Put the man in jail. He is spouting nonsense. The police started to drag Bob off the ground as he kept pleading. Please my lord, please, here to the pain of your citizens. Initially Cervantes showed a poker face as he read the power level and the body structure of the man. Only when he was convinced that he was indeed a human and that to a weak tier one human did he finally say, Stop! Let the man speak! The policemen looked at each other and then released Bob. Although Ridra was the boss of true elite's kingdom, Cervantes was the emperor. His word was even superior to Ridra's in terms of ranking and the police being government officers had to comply to his commands. Cervantes had no question about Rudra's capability to run a kingdom. The rapid pace at which the true elite's kingdom was developing was for anyone to see. According to the reports, he had it would become the most formidable kingdom in the entire region in next two three years, both economically and in military might as the tactical projects that Rudra undertook stimulated both these sectors. Cervantes knew that the natives of the kingdom loved Rudra more than anyone else in the world and if push came to shove, they would rebel even against himself for Rudra. This brought the threat level of the true elite's kingdom to an extremely high level. Cervantes was not sure if he could afford to conquer this kingdom even if he wanted to. Unless he found some significant advantage. This meant that any complaints against the elites was a rare opportunity for Cervantes to find some political issue ongoing in the country that could be used as leverage should the need arise in the future. Hence looking at Bob he said, Speak! If justice is to be done, justice will be done! Cervantes made a bold statement and the audience instantly gasped and started to murmur amongst themselves. Bob cowed out his head on the ground several times as he said, My lord, as you know we the citizens of True Elite's kingdom love our King Shikumi more than anything in the world. If you ask us to chop our fingers off for his long life, I'm sure thousands of us would not even hesitate for a second. Many people nodded at these words in the audience as Cervantes was shocked to see the level of dedication the people had for Rudra. Bob continued, However, we have strong reason to believe my lord that there has been a coup inside the palace. Someone has assassinated our beloved king. Chaos broke out amongst the crowd at these words, as even Cervantes's poker face broke as he stared at Bob with wide eyes. The king is dead? What nonsense is this lad spouting? Our king is invincible. Oh my god. No. No. 
Which bastard did this? I will kill him myself. This is all a lie. I it can't be true sobs, it can't be. My king, asterisk sob, asterisk sob. No. The atmosphere started to get out of control as the elites looked at Bob with murderous eyes. Him suggesting that the elites orchestrated a coup against their own leader was preposterous. However, before anyone could do anything, Patricia banged her spear on the ground and the earth shook and rumbled violently as the shockwave followed by a suppressive aura silenced everyone in the crowd. Murder intent at its full display. Patricia glared at Bob as she said, Boy, I dare you to say those words again. Patricia's fierceness sent a shiver down Bob's spine as he started to tremble at her presence. Bob felt like the world was spinning around his feet as he could not dare to look at even Patricia's feet. He questioned his very life at this moment as he did not wish to go through this anymore. Especially not if scary people were going to mess with him. However, gathering some courage, he mumbled very weakly. After the fight with the great demon, we could see that the king was heavily injured and retreated into the palace for recuperating. However, it's been 33 days now, and nobody has seen a trace of the king. I have confirmed reports from the doctor at the royal palace that he has not treated the king in 32 days, and that the queen has started to worry. To top it all up, the elites claim that the guild master of theirs goes to the guild every day to work, and that he was sitting in the office just a day ago. If that is the case, my emperor, then why would the queen be worried, and why would the pious king Shakuni who has not missed church more than four days in a row not show up to his papal duties for over 33 days. Bob's words made sense. And everyone became silent to hear them. As when they thought about it this way, it did seem as if the elites were indeed hiding something. For the elites present at the scene, it was unthinkable of their leader to be assassinated by their own guild members. And hence, when the evidences started to point towards that direction, they became agitated and broken at heart. Cervantes, on the other hand, let out a deep sigh, as he knew better than anyone that Rudra was most likely in secluded cultivation, as he was breaking through to Tyre 5. He hoped for some better political issue. But this was just plain garbage. Losing interest in the subject he only said, move, in a cold tone as he started to gallop once more. Bob was shocked to see such a cold reaction from Cervantes, as he was hoping something much more grand. However, not only did Cervantes gallop past him, but Patricia also gave him a death stare that was going to haunt him for the rest of his life. To make matters worse, he was still dragged to the police station and blacklisted from entering Purple Haze City again in the future. However, his speech was not completely useless. A few questions had been raised amongst the masses, and for the stability of the nation the answers needed to be provided fast. Forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Thomas Sanders for the 5,000 coin magic castle. Thank you so much for the patronage. Gifts are blessings that readers give authors, and I feel blessed whenever I receive them. Believe me, it makes me feel extremely motivated and happy. So thank you. However, I'm sorry the bonus chapter for the gift will only be given on 24th since I'm on vacation till 23rd forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 738 Grand Return. Karna said, Greetings my emperor. I'm Karna the vice guild master of the true elite's guild. The commander of the Avalonian army and the cabinet minister of domestic affairs for this kingdom. It is my pleasure to host you today in our kingdom. Cervantes checked the aura of Karna and was impressed to see that the man had reached tier 4 naturally. However, his shock only deepened when he noticed that the three men surrounding Karna were also tier 4. Cervantes could understand that Rudra was once in a millennium freak and in brilliant and unprecedented talent. However, to see the strength of Purple Haze City to be this deep it meant that not only was Rudra extremely strong, but the men around him were extremely talented and capable as well. Just when the shock was settling in, eight more tier 4 generals walked out to greet him as now his shock turned into a frown. The one month of absence of Rudra had changed a lot of things within the guild as the elders felt like they needed to become a lot stronger faster, while the peak tier 3 core players, who felt their strength was insufficient in the fight against Maras poured their souls into training to get stronger. Finally SMG. Poison Togama Bunta. Poison Togama Kichi. Tank. Rhino. Cola. Skyla and Oregon all reached tier 4. This meant that the elites now had 12 tier 4 generals a number that in itself would make the country a local powerhouse, but add a tier 5 leader above it, and it could become a continental powerhouse. Cervantes could not understand how the players were ascending so rapidly, as if there was a secret to their fast ascension, then he wanted to learn it as well. However, the truth of the matter was that not only did Ridra gather the best talents from across Omega right at the start of the game to make the core foundation of the guild, but he also then nurtured them into the proper direction by providing ample resources, and guidance to turn them into the powerhouses that they were today. Before his seclusion, he had already published a guide in the guild that taught the easiest and best method to progress to tier 4 with an A rating or lower. 
It was a method that the elites would have otherwise only learned after 10-15 failures, as the majority of the upper player base, who was trying to reach tier 4 at this moment, was experiencing however the elites did not need to go through that learning curve since Rudra was their guild master. Finally, Cervantes said, Greetings, Vice Guild Master. I'm here to have an audience with the king. Please let me pass. Karna felt helpless as he looked at the thousands of elites that had surrounded the place in the inner city. Since the normal citizens had restricted access to this part of the town, not many were present in the place. But there were a lot of elites who were now waiting to see his reaction to understand what was the truth behind the matter of the guildmaster's absence. The elites understood well that there was no smoke without a fire, and although they would give the vice guildmaster the benefit of the doubt and not actively question him, they were all very curious as to what actually was going on. Karna stuttered at this moment as he choked on his own saliva. This was the worst possible moment to tell the truth after all the drama that had already been caused however Cervantes was not someone that could be manipulated or lied to. Feeling pressure Karna suggested. Why don't we have a talk in private? My lord. Cervantes raised an eyebrow at the suggestion. He wondered if the assassination rumor was true and if Karna was truly trying to undermine Ridra in some way. As he could feel Rudra's presence from within the palace, but Karna acted like he was not there. Chuckling, Cervantes unleashed his aura as the elites all around except the tier 4 ones felt the strength sapped from their feet instantly being floored to the ground. Cervantes was tired of these silly games and wanted to draw Rudra out himself, and naturally he did. Cervantes's eyes widened in shock as when Rudra unleashed his death aura, it was so thick and dark that even he felt lightheaded under its influence whereas all the tier 4 generals including Patricia dropped to a knee as they gasped for air under the pressure of two tier 5 aura s. The only one still standing who was not tier 5 was Karna as he struggled to keep a dignified straight face, but ended up making a weird expression. Slow footstep sounds could be heard as one man covered in the aura of death walked out of the palace gates in all his majestic glory. The world was shocked to see him in flesh as he said, Now now, my emperor, it's not very polite to use your aura in my city like this is it? I might take it as a threat you know. Karna's eyes widened in disbelief when heard the voice as something from the bottom of his heart released endorphins, so strong that he felt like he was in a bliss. A wide smile cracked up on his face, as even under duress, he smiled at Emperor Cervantes with a straight face. This was the effect of Rudra's presence. As with him around Karna had the confidence to challenge the heavens. Although he had no idea where Rudra was the past few days, and he was going to give him a huge lecture on this later. At this moment, he was just happy, and on the verge of tears, that he was safe and more importantly alive. Cervantes was more shocked than Karna himself. As his hypothesis that Rudra was tier 5 was proven to be true. Not only that but the aura that he possessed was even stronger than his own. How was a kid who had just ascended to tier 5 exerting more pressure than a veteran like himself? Cervantes sighed in his heart. He always knew that there was going to be a day when he would need to treat the kid as his equal. However never did he think that the day would come this early. Taking back his aura. Cervantes said with a smile. Of course. I see that you have ascended to tier 5 my king. Cervantes's voice was laced with respect. And Ridra naturally liked this change of tone. Giving equal respect in return he said. Ha ha. It's nothing worth mentioning. However. While Ridra casually brushed it off everyone else in the guild. From all the tier 3 core members to the tier 4 players stared at Ridra wide eyed. As they could not believe their ears. They were feeling a myriad of emotions upon seeing Ridra. As for one they were extremely happy to see him fit and find however the news that he had reached tier 5 completely shattered their worldview. They had all started from the same platform in the same guild with equal opportunities. However Rudra was now tier 5 while most of them were struggling to break tier 4. Even those ascended to tier 4 had at least 4-6 years of constant work needed to only level up to the threshold needed to become tier 5 whereas the promotion test was a challenge in its own. Rudra had left them far in the dust to the point they could only marvel at him from the bottom now. While all of them were exceptional talents, that man was simply something else. What? Guildmaster is tier 5? Ha ha. That's our guildmaster you all. Ha ha. Now who's going to dare to mess with us? But the second highest player is still far away from reaching tier 5. Our guildmaster is just awesome. Even Karna chimed in as he said. Guys I need to make a confession. The guildmaster had informed me that he was going to undergo a breakthrough and needed absolute privacy and secrecy. It was a matter of grave importance and I had to interrupt him midway just to make that video two days ago, which is why he was delayed for some extra time. The guild members felt that everything made sense now, as they nodded and swore in their hearts to absolutely obliterate the internet trollers today. Some had even started to post on the forums on how the guild master was back, and at tier 5 at that. Within 5 minutes, 
The forums were flooded with the tag. Hashtag he is back. Hashtag boss is back. Hashtag Shikuni is back. Hashtag back again. Hashtag tier 5. Hashtag generational talent. Hashtag undisputed number 1. Hashtag goat. Naturally, the trollers and the conspiracy theorists had no place to hide any longer as the common masses bashed them to no ends. Especially the sites that had been extremely vocal about Rudra's death had to delete their content in a haste so that the common masses would stop commenting fake and reporting them zero stars. However, the headline of the event was naturally the tier 5 tag, which meant that Rudra was back and stronger than ever before. Chapter 739 Grand Talks Rudra and Cervantes took a stroll in the royal gardens of Purple Haze City as the two tier 5 overlords discussed about the future of the continent. Cervantes asked tactfully, So, do you still feel like your kingdom is an integral part of the Hazelbrook Empire? The underlying meaning beneath this question was that was Rudra going to continue being a vassal state, or was he going to rebel and fight for independence? In reality Rudra was only a vassal in name as the true elite's kingdom was only paying an annual tribute of 250. 000 gold to the empire, and had complete autonomy regarding defense and policy making. With the only military obligation being to lend 20% of all standing forces in times of emergency. These were very loose terms, and in theory Hazelgrove Empire did not control the true elite's kingdom at all. However that situation was because Cervantes let them be free. Not because they had the capability of being free. Cervantes was the kingmaker as he let Rudra take the throne. As he could have otherwise easily taken the kingdom, and placed a puppet on the throne. But that dynamic changed now, that Rudra was tier 5, and the developed true elite's army was extremely formidable. The defense and infrastructure spending that Rudra had spent on his territory could only be described as extravagant as security from external threats came as his number one priority while making internal policies. All these changes meant that Cervantes was no longer the overlord above Rudra, and that he had to start treating him as an equal. If Rudra chose to be independent now, he would show his true colors as a snake and Cervantes would understand if he needed to prepare against a rebellion within his kingdom or not. Rudra also understood this well. He also understood that he was strong enough to take on Cervantes head on. And in the legend of the emperor. For once and for all to annex his throne. However, that was never one Rudra's ambitions nor his nature. He was always loyal to the people who supported him when he was nothing and Emperor Cervantes was one of those few people who did. When the blood merchants attacked his territory. Cervantes dispatched a lot of reinforcements unconditionally, without which Rudra would have lost the war. Taking that into account and the fact that the terms and conditions that the elites currently had for being a vassal were already extremely generous, Rudra saw no benefit in revolting. He was content with the piece of land he held and wanted to develop it perfectly for now rather than taking on new lands, which he would most likely not even rule for a year. Smiling he said, Of course, nothing changes. You helped me when I was a nobody my emperor. And Shikuni of the elites returns gratitude with gratitude. No matter how big I become, or heights I achieve, I will always be grateful to you. Cervantes chuckled as while Rudra's words reaffirmed him. It also posed a challenge that said, we are equals now. But won't be in the future. Cervantes understood the difficulty of ascending after reaching tier 5 more than anyone in the world. However Rudra said it as if it was not a big deal at all. Shockingly Cervantes knew it in his heart that the man was not kidding either. Given enough time, if anyone could actually ascend to godhood it would be Shikuni. The two shared an amiable chat after that as Cervantes dropped the nominal annual tribute to one gold coin and military standing to just 2%. It solidified the position of the elites as an independent kingdom who were vassals only in name. The later part of the talks with the two powerhouses also involved many top-level government figures from both sides. As Cervantes presented his plan to strong arm four surrounding kingdoms to submit to Hazelbrook Empire now that Rudra was also tier 5. In his mind the enemy would be a fool to resist, and if everything went well, then all four kingdoms would fall to the Hazelbrook rule within next two months. But for this to happen, both the powerhouses needed to go on a tour to a friendly visit to all the nations alongside some of their personal bodyguards to explain the situation perfectly well to them. For Cervantes, it was the motive of expanding his territory, gain more income, and restore the previous glory of Hazelbrook empire. For Rudra, he was to get 30% of all the annual tributes as relief funds from Hazelgrove Empire every single year for this help. It was a very lucrative offer, and Rudra had nothing to lose. Plus, if the four nations acceded to Hazelgrove Empire, Rudra would be able to make internal operations in their territory as well, harvesting precious resources and herbs to fuel his guild's growth. Rudra, however, did not want to go on a month-long tour to other nations to make them accede to the terms and conditions hence decided on hosting a banquet where he would invite all four kings to Purple Haze City. Although it was a banquet on the surface, 
It was basically a dinner of doom for the four kings who were about to lose their sovereignty. The date of the banquet was decided to be seven days from now. And two tier four representatives were sent to each of the four kingdoms to strong arm them into accepting the invitation. Karna. Neatwit. SMG. Mediv were dispatched from the elite side and Patricia alongside some other generals were dispatched from Cervantes' S side to these kingdoms in pairs of two alongside an invitation written in pure gold by Rudra's handwriting. Although Rudra did not need to help Cervantes with this. He wanted to settle his old debts before starting the war with Lucifer, as once it started there would not be any more time for anything else. Since the deadline for the war to start was still a month away, Rudra had this one final chance to help Cervantes and make him owe a favor. This was mainly because Rudra did not know what forces he would need to call on for help in the eventual war. Meanwhile the forums. Rudra's news that he was tier 5 now set the world ablaze. Many declared him as the greatest player of all time and nobody could refute that he was the strongest player in the game anymore. There were many unofficial power rankings and although Rudra ranked top 10 in all of those rankings, he was not consistently shown as the top player. Everyone from the general public had long acknowledged his skill. However there was always some stats that they could rely on which made them believe that Rudra was not the undisputed number one. However nobody could refute this fact any longer as the gap between Rudra and the second highest level player was 130 levels and one tier. Such a difference was no longer something that any unofficial rankings could debate against and unilaterally throughout the world Rudra's position was changed to number one. The dark faction players, who were already furious by his actions of defeating their rankers mercilessly, as well as conquering one of their territories now abandoned all hopes of revenge as they trembled by his name itself. His might was terrifying at tier 4 as he could kill several tier 4 players alone back then. However now that he reached tier 5 it was a whole different ballpark that nobody could even imagine. Some feared that Rudra could wipe out all of the dark faction rankers alone if he wanted to which caused the rankers to hide their necks in fear. Those who had previously talked shit about Rudra ran to the internet to delete all their previous comments as to not antagonize the giant. The Church of Death's popularity also exploded alongside Rudra's video on how to level up as the concept of participating in wars to gain EXP suddenly gained unbelievable traction. Some idiots doubted about Rudra's claims however when Rudra turned his level display to on and showed his level 507 on the ranking boards. They shuddered and shut up in fear. Things started to fall into Rudra's favor naturally as if the universe was orchestrating it to happen. As he was not only gaining over a million new entrants a day in the church but the eagerness for the commoners to wage wars was also boiling up. Everything seemed to gradually progress in a fashion that Rudra initially wanted it to. However this time around it was a natural effect and not an effect of his manipulation. The countdown to the war was progressing smoothly. Forward slash forward slash forward slash guys I'm returning back home today. My vacation was great I'm completely refreshed now. Expect amazing content and thrilling sequences in the coming month as well as lots of bonuses. Thank you for your patience the past week slightly smiling face, forward slash forward slash forward slash, chapter 740 changes and a new body. The envoys had returned successfully, and all four kings were strong-armed into coming to the banquet by the representatives sent by the Hazelbroof Empire. While Neatwit and SMG had a smooth path, Karna actually had to kill two tier 4 generals to assert his dominance on the king to accept the proposal. Nonetheless, Nobody wanted to risk a war with Hazelgrove Empire backed by Cervantes hence, although they did not like the suppressive attitude of the envoys, they had no choice but to let them leave with respect from their kingdoms. Naturally once the envoys left, and the news traveled the four kings met in secret with one another to discuss a potential alliance should the Hazelgrove Empire chose to invade. However at this point in time, the kings did not have a true idea about the strength of the true elite's kingdom. They felt that Cervantes was just using King Shikuni as a pawn for his schemes, and were in for a big surprise. The four kingdoms had a terrain advantage that made it easy to defend against large armies as they had the cover of the mountain ranges. However such physical domains meant nothing to tier 5 powerhouses who could crush the mountains along with the cities inside with no problem at all. The defense of the mountains then became a liability, which was why the four kingdoms needed to band together to stop such a powerful foe. Understanding that their survival was on the line, the four kings banded together putting aside their personal differences as they headed towards the banquet together. Meanwhile in real life, one of the most remarkable changes occurred to Rudra's physical body once he exited the gaming pod as he noticed that his skin was covered in glowing runic tattoos. Rudra had a much tougher skin that broke steel knives upon impact as if it was rock and it was covered in light red runic tattoos all over which gave him a slightly alien look compared to a normal human. He was covered in tattoos up to his neck while his face remained untouched. 
Coupled with his already mystic eyes Rudra now looked more like a god from the myths, as he had an omnipotent aura around him. Rudra now felt like he was a part of the world's mana stream itself, as he felt an endless amount of energy flowing from inside him. He no longer needed to bathe, eat or even sleep as he found that his energy levels remained high regardless of what he did. He could keep himself clean by just willing all odor on his body to die, while he could keep his bodily functions regulated by converting all the waste in his body to microscopic excretions from his skin that would then be evaporated by body heat leaving him odorless once more. The only physical need Rudra had any more was for fluids, as he still needed water although in much lesser amounts than a normal human as his body seemed to recycle water much better, with his urine frequency becoming as low as 1 C a week. The changes to his strength were significant, as well, as he literally had the strength to demolish buildings now, with a punch. His comprehension towards nature increased, as well, as he started to view the world in a completely new light of laws. Looking at the vast ground below from the top of the elite's tower, Rudra now realized how tiny the land was compared to the giants he had seen in his vision in the universe that were land beasts much larger than Earth as a planet. Compared to that the physical act of owning a small plot on a small planet like Earth seemed to be pointless to Rudra now. His interest in materialistic things seemed to have died down instantly as he did not seem to care about things that money could buy anymore as all the money on Earth was practically useless when compared to the wide universe. Once Rudra realized this fact, he understood that amassing wealth was no longer going to be of any use to him, and that it was best to give it all back to the masses to gain good karma. Keeping aside only one trillion dollars for the safety of his family and his future generations, Rudra decided to give everything else he owned away as he tried to trade everything for food and rations for Japan. Rudra's emotions also became much more stable and consistent as nothing seemed to startle or shock him anymore as his very view of the problems on earth seemed to have been elevated to a larger scale. It was like he was a member of a household before, trying to figure out a way to save the electronics in his house when heavy rains had flooded his house. However, now, he was a mayor looking over his city as he saw the city drown under heavy rains. Compared to the grander scale of the city being submerged, he no longer cared about the electronics in one house which was going to be damaged. As if he started to worry about such small things, then the real issues would be left unsolved. Having dealt with his heart demon, Rudra understood that he needed to keep moving forward and keep getting more and more powerful for him ever being in a position of power to save his people and his race. The law of the jungle was not just on planet Earth, but the whole of universe, and nature only selected the strongest to live on. Although Rudra did not understand the origins or the meaning behind his newfound power, but coupled with his stable mindset and the newly developed aloofness, he realized that the petty things on Earth that he was holding onto dearly were worth nothing at all. The only thing that he needed to hold onto was his power, and his goodness of heart. It was time to expand his view from caring about just one guild to the entire human race, as he understood now that he had already become the strongest guild master for the one guild in humanity. However in the wide universe the entire planet Earth was like a small guild itself. And it was now his turn to become the guild master of this small planet, and take it to the very top. Forward slash forward slash forward slash important. Guys, I will type a lengthy general consumer notice in the attached author's notes below. It's about how web novel works, and the recent policy changes. Surely do check it out if you guys have time, because it concerns all of your pockets forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 741 coming out. Rudra monitored the forums extremely carefully, and every since he came out to become the only tier 5 player in Omega, the buzz surrounding his interview with the streamer Dutypie had become unreal. Especially the bit where he talked about the Church of Death and the importance of war and leveling up there seemed to be a widespread wave of people trying to use his methods to climb the leveling ladder. Rudra planted the seeds months ago, and the ripple he caused this time had created the giant wave he was waiting for. The time was ripe for him to make another big speech. Since the elders who had went out to invite the kings were back, and the banquet was still the next day, Rudra had time for the big speech he was going to make. Since the guild hall was no longer large enough to house the entire guild, the location was decided to be the inner district near the church as the open space could house many more guild members than the confined guild hall. As Rudra stood at the steps of the Church of Death addressing the entire guild and the billions watching worldwide, Rudra had hyped up this speech for last three days as he asked Dutypie to stream and promote it, and it was not a lie to say that the entire world had their eyes on this speech as Rudra labeled it to be a grand opportunity. Dot. As he stood at the steps of the Church of Death, his aura alone caused the crowd in front to stand in rapt attention and pin drop silence. Not even a sound of a distant bird flapping its wings could be heard in the inner district as Rudra stood looking over the crowd as if he was an overlord and a divine god. He had long had an intimidating aura that commanded respect from anyone who gazed upon him. However, if he was a regal emperor in the past, 
he now looked like an omnipotent overlord. Even his own guild members, who stood shoulder to shoulder with him in war shuddered by his very gaze, as although they knew that there was no threat lace behind the gaze. It was still intimidating enough for them to swear like pigs. Nobody dared to make a sound. Neither did they dare to look him in the eye. When he finally started to speak, his voice boomed across the entire inner district as if amplified by the highest quality loudspeaker. Rudra said, Earthen residents, today I stand before you with an opportunity of a lifetime. On June 15th, 21 days from today, I will march into hell with none other than the god of death, the one true ruler of the underworld. Primordial god Hades himself. The objective, take back the control of the underworld from Lucifer and slay the evil fallen angel for once and for all. Lord Hades had amassed a massive army of his own and does not need one single human from Middle-earth to help him in his fight. However, I will still personally march into the demonic territory, not only because I'm the Pope of his religion and worship him as my god, but also because this is a realm-level war at a scale that will make the world wars of history look like child fights. There will be EXP to farm and battle senses to sharpen, like never before, and I need that for myself. I have decided that it's the best course of action with unbelievable rewards to be gained hence, I will command my guild to go in with me. However, naturally, everyone has a choice of whether they want to follow me or not. Usually, I would have reserved such a brilliant opportunity for my guild members and myself alone. But looking at the crisis that humanity is facing, I decided to open it to everyone. For the Church of Death members, this war is an even more fruitful event than you can ever imagine as every kill you make. In addition to giving you EXP will give you merit points that are redeemable for rewards up to the legendary grade. Usually, hell is a place where death is permanent, and hence it's not a place where one can act unruly and participate in wars as they please. However, our backer is the god of death himself. In every church of death starting tomorrow, we will give out special blood potions that you all had sacrificed to god Hades since day one. That once consumed will give you one extra life once you die in hell. This means that even if you are killed in hell, you will be able to respawn in your chosen church of death one time. Naturally, you will not be allowed to re-enter hell once you respawn for next six months, but I personally as the Pope will forbid everyone to use their second life in hell. Because if you do die a second time, then the entire journey you would have made in Omega would be for naught, and that's not something I'm ready to let anyone including myself to risk. I can promise you blood-pumping fights and a journey of constant thrill and action. For the bold who wish to improve by leaps and bounds in the coming year, follow me to slay the demon Lucifer and become exponentially stronger in the process. So who is with me? Rudra's speech this time around was without any promises, without any lie or deceit however the dignity with which he delivered it cut right through one's heart as they felt their blood boiling to join. Who did not want a life of adventure? Who did not want to improve by leaps and bounds? Who wanted to miss out on the biggest war in the history of mankind when there was a second life available? Nobody. Although Rudra had used no lies. The psychological game he played was very real as the choice of words he used made everyone want to sign up in an instant. The countdown had finally started to tick down. Rudra had revealed his next hand. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Thomas Sanders. Please thank him in the comments for this one forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 742 The King's Summit. The setting was extremely intimidating with the room having 36 tier 4 men posted around the four kings all staring at them with amiable smiles as the pressure on the dinner table was unreal. Amelia served the food with grace alongside Patricia as Rudra tasted Queen Ruby's hand-cooked dishes for the first time ever. They were quite delicious and Rudra hence discovered for the first time that his wife had such a hidden talent as well. She had insisted in cooking for this summit and Rudra was very happy that she did. Although the other four kings were unable to enjoy the taste of the food due to the environment, Cervantes appreciated it a lot. Cervantes said, very delicious. I'm envious that you have such a good wife King Shikuni. She is a master chef. The other four kings fell silent as they heard this. This was not an amiable dinner at all yet the emperor was behaving like they did not even exist in his eyes, which was completely unacceptable. Cervantes continued, my noble kings, I will cut through the bullshit and tell it to your faces. I am interested in your territories. Submit them to the Hazelgrove Empire and keep ruling over them as vassals or perish. As Cervantes said this he banged his fork on the table and unleashed his aura as his tier 5 aura overwhelmed everyone in the room except for Rudra who kept enjoying his wife's meal as if everything was normal. The four kings started to sweat under his pressure as they felt aghast. Nonetheless, they were prepared for such a pushback, and hence one of them mustered the courage and said, We knew that you were up to no good Cervantes. You might think you are a great bully. But we are not that easy to be bullied. You alone cannot conquer all four of us combined, and yes, we are united. 
You are free to try but conquering our lands will not be without consequences for you. If you want to flatten our land and kill millions of people who worship Binigar just like you do then fine. Take over our barren lands with no population to rule over. But we shall not cave. Dot. The four kings bared their fangs against Cervantes and met his gaze head on without being intimidated. They had already signed a system contract beforehand that said that they would be allowed to go back from the banquet with respect and without any harm befalling upon them. Hence they knew that no matter what Cervantes tried to pull off here, he could not actually kill them, and the 36 tier 4 generals in the room were nothing more than showpieces. Cervantes had long anticipated such a reply as he only smiled gently and looked at Rudra as he said, I don't think you quite understand the situation that you are in. The four kings turned to look at Rudra, who they thought was nothing more than Cervantes's vassal to finally notice something unusual about his visage. Under such a heavy aura, he was unaffected as he wiped his face with a towel like a nobleman and rested his cutlery on the plate as he finished dining. Only then did he unleash his aura alongside gravity's suppression to overwhelm the four kings in an instant as well as destroying the table and the chairs they were sitting on to pin them on the ground flat. The pressure that the two tier 5 aura alongside the gravity suppression created was too much for the four kings to handle as they pissed their pants and cried for mercy while two of them passed out. He he is tier 5! Oh my god there is another tier 5 existence in this continent and he is in bed with Cervantes. We are doomed. Doom? One of the kings started to cry and whine like a girl as their spineless behavior disgusted Rudra. Okay okay stop it. The kingdom of white rocks concedes. Stop it now. The other king that was awake crumpled as the alliance was shattered and one kingdom was annexed to the Hazel Groove Empire. Rudra's job was then completed as the other king of the Blue Rocks also conceded, and with the alliance half empty, the other two kings were also forced to concede making the banquet a grand success. Not even touching a single hair on the enemy. Rudra compelled four kings to give up their lands at once as he felt like he was a mob boss and not a dignified king in the process. He was doing mafia level shiz at a kingdom scale by making grown warriors piss their pants from his intimidation. He had indeed came a long way from the kid who dealt one damage to dragon scales. Cervantes was naturally extremely thankful of his support later on as the map of the continent was updated that day, with four kingdoms annexed to the Hazel Roof Empire, and the tale of the new tier 5 powerhouse spreading. The Pope and the Lizard Man King the other two tier 5 powerhouses on the continent were alerted as the balance of power had shifted in the region with Rudra's ascension. However it was too late to do anything now. The church was neutral, and was going to remain neutral while the Lizardman King was quite a long distance removed from the Hazel Roof Empire as of now. In the future if the Hazel Roof Empire expanded a lot then, there was a chance of conflict, and all the Lizard King could do now was to prepare for the gruesome conflict. However for now, Rudra completed his last obligation towards someone he owed a favor to and in the process gained a constant stream of income for his territory, and also a pledge for 5 million soldiers and 10 tier 4 generals to be lended for his war effort in hell forward slash forward slash forward slash today will be a two chapter day this one is the normal and we will have one more for hitting the gt target good job guys forward slash forward slash forward slash chapter 743 max's journey in omega unlike his usual visage max was very excited when he entered omega in the start as he could finally play the game of his dreams which he had seen only on tv up till this point being played by his brother however he was very quick to understand that the vastness of the gap between himself and Rudra was akin to heaven and earth for now, choosing to be a thief. Just like his master Johnny, Max wanted to use the sword as his main weapon and have a playstyle familiar to his brother. However, when he actually started to fight packs of wolves and level up by himself, he realized that unlike his brother, who could rupture space and time with his sword slashes, he needed to exert his peak strength just to pierce the hide of the wolves. Max was like a toddler who was learning the A.B.C.D for the first time in school, while Rudra was a world-renowned author who wrote hundreds of pages of classics every day. Max had a lot to learn and his insistence to do it alone and not lean on his brother's organization for help meant that he was having a much harder time than most who undertook the elite's power leveling program. Should Max will it, he would become tier 3 in a matter of two months, however that was not how he wanted to play the game. He did not want to use his brother's identity to make his own mark. In just a short span of two days Max leveled up to level 10, and left the beginner's village as he excitedly headed to Greenthorn City to earn money and strength for the first time. He participated in dungeon runs and experienced the thrill of Omega from then on for 22 days as he finally ascended to tier 1 with a SSS rating in his test. Finally having saved enough money for teleporting to Purple Haze City as after the teleportation he barely had enough silver saved for the entry toll 
as he excitedly saw the streets of his brother's city for the first time ever. It was clean, beautiful and reminded him of the medieval city pictures in his history textbooks as although it was semi-modern. Greery was abundant, and the streets were lively, and the people were happy. Max was shocked to see that many shops had the photo of Rudra sat on his throne at their storefront with various flower necklaces on his neck that seemed to be freshly put. Upon asking an owner about it Max was very happy to know that the people do it willingly to show their love and appreciation for the king. Seeing this scene, he felt warm in his heart to know that his brother was so loved and appreciated. Max saw many beautiful buildings such as the Mage Tower, the Teleportation Center, the City Library, and so on. Until he finally entered the Inner District to visit the churches. There was a thorough security check before letting him enter Inner City, as all his weapons were seized, and he was given a token to collect them later. The law and order was absolute within the area. Max wanted to see the True Elite's Guild Hall, and the other legendary structures that he had only seen in pictures. But what caught his eye was the seemingly endless line in front of the Church of Death that was moving very fast. It was the line for people willing to take the blood potion and join the war effort as up till this moment across all the branches of the church 23 million people had enrolled for the war effort and the lines were endless at the moment. Rudra's speech created an unreal hype as every single player. Major or minor wanted a piece of this action as many super guilds and first tier guilds took their entire organization into the war effort by signing themselves up. Max had heard the TV news about the coming huge realm war but he did not feel like his strength was sufficient to join it at the moment. However, when he was just gawking at the huge line, he overheard some conversation from tier 3 players where they said that the war was the fastest way to grow efficiently, and how they wished they could have done it from tier 1. Something inside Max snapped at that second, as he felt like even if he was not strong enough, he should definitely at least enroll for the experience. Hence, he joined the queue and waited for his turn to enroll. Only when he waited for hours in the line to get a vial of the Hell's Potion did Max finally get a true view of his brother's glory. As for the seven hours that he waited in the queue, the only chatter he heard was about the greatness of King Shikuni of the Elites. People in the queue would kill for the opportunity to join the true Elites and have a chance to converse with Rudra, and yet, Max was someone who had that opportunity for free but chose not to take it. The conversation about Rudra were so exaggerated that Max felt the image of a near-god-like existence established in his mind, as he wondered will I ever reach his heights? The reason why Max did not wish to join the elites was because he did not want to live under his brother's shadow, and wanted to explore the game, and make a name for his own self. He did not want to be Max Rajput the brother of Ridra Rajput, but wanted to become so big that people said look that's Ridra Rajput the brother of Max Rajput. However the dream seemed too far-fetched at the moment. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for hitting the GT target. Good job guys forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 744 Final Talks A total of 120 million people had signed up for the war from Rudra S. Church and alongside the additional 5 million troops promised by Emperor Cervantes Rudra currently had a standing force of 125 million soldiers, which was expected to reach 5-7 million more by the time the war actually started in the next 5 days. Naturally after the players signed up, they needed to stay at Purple Haze City and prepare to be drafted into units as currently the city was flooded with millions of refugees loaded into small camps at max capacity just outside the city. However the number of these camps were so large that it seemed like another city outside Purple Haze City, as the sheer scale of people gathered was pure madness. Small scale merchants made a killing at their business, as war items sold as hotcakes as morale was high amongst the troops. Rudra also extended a generous hospitality to these people as food and services such as weapon repair, and war clothing was provided for free to these players. With the elites having a total of 43 tier 4 players, and the total pool of outer players adding another 57 of them along with the 10 men from Emperor Cervantes Rudra's force had a total of 110 tier 4 generals amongst nearly 130 million players. The disparity was huge, and it went to show how only 1 in a million players could actually reach the height of tier 4. Rudra had no doubt in his mind that although by the end of the coming war this number would go up significantly, it would still be very few people at the tier 4 compared to the cattle breed that tier 3 would become. Having a solid idea of his strength Rudra finally met with Hades and the other generals in the separate realm to listen to the final situation from their side and finalize the battle plans. Hades's realm. The battle room. As Rudra walked into the room after being summoned through a portal all the other commanders threw a glance at him. Rudra's natural aura had became way more terrifying than the last time and as Asmodeus checked his power level and failed. Rudra unleashed his aura on him, as he said. Yes! Like I promised I'm tier 5 now! Rudra's presence was so heavy that Asmodeus felt suppressed under his aura, as the final strand of doubt vanished from his heart, and he accepted Rudra's position as the first commander. 
He was thoroughly shocked to see Ridra having an aura so powerful that he felt life-threatening fear from it. Being a man who respected strength above everything Asmodeus could finally let go of his reservations about Ridra, as he accepted his place at the top of the food chain. Initially when Ridra claimed that he would become tier 5 by the next time they met. Asmodeus scoffed at his arrogance however now that Ridra actually proved his point. He had nothing to say. Congratulations first commander. Asmodeus said as the other generals repeated. Congratulations first commander. Ridra nodded as he took his seat right beside Hades as he saw the god smiling from the corner of his lips. Ridra knew that respect for authority was everything in military and to make the others respect him he needed to command and earn it and not receive it from Hades's word. Establishing his dominance early Ridra established his place in the food chain as he made it abundantly clear who the top dog was in this room. Hades naturally respected this and smiled as Ridra had once again delivered on his promise to become a valuable asset to his cause. Hades said, So since the first commander was not here, why don't you fill him up on the situation Belphegor? Fifth commander Belphegor stood up and bowed to Hades as he said, First commander Shakuni, Currently the forces from the side of the Lord Hades include At tier 6 God Hades himself At tier 5 the 5 commanders At tier 4 we have 108 winged demon generals At tier 3 20 million greater demons At tier 2 4 million demons At tier 1 and 0 2 million lesser demons Due to the demon's diary being destroyed Lord Hades was unable to expand his forces further than the last meet But we did manage to train the existing forces extensively to make them an extremely lethal and cohesive unit with many special archery and cavalry divisions. Ridra nodded his head. Lord Hades was supposed to generate 30-35 million more troops and at least 20 more tier 4 demons, but those plans were ruined by Dronacharya. Standing up he said, I will have nearly 130 million troops on my side. At tier 4 110 generals. At tier 3 40 million. At tier 2 70 million. At tier 1 19 million. At tier 0 1 million. The unit is not cohesive and has never fought together. Although we have the numbers, I am not sure about using sophisticated battle tactics with these numbers, although we do have many small specialist units within the group. Ridra gave the others a piece of critical news as the room nodded in understanding. He had delivered on his promise to raise 110 140 million troops, and it was the only way in which Hades stood a chance to win this war. Although Ridra made it seem to the common masses that Lord Hades could easily conquer hell without their help. In reality, that was not at all the case. Without the Church of Death volunteers Hades was powerless. This brought the total standing army to about 159 million troops. 218 tier 4 generals and 5 tier 5 commanders. On paper it was an extremely impressive force, however the question was. Was it enough to win the war? With the final strength of the forces decided, that was exactly what needed to be figured out as Rudra started to reverse calculate the odds of winning in his mind. For 14 long hours, as the others discussed war strategy Ridra chose to remain in a human calculator mode as he analyzed and reanalyzed the odds of winning to understand where they stood and what was the margin of error at each step. According to his reverse calculation, they needed at least 150 tier 4 generals, all 5 commanders, and God Hades alongside at least 90 million troops to siege the capital of hell. That was the only way they had a 85% or higher win probability in the final fight and from there, when he reverse calculated battle by battle the amount of forces they could afford to lose, he found out that there were four extremely critical battles that needed to be weathered smoothly to make this reality happen. The most important battle was the one on the riverfront to successfully get a military hold on the other riverbank and secure a transport route for the massive army from one end of the river to another. It was going to be the most bloody battle that needed a lot of careful calculation to win, and also the most tactically challenging one as the enemy had a superior advantage in positioning at that junction. Apart from that there were three major cities that needed to be secured to establish a smooth supplies line in the war, and which were all sure to be bloody battles, by how well defended the walls of the city were. Rudra understood that he would need to fight in constant battles on monthly basis, and that too, with extremely minimal margins of error for the next one year to pull this impossible mission off. While the other generals could not look at the bigger picture and debated on what town to capture first in order to make a base. Rudra was already calculating 50 steps ahead, as he set the criteria for each battle, and how many losses could be afforded. Rudra broke the full strategy down to the others once, he was done planning, and once again, his sharp mind stunned everyone as they felt like nursery school children, listening to a college professor give them lectures. Once Rudra was explaining his plan, it was already three days, since the meeting had started and two days, before they started the march as Hades approved of his strategy. The plan was hence sealed and from then on started the task of delegating work from commanders, to generals, 
to the captains of the various small units. As Ribera talked about some other finer details with Hades. By the time everything was planned out, it was only 18 hours before the war was supposed to be started as Ribera was teleported back to Purple A's city to ready the masses for what was about to come. Forward slash forward slash forward slash guys, do you all want an illustration of how the map terrain in hell and how the battle will progress? One of you readers suggested me to make a Patreon and use the money from there to make illustrations and the like for the book. I can put in the work on urgent basis from my side if you guys are interested in such a concept. Forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 745 Do Not Unlock. Do Not Unlock. Chapter for Rise of the Dragon Emperor uploaded by mistake. Please do not unlock. I apologize for the update. Do not unlock. Do not unlock. As Ronan was called to receive his rewards Augustus patted him proudly on the back as he handed him the 5,000 year old ginseng. When the herb was finally unveiled its fragrance made the entire arena salivate as the commoners especially started to drool like they had just seen a piece of tinder and juicy meat for free on a barbecue stall. Ronan instantly started to squeeze the ginseng as he ate the drops that trickled down with joy enjoying the energizing herbal flavor and nourishing content. When the others saw a few drops of the ginseng drop on the floor from Ronan's wrists, they winced in pain as they felt that his style of eating was too barbaric. What a waste of such a precious treasure! Some commented as they sighed and saw Ronan devour the ginseng's nourishing water first before starting to chew on its fibers like chewing gum. Ronan felt electricity rampage through his veins as his elemental essence was stimulated by the contents of the juice, and his body felt energized beyond its usual limits. Ronan instantly broke through one level, as he enjoyed the remnant power in his body from the ginseng that nourished and increased the purity of his elemental essence. Usually when someone receives such a priceless treasure, they would give it to an alchemist to be refined into a top-grade pill for consumption. Had Ronan done, so he could have easily gotten three levels out of the ginseng instead of one. However, the second prince of Avalon did not seem to care. Chewing on the ginseng, as if it was common candy, he looked at his father seated on the throne above, as if asking him, can I go now? The other sect masters looked at each other and waited for Alexander to announce that the sect selection process could start now. However, the number 10 sect, the Violet Cloud sect master, did not want to wait for protocol on this one student as he shouted, Ronan, join the Violet Cloud sect and I will make you my personal disciple and also provide you with all of the sect's techniques, including our legacy technique reserved for only sect elders and master. The other sect master shot a vicious glance at the violet cloud sect master to jump the queue as chaos descended once he made that declaration. The heaven chaser sect master mocked the violet cloud master as he said, Paul, oh, you yourself are a puny level 137 warrior. The kid will surpass you in four or five years. What qualifications do you have to teach him? Know your place. Or else the heaven chaser sect will wipe off your little one from the face of this continent. The raging wind sect master said, we will give you the utmost support by giving you daily personal guided sessions from sect elders and myself and also 10 times the resources provided to a normal core disciple if you join. Alongside all the legacy skills of our sect. Everyone was aghast by this declaration as the other raging wind sect disciples could not believe their ears. Compared to the rewards promised to Ronan, they were living a dog's life and they were the core disciples of the sect the sect master was talking about. The unfairness of the world was on full display as the talented disciples gathered for the tournament were put to shame by a single 13-year-old kid named Ronan Draco. First by his fighting skills, and next by his value assessed by the various sect masters. As compared to him, they were as good as outer disciples. They had never heard about any disciple getting such ridiculous rewards, or seen the various top brass fight like a bunch of hooligans, and threaten war over the choice of a single disciple. However, there was nothing that they could do about it, as the sect masters' decisions were supreme in the sects and nobody could defy their wishes. Many gazed enviously at Ronan as Zimo and Mad Dog felt that the world was too unfair to bless someone like Ronan, who was already blessed with unparalleled talent with unparalleled support as well. As they believed that if they got such an opportunity, then they could also be as good if not even better than Ronan Draco. However, the world was an unfair place where the strong were worshipped and contested over as everyone present understood that recruiting Ronan was a free ticket to making this sect a regional powerhouse, as the rise of the talented kid was inevitable. But before any sect masters could pull out their swords and actually start to fight for the discipleship of Ronan, the heavens rumbled as the space crackled, and with a flash of lightning, the strongest man on the entire continent of Everlon appeared before the masses. Shikuni threw an angry glance at the sect masters as he said in a commanding voice, Who dares to covet my disciple? Meanwhile, the Night King's army. The Night King's army completed their scouting and launched an ambush attack on the outermost village of Avalon in the cover of the night at 2.05 a.m. The village guards, 
who were caught napping on patrol outside the village gates were killed in their sleep, as only when the half-dead reached the vicinity of the gates was the alarm of an attack raised. The general had picked a very dastardly time to attack the village as at around 2 a.m. all the majority of the males were sleeping after a hard day's work and would need several minutes to wake up, arm themselves, and respond to the emergency signal, by which point the gate would already have become compromised. And that was exactly what happened. Using ice magic the gate men were defeated swiftly, as by the three-minute mark of the alarms being raised the Night King's forces had successfully stormed the village gate. What was to follow was a losing battle for the Avalonians as they were on the losing end of the numbers game. Chapter 746 Marching Orders Massive tents and a sea of humans could be spotted outside Purplehay City. The capital city of the true elite's kingdom was already huge in size, however. The sea of humans created a ring of tents around it that stretched for 15 kilometers on all sides. As Rudra looked at the scene from the top of the wall, he could only see small humans in the distance as various campfires caused gray smoke to rise in the air. He had fought many wars in his tenure as the guild master of the elites in Omega. However, never had he seen such a proper army camp in his entire life. It looked like a scene straight out of a movie. Yet it was not. It was real and the truly shocking part was that although Ridra was looking at it and admiring it, it could not move his heart. He had no goosebumps go down his spine, nor was he amazed. He was only happy to see such a magnificent sight and know that the people down there were under his protection and command. Ridra could have easily recruited 40-50 million people more considering the Church of Death had a total following of 304 million as of that moment however many did not want to sign the contract that was put before them while being handed out the blood potions that said they needed to act in complete obedience to the drafted generals and commanders of their units. This seemed like a massive scam to some and hence they did not go through with the signing up. However Rudra could not care less about those who backed off as the last thing he wanted was to have a huge army that was not under his own control. If the volunteers all acted according to their own wills and did not fight as directed that all Rudra would have accomplished by gathering them was helping them enter hell with one extra life and nothing more. However, as he put forward that clause he could rest assured that he would be able to at least control this massive force he wielded under his command. Those who understood his concerns did not have any reservations in signing, and those were the men who had camped outside Purple Haze City today. While he was off, it was Amelia who had managed these sea of people and organized them promptly according to the battle plan that Rudra sent him 28 hours ago, as now, the massive force of 130 plus 20 million was properly divided into five units. Rudra did not want to lead a massive force personally hence all he took under his wing were the five million soldiers from Emperor Cervantes. His personal army of the true elites kingdom numbering 12 million strong. And 8 million of the elven soldiers that Ruby had managed to rally from her merit for his cause. Naturally Rudra had fed all 25 million of these outside help the blood potion so that they could be revived once they died and alongside the true elite's guild and all the subsidiaries it controlled. He had a player army of 5 million strong to command a total force of 30 million troops total. The other four divisions were also 30 million each and divided for the other four commanders. However, while the other four would already have demons amongst their ranks, Ridro would have none with his. But he would retain all the tier 4 elders of the true elite's guild under his command. Ridra had chosen this structure of distribution because if there was anyone he trusted his back to in the face of a raging demon army, it would undoubtedly the elders from the elites. No matter what the situation was going to be he knew that Karna and Johnny would never disappoint him and that they would find a way to win even when there was none. As if reading his thoughts, Karna showed up on the wall right at this moment as he said, You look creepy when you smile. Rudra instantly smiled broader as Karna stood beside him looking over the view. For a brief moment no words were exchanged yet the duo conversed a lot just by standing beside each other. Karna said, King Cervantes has taken over Purple Haze City and the true elite's kingdom. Our standing army has sent all the non-essential personnel to help in the coming war. However, the best men are still guarding the territory on high alert. The kings who have submitted have also signed a treaty that will compel them to send full force of their armies in case our kingdom is invaded. However, I don't think that with Aquahos being ruled by the Russians we have any natural territorial neighbors left. We can leave the city without worries, my friend. Rudra nodded in assurance. Leaving the territory undefended was a stupid move, and he was not dumb enough to think that he could pull out with all of his elites and his NPC army and the vultures from outside would do nothing to take the undefended place from him. However, they could try their best now and still fall short as the forts and advanced weapons made by the elites plus the support of allies made them invincible in the short term from foreign heckle. Karna then said, You sure about this, mate? Ritter replied looking at his face. Why are you getting cold feet? Karna chuckled as he said, Remember when you came to recruit me all those years ago? I told you I would go to hell with you 
If you ask me to guild master, and this vice guild master of the elites Leo Crispy is no liar. Rudra put an arm over Karna's shoulder as he squeezed his arm firmly. Best decision I've ever made as the guild master is to recruit you. Karna felt touched. He wanted to enjoy the rare moment of bromance where true feelings were shared. However, of course, Rudra was not going to let him enjoy it for long as he pushed him off the wall with incredible force and caught him off guard. Karna was only stunned momentarily as he recovered quickly. Mouthing the words, A asterisk asterisk hole. He flipped various times before landing clean on the ground below. Rudra chuckled out loud now as he knew that Karna was never going to get hurt by something so petty. It was just that the atmosphere was turning too sweet for him to handle and he needed to push Karna away to hide his true emotions. Taking a deep breath, he spoke loudly. And with his tier 5 power, his voice boomed across all camps, even without an amplifier, as he said, Brave men, brave women and brave warriors, who have assembled here today from all over the continent. I, Pope Shakuni of the Elites, extend to you my warmest welcome. The time has finally come for us to march into hell, and knock on the steps of Lucifer, and help our Lord Hades to take back the control of hell from him. It's chances like these that separate average players from great players, and great players from legendary players. Our home planet is in for an interminable future, and this war might be on the scale that we would need to experience day in and day out just for survival. Luckily, nobody does for real in this war, and the consequences are minimal. However, I must ask all of you to treat the fighting as if you had one life and one life only. As come a real war someday, you will not get a second chance. Rudra paused for a long time as he saw everyone down below focusing on his small visage standing on top of the wall, before continuing as he said, Make no mistake. We are going to hell to win. We are going to hell to challenge a god, and I promise you that it won't be pretty, and it won't be easy. Some of you might wonder, but can a god even be killed? And yes, you are wondering the right question. And disappointingly, the answer is no. A god cannot be killed. Everyone became perplexed now. What did Rudra mean by a god cannot be killed? If Lucifer could not be killed, then what were they going to do in hell anyways? Rudra continued. A god cannot be killed by mortals. It's the way the world has worked since its establishment. I will not give you false hopes. Men can't kill gods. When Rydra confirmed what many felt was the case, the atmosphere in the camp turned grim. Most people down there were only coming for the peripheral fighting, and not with the goal to slay Lucifer, and Rydra sensed this early on, and decided to shape the army towards having a common goal. He continued, But I see no men here today. I only see a 150 million gods. Rydra's words caused most to widen their pupils in shock. What was the leader of the elite saying? Had he finally gone senile? Rudra shouted. What are gods? If you say a god can't die, I say we can't either. We are going into hell, and no matter what happens, none of you has truly die. If you say a god controls the fate of millions, I say all of us control fate of millions. Millions of demons that would live in a hell free of the demonic Lucifer. Millions of Middle Earth NPCs who would someday be able to open trade routes and establish connections to demonic cities in hell all because a few brave men changed the course of history forever. If you say a god has supreme powers, I say all of us have supreme powers. The world is no longer the same place it was. Cultivators are everywhere and everyone can become one. Inside Omega we can slash apart mountains and tear apart seas. We have all killed monsters in numbers we can't even count. All to become more powerful. We are all powerful here brave ladies and gentlemen just on different power levels. I say everyone who has a will to defy fate is a god. Everyone that steps into hell to help the god of death is a god, and all of you who will help slay a god will be remembered as a god. On earth we are taught this one lesson regardless of what religion we belong to which is there is god within all of us. Today I say that's true. We are all part gods. Har Har Mahadev. River's words sent chills down everyone's spine as organically the crowd erupted into deafening cheers and electricity. Har Har Mahadev was a chant used by ancient warriors in Rudra's homeland. And it meant everyone is a Mahadev, or that everyone has Mahadev the god of gods within themselves. While most in the crowd did not understand the origin of that chant, 130 million people shouted it on repeat at top of their lungs. Har Har Mahadev. Rudra saw the cohesive army chanting, and felt like his job here was done. Raising his arms, he summoned the portal artifact that Hades had given him to create four massive entrances for the army to march into hell. As the massive portals appeared, the tier 4 generals started leading their men into them in rapid progression. The chant of Har Har Mahadev never stopping. It took 14 hours for every last man to enter the portal, as Rudra was the last one to go in. Looking at the outside world one last time, he walked into the biggest fight of his life. Forward slash forward slash forward slash I'm extremely sorry for the wrong chapter uploaded yesterday. 
it's simply an oversight on my part. This chapter is more than triple the normal chapter work count because I wanted to compensate for the wrong chapter posted yesterday. I have already commissioned the art for the map on urgent basis for my own money, and it should be ready in 2-3 days. But for future illustrations, I will appreciate support on Patreon. I will post the link in the coming chapter soon forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 747 Welcome to Hell When humans and elves saw the landscape of hell for the first time ever, the blood flowing in their veins became a bit cold, as the terrain of hell was basically bone-chilling. The air seemed to be heavier than the middle realm, and there was no visible sun in the area. Although the space was enclosed, the solid ceiling was at least 12-14 kilometers above ground which made the opening massive. However, the most scary part about hell was the lack of natural vegetation as there were no signs of green plants growing for hundreds of miles in all directions. This was a completely different environment for the greenery-loving humans and elves which spooked them a little. However, the most spooky part was the already prepared humongous war camps run by greater and winged demons. As Rudra's forces received a grand welcome to hell by the already waiting Hades army, on Rudra's instructions, the demon army was spread so thin across multiple small camps that on one glance, none of the humans could figure out the exact number of the demon forces amongst their own ranks. This was a deliberate illusion to make it look like Hades' own forces were extremely large and had no need for the support of petty humans and to intimidate and instill confidence amongst the newcomers. There were five major camps, commanded by the five commanders, and the portals that Rudra opened already distributed the army in a way that every portal took the army to their designated camp. As the men walked into their camps, they were tapped on the shoulder by elder witches as regardless of the initial color of their armor and boots that now got converted into a dark black color to signify the army they belonged to. Black was the color of death, which is why it was chosen as standard bearer for the army. And in the Red Hell's Cape, it was the only color that had a darker contrast to the sand. Everyone except those in Rudra's camp came face to face with various strong greater demons. As looking at the 12 feet tall and super muscular demons with horns adorning their head, many elves and smaller humans felt intimidated. The winged demons were about 6 7 feet tall and also super muscular with a huge wingspan of about their total height. They could be seen plated in black armor as they roamed the skies above the camp transporting supplies and weapons. The various commanders started to quickly initialize the newbies in their camps as small individual speeches and war plan explanation broke down on all four camp sites except Rudra's. Rudra's camp only consisted of men who he had weathered many wars with, whether it be the elves or the men from Hazelgrove Empire or his own elites. There was no need for him to, to treat them like newbies when they were the only ones who were not going to get any rest whatsoever. The current temporary camp was prone to a massive attack by Lucifer, and Rudra had no doubt in his mind that the presence of the intruding army would have already alarmed the Death Lord should they remain in the open plains for more than three weeks. In Rudra's estimation, it would be enough time for Lucifer to mobilize a strike on this defenseless camp, which was why it was a matter of utmost importance to capture the first town of Gates as soon as possible. Currently, the army was camping at the edge of the barren lands, and the nearest village was the outermost eastern village of Hell, called the Village of No Return. It was a myth that those who ventured into these barren lands alone would never return alive. And that was most likely a true myth since Rudra himself had checked the terrain through God's eye, and there was no vegetation. Water source or creatures living in the barrens for over 100 120 kilometers. What the army of death needed to do at the moment was to quickly capture the two villages leading to the town of Gates and then capture the town of Gates without damaging the integral structure of the town. The town of Gates was a well-defended town that could easily house 10-15 million inhabitants. Although not big enough to house the entire army, it could at least provide a defensive wall against an enemy attack and a base for operations while the other commanders beat the humans and their army into shape in the next two weeks. Making them familiar with the Demon Legion and war tactics, it was Rudra's task to take down two villages and one town on his own to provide the army of death with a base of operations. Rudra had volunteered for this critical task as he trusted Noon, but his own skills to get it done in time. Logically, the easiest way to wipe entire villages was for Rudra to rely on the might of his full army and storm the small establishments without mercy. This strategy was especially effective for small villages, which barely had a wooden fence around their boundaries, and could be wiped in a matter of minutes with a full army. However, Rudra chose not to do so. Using his god's eyes, he could see that both the villages as well as the town had a lot of tier 3 and 4 warriors posted within them, which were not present during the last time Rudra had scanned the area a few months ago. Not just in the eastern front. They were posted on the outermost villages of all fronts as Lucifer seemed to fortify all sides not knowing which one the enemy would chose to attack from. There were three tier 4 combatants posted in the village of No Return and six posted in the village after that. 
while there were 12 posted in the town of Gates. This was unbelievable security for border towns, and the presence of such powerful men made the wave tactics useless in attacking the establishments. Although Rudra would be able to kill them. Quite comfortably at that. There was no guarantee that they would not launch a grand move before death costing Rudra a significant portion of his army. For this reason, Rudra chose to only take 30 tier 4 elites with him on the hunt, as being a tier 4 existence themselves should push come to shove they were all equipped with enough methods to protect themselves against even a peak tier 4 attack. Plus a smaller group would have a stealth advantage, that a bigger group would not which would save precious movement time and salvage the element of surprise. As Rudra scanned the area more he saw the hiding scouts in the sandpits outside the village of no return as he chuckled and unsheathed a grim reaper to launch strikes from a distance of 55 kilometers away to roll the heads of the 12 different scouts clean. However just as he was doing this, he felt a heavy presence eyeing him as cold sweat trickled from his back at that moment. Lucifer Rudra knew at that instant that the fallen angel had found the presence of Hades' S camp for sure now, as Rudra stared directly at where he felt his eye to be as a wide grin was plastered on his face. Rudra mouthed the words I'm coming for you to the eye, as he did not back off from his pressure this time around. Although Rudra could detect his presence, he could do nothing about it prying on the secrets of the Hades camp. But thankfully there was someone stronger present beside him who could. The god of death was furious by the intrusion, as he shouted with power, be gone. Black smoke rose from the ground and created an acidic mist cloud around Lucifer's eye until it was eaten away and dismantled. Rudra looked towards the very central building of the camp. The massive looking death palace as he felt reassured by the god's presence. For once, he was not the one having the biggest burden of the lot. Nor was he the strongest fighter in the group. He only needed to work his part faithfully, and for that he was ready. Rounding up the elders, and the core tier 4 members, he selected for this expedition Rudra gave the order to move out in 15 minutes. There was no rest for the elite warriors. As from the very first day, glory and lives of demons were theirs to claim. Meanwhile Lucifer. Lucifer was seething after looking at the size of Hades' army. Although he did not have a clear idea about the total number, it was at least well over a 100 million by his estimations. Most of the forces even comprised of humans, which was not something Lucifer had expected. After the demon's diary was destroyed, Lucifer thought Hades would not be able to amass enough forces to launch a credible attack in the short term, but it seemed like he was able to rally puny humans in large numbers, for some reason. Lucifer had an inkling that the reason why he was able to rally humans was because of the one puny human Shikuni, who had been a thorn by his side, since the start, and this made his blood boil unlike no other. Never had a mortal been this big of a menace to a god, and today, he even had the audacity to look him in the eye and mouth the words I am coming for you. A mortal coming for a god? Ridiculous. Only an ugly death awaited Rudra. As he had irked the wrath of Lucifer, forward slash forward slash forward slash next bonus chapter for GT is at 2,200 tickets. We are very close. Let's try and get it by tomorrow you all forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 74830 is enough. Asmodeus asked, Weren't you going to capture the two villages and the town quickly? Why is your army still lazing around? Dot. Rudra stuffed a crate of a max stamina potion into his inventory as he looked at Asmodeus and said, Oh, we are ready. Asmodeus looked around once more and asked politely, The thirty of you? Rudra glanced back with a domineering smile and said, even three is enough. Asmodeus wanted to say something but although he kept opening and closing his mouth, no words came out of him. In the end, he saluted Rudra and politely took his leave. If Rudra was a weaker man or under the command of Asmodeus, he would have been given a scolding of a lifetime for his cockiness, but thankfully he was not. In Asmodeus's point of view Rudra was being overconfident and underestimating the enemy forces to march with such a small contingent. However, he was nobody to lecture or advise Rudra. Not only did Rudra outrank him, but the entire plan was his own in the first place. Plus in the event that the plan failed, it was his own responsibility as well. Hence having nothing to say he could only leave and wait for the results of Rudra's strategy to show. Whether good or bad, Rudra looked at his elites and saw every one of them wearing the chainmail armor forged by Fatty Kalash under their plated armor. Usually wearing chainmail was good for additional defense. But it made movement stiff and added unnecessary weight to fighters which affected the agility. Hence, not many fighters except tanks preferred to wear chain mail under their armor. However, this changed when the special blue and black crystals that the elites had recovered from the ancient ruins were crushed into powder and added to mithril iron. In a shocking change of property, the already weightless mithril became elastic and after undergoing a series of processes, it was converted into silk, like threads, that were custom weaved to make chain mail armor. The resulting armor was legendary in grade and gave Fatty Kalash a system notification about how he revived a forgotten ancient manufacturing technique. 
whose craftsmen were lost to time. The only problem was it took Fatty three days of non-stop work to produce a single piece of chainmail armor. Custom fit for a particular tier 4 player. It was extremely durable. Lightweight and fabric, like which did not restrict movement at all and hence, was the perfect additional defense for all players. And the best part was that it even covered the neck up to the jaw in providing protection to one of the only parts of an armor that was usually exposed in all types of sets. Hence when Ribra glanced at the elites, who were heavily plated from the boots to the neck and the helmet above he could not see a critical hit opening on any part of their body at all even with his god's eyes. This impressed him. As now, he regretted the decision of waiting for his armor to come later. As when Fatty asked him to make one for himself, he asked him to do it at last, so that the others, who needed it more got it before him. Nonetheless, Rudra needed no more protection than the doom armor on his chest and the grim reaper in his hands. As once, he was fully stocked with potions and utilities, he gave the elites the marching orders as the group started to storm the barren lands of hell. If Rudra marched with a full army, the distance of 40-55 kilometers was a 2-3 to three hour march easy. However, with all tier 4 or higher players sprinting in formation with Rudra as the windbreaker, it was only a matter of 12 minutes at a moderate pace. They passed by the dead scouts in a flash as the others could not understand how the scouts died or when they died. However, they all knew who killed them in their mind. When they were only 40 seconds out of the wooden village walls, Rudra glanced at Johnny and gave the call. Sir Johnny, there is one tier 4 man posted in the guard tower in the eastern gate there. Go faster than us and take him down stealthily. Johnny instantly went ghost mode and increased his pace such that he arrived at the guard tower only 10 seconds before Rudra and the group did. Right before he sneaked and passed the wall though, Rudra created a distraction by deliberately walking loudly and making thumping noises to garner the attention of the tier 4 guard posted at the gate. While the low-level guards could never hear those footsteps from such a distance, the tier 4 guard was instantly alerted as he glanced out of his outpost to see the group of men charging towards the gates. Immediately alarmed he wanted to raise the attack alarm. However he made a critical mistake when he looked at Rudra's group and did miss Johnny's ascend. As Johnny bypassed the outpost walls, as if they were air, and landed right behind the tier 4 soldier. Before he could even turn or realize that someone was onto him. Two daggers were plunged into his eye sockets through to his brain, and immediately two more to his neck from both sides. As the other tier 3 guards were alerted seeing their leader die, Rudra and the others had already jumped over the wooden wall like it was a small hurdle, as they swarmed the outpost and killed everyone inside like flies. The complete battle lasted only 21 seconds and without a single loud noise made the elite successfully infiltrated the village of no return and killed one of the three tier 4 guards posted inside. Forward slash forward slash forward slash special shout out to Omar Alshake for the 5000 coin magic castle and to Savanthi for the three 5000 coin magic castles. Sometimes I just become speechless to see such overwhelming support. All I can say then is a very heartfelt thank you. With this contribution today will be a 5 chapter day. This one being 1 out of 5 and the bonus chapter for hitting the GT target forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 749 One Fell Swoop Demon women and children started to rush back to their homes, and screaming and panic was evident. Rudra was not aware that the tier 4 demon general's life was connected to a special stone that would shatter if he died, and the shattering of the stone would trigger the alarm not only in the village of no return, but also in the village after it, and the town of gates later. However having to play with the hand, he was dealt with. Rudra could only put his head down and roll into battle with his squad as the brawl against the village defense started. Karna and Rudra used their senses to scan the village for the two tier 4 generals left alive and immediately took one each for the fight. Rudra took the strongest one while Karna took the other one as the duo parted ways and unsheathed their swords for the fight. Rudra used gravity manipulation and made his body weightless as he accelerated at an unreal speed towards his opponent. The demon general braced for impact and raised his shield to block Rudra. However at the last possible second Rudra used gravity manipulation to float into the air as he used gravity suppression to buckle the demon to his knee as he got a clean shot as his exposed back. Overhead slash. Rudra's sword landed straight on the demon's temple and split his body clean into two halves from the center as both his halves plopped lifelessly to the ground. One to the left and the other to the right. As he wiped the blood off his sword with a simple flick of his wrist he looked at the shaking and terrified tier 3 demons around him who could not get over the shock of seeing their leader being cut into two pieces by a single strike. Rudra stood there unmoving. Yet not one demon had the courage to even attempt to make a move on him, or even look him in the eyes, as they violently shivered at their spots, and looked towards the ground in fear. After a few seconds, Rudra decided that this cowardly behavior irked him as he mount, trash, 
and use Leaf Blade Hurricane to kill all the demons around him in one fell swoop. After the area seemed to be more or less wiped out, Rivera glanced at Karna's side to look at the red HP bar of the demon in front of him, as it seemed like he was going to die in the next 20-30 seconds. Rivera calculated the time since the fight started and sighed in disappointment. It was already 90 seconds since he and Karna engaged the tier 4s yet Karna was still fighting one. Rivera used gravity suppression and jammed the demon's feet to give Karna a clean shot. As Karna swinged his great sword and decapitated the demon clean. Instantly however he shot an annoyed look at Rivera for meddling in his fight. However Rudra tapped on his wrists in defiance, as if trying to show Karna the time and tell him that he was being too damn slow. Karna felt that Rudra was being impossible. Not everyone could kill off a tier 4 opponent in one move. Especially when the opponent was 1.5 feet taller and more bulky than oneself. However remembering how Johnny 2 defeated one as fast as Rudra at the start Karna chose silence. The problem with rolling in a monster group was that the bar for normal was raised too high and although anyone else in the world would be impressed by dominating a tier 4 opponent in under 2 minutes. Rudra was feeling that it was too slow. Overall it only took the 30 min 5 and a half minutes to wipe all standing forces as Rudra gave the order to round up all the village men and women who remained and non-combatants that were not a threat to his cause. Within the next 10 minutes everyone from every hut of the village was rounded up as they cowered and formed tight circles in front of their enslavers. It was the nature of sentient species in general to find comfort in numbers. And when scared even demons tended to form tight compact circles trying to comfort their hearts in knowing that they were not alone in this. Rudra said, Listen to me demons. I am not a tyrant, and I am not going to kill you if you chose to leave this village in your present situation peacefully. I need this village empty in the next four minutes, and one way or the other I promise I will have my way. The village after this and the town of Gates will all fall today in the next few hours. So I advise you to run even further than that. Now chose to leave. Or to die here by standing up to your conquerors. The choice is yours. As Rudra said this the elites moved aside opening up a path for the demons to run away if they wished to. Some ran away without hesitation while some cowered on the spot. However even those who initially cowered gathered the courage to run after seeing that those who ran away were actually allowed to leave without anyone chasing after them. Only a few remained as they were the oversmart and overpatriotic ones thinking that they might be able to die a hero's death and that their tales of honor and valor would be sung for generations. One of them even started to stand up and curse at Rudra. However as the four minutes were up Rudra simply unleashed his aura, and all the tier 1 and tier 0 civilians died then, and there without anyone having to raise a single finger. The first village was conquered and emptied just like that. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter for the super gift by Omar Alshay. Please thank him in the comments for this one. You have been one of the most consistent patrons of the book since last December, and the number two fan for the book overall. Words cannot describe how much you have helped me in my creation and making the book what it is today. Which is why I'm regretful that I could not produce a named character for you in this series, although you deserve one. It's only because I cannot find one worthy enough in this late stages of the content. As I would not want to give you an average one. But the future does look bright in this aspect. Thank you for your support forward slash forward slash forward slash. Chapter 750 A Sandworm Problem While Neatwit and SMG took a more direct path, Rudra sent Karna alongside Johnny and 10 other tier 4 generals towards a longer western flank whereas he himself waited a bit before engaging. The village after the village of no return was called the village of no rain. It was a barren land that was rumored to be full of greenery eons ago and until the death of a cursed creature on the fertile land turned the soil barren. Soon the vegetation died and alongside the vegetation so did the cycle of annual rainfall as now it had been over 30 years since a single drop of rain graced the village. The reason why Rudra did not rush into the second village madly, as he did for the first one, was because the alarms had been set off. He expected the enemy to be ready for a fight which was why he did not want to put all his eggs in one basket and observe first before making an informed decision. His guess was right on the money as an unexpected situation arose for Neetwit and SMG on their straight path towards the town as one tier 4 general blocked the path of the two warriors alone. About 3 KMS before the village entrance. SMG paused to survey the situation however Neatwit just unsheathed his sword and pushed straight in full of confidence. SMG warned Neatwit as he said, He's not an idiot to stand outside alone. He must have some trick up his sleeve. Don't rush him blindly. However being high on adrenaline Neatwit did not heed his advice as he jumped straight towards his 7 feet tall opponent. The demon was unarmed and had hazy blue eyes. He did not seem to panic at all when Neatwit charged on him as he only raised his arms up into the air when Neatwit leaped and the most unbelievable outcome occurred. The earth started to shake violently, as a hideous creature that had uncountable legs, 
and a round worm-like body shot out of the ground as it attempted to swallow Neatwood alive. SMG was stunned, and he checked the stats of the creature only to be completely astonished. Desert Millipede, level 440, demonic, a brainless creature that attacks anything that moves for prey. It can grow up to 1 kilometers long at full maturity, and weigh nearly 400 tons. Demonic beast tamers usually tame these beasts at a young age, and raise them as weapons of war. If you find one under a controller spell, it will no longer be brainless, and will attack you as directed. Notorious for being very hard to kill having 11 hearts and 4 brains. It is best to avoid a fight with this colossus. As Neefwit stared down the creature's hideous mouth that had infinite teeth, he resisted his urge to vomit as he performed a front flip mid-air to barely escape the creature's mouth and slide down over its slimy back. Help. Neefwit shouted as he panicked and got back to his feet. But unfortunately for him, no help was going to come as the earth rumbled once more and get another centipede came out from the desert ground this time attacking SMG. The situation turned south very quickly for the two men as although they were able to dodge the mindless beast's attacks. The way it tore through rock was extremely dangerous in itself, as after dodging there was no stable land for them to land on at all. Within seconds the area turned into less of open desert and more like the surface of the moon with craters all around and slippery rock prone to landslide. It seemed like Lucifer had prepared an appropriate welcome for the elites at this town as Karna's party faced a similar peril having to face off against four worms and two summoners of their own. This village would have been much easier to conquer had the alarms not been raised. However, they had been raised and the enemy was on guard against the incoming elites. It was wise call for Rudra to not march the whole army out here, as although he would have been able to defeat the worms, it would not be without a significant cost of him losing a sizable chunk of his army. Naturally looking at how his friends were in trouble, Rudra wasted no time to rush to their aid, as while he diverted the rest of the tier 4 elites to support Karna's end, he personally flew at breakneck speed towards SMG, and Neatwit who needed help the most. The Colossus Beasts were a huge challenge to beat for SMG and Neatwit. Since their 11 hearts meant that simple sword attacks would not be able to kill them even if they found an opening whereas normal slash and cuts to their soft skin could not bother them at all. The advantage of the beasts that allowed them to grow so huge was the fact that they had only soft tissues making up their body and no exoskeleton. However this strength was also their biggest weakness when facing someone like Rudra who could manipulate gravity. Arriving at the scene in short 14 seconds, Rudra first helped Neatwood dodge a certain death by moving him out of harm's way from a centipede tail swipe. Rudra then proceeded to concentrate as he planted his feet and used gravity manipulation to its fullest extent to try and lift one of the two centipedes in the air. Although it was a man of skill, lifting a 400 tons object was not something Rudra was capable of doing when he was at tier 4. However now, when he exerted his full strength and strained his muscles, he was able to pull one worm completely out of the ground and into the air as he stared the blue-eyed beast controller in the eyes with his hazy gray ones. Boom! Rudra mouthed as he increased the gravity around the bug times 100 and without a proper exoskeleton to protect itself its muscles collapsed viciously under the pressure and the large bug was crushed as it stomped on with an equally large boot as liquids and goo spread out everywhere. Just like that, Rudra killed one of the two centipedes in absolute grand fashion as he quickly proceeded and did the same with the second one. The Demon Beast Summoner SMG and Neatwood all stared at Rudra Mouth Agape as he pulled his feet off. As while SMG and Neatwood marveled at him, the demon cowered in fear. A monster, the demon mouthed as it tried to run back towards the city. However SMG and Neatwood were faster. In the end without his pets the summoner only lasted 52 seconds before his lifeless and limbless body rolled on the desert sand. Forward slash forward slash forward slash bonus chapter March 5th. For the gift by Savanthi please thank her in the comments for this one. You are one of my best and favorite patrons, who is slightly evil for making me work for three bonus chapters instead of one, by gifting me three castles instead of one gotcha. But I still smile widely whenever you do. So thank you very much for the patronage. Forward slash forward slash forward slash.